Chapter Twenty One, The Half Sisters. It appeared as if Mrs. Gibson's predictions were likely to be verified, for Osborne Hamley found his way to her drawing room pretty frequently. To be sure, sometimes prophets can help on the fulfilment of their own prophecies, and Mrs. Gibson was not passive. Molly was altogether puzzled by his manners and ways. He spoke of occasional absences from the hall, without exactly saying where he had been. But that was not her idea of the conduct of a married man, who, she imagined, ought to have a house and servants, and pay rent and taxes, and live with his wife. Who this mysterious wife might be faded into insignificance before the wonder of where she was. London, Cambridge, Dover, nay, even France, were mentioned by him as places to which he had been on these different little journeys. These facts came out quite casually, almost as if he was unaware of what he was betraying. Sometimes he dropped out such sentences as these, "'Ah, that would be the day I was crossing. It was stormy indeed. Instead of our being only two hours, we were nearly five. Or, "'I met Lord Hollingford at Dover last week, and he said,' etc. "'The cold now is nothing to what it was in London on Thursday. The thermometer was down at fifteen degrees.' Perhaps in the rapid flow of conversation these small revelations were noticed by no one but Molly, whose interest and curiosity were always hovering over the secret she had become possessed of, in spite of all her self-reproach for allowing her thoughts to dwell on what was still to be kept as a mystery. It was also evident to her that Osborne was not too happy at home. He had lost the slight touch of cynicism which he had affected when he was expected to do wonders at college and that was one good result of his failure. If he did not give himself the trouble of appreciating other people and their performances, at any rate his conversation was not so amply sprinkled with critical pepper. He was more absent, but not so agreeable, Mrs. Gibson thought, but did not say. He looked ill in health, but that might be the consequence of the real depression of spirits which Molly occasionally saw peeping out through all his pleasant surface talk. Now and then, when he was directly talking to her, he referred to the happy days that are gone, or to the time when my mother was alive. And then his voice sank, and a gloom came over his countenance, and Molly longed to express her own deep sympathy. He did not often mention his father, and Molly thought she could read in his manner, when he did, that something of the painful restraint she had noticed when she was last at the hall still existed between them. Nearly every particular she knew of the family interior she had heard from Mrs. Hamley, and she was uncertain how far her father was acquainted with them. So she did not like to question him too closely. Nor was he a man to be so questioned as to the domestic affairs of his patients. Sometimes she wondered if it was a dream, the short half-hour in the library at Hamley Hall, when she had learnt a fact which seemed so all-important to Osborne, yet which made so little difference in his way of life, either in speech or action. During the twelve or fourteen hours that she had remained in the hall afterwards, no further allusion had been made to his marriage, either by himself or by Roger. It was indeed very like a dream. Probably Marley would have been rendered much more uncomfortable in the possession of her secret if Osborne had struck her as particularly attentive in his devotion to Cynthia. She evidently amused and attracted him, but not in any lively or passionate kind of way. He admired her beauty and seemed to feel her charm, but he would leave her side and come to sit near Molly if anything reminded him of his mother, about which he could talk to her, and to her alone. Yet he came so often to the Gibsons, that Mrs. Gibson might be excused for the fancy she had taken into her head that it was for Cynthia's sake. He liked the lounge, the friendliness, the company of two intelligent girls of beauty and manners above the average, one of whom stood in a peculiar relation to him, as having been especially beloved by the mother whose memory he cherished so fondly. Knowing himself to be out of the category of bachelors, he was perhaps too indifferent as to other people's ignorance, and its possible consequences. Somehow Molly did not like to be the first to introduce Roger's name into the conversation, so she lost many an opportunity of hearing intelligence about him. Osborne was often so languid or so absent that he only followed the lead of talk. 
and as an awkward fellow who had paid her no particular attention, and as a second son, Roger was not preeminent in Mrs. Gibson's thoughts. Cynthia had never seen him, and the freak did not often take her to speak about him. He had not come home since he had obtained his high place in the mathematical lists. That Molly knew. And she knew, too, that he was working hard for something, she supposed a fellowship, and that was all. Osborne's tone in speaking of him was always the same. Every word, every inflection of the voice breathed out affection and respect, nay, even admiration. And this from the nil admirari brother, who seldom carried his exertions so far. "'Ah, Roger,' he said one day. Molly caught the name in an instant, though she had not heard what had gone before. "'He is a fellow in a thousand, in a thousand indeed. I don't believe there is his match anywhere for goodness and real, solid power combined.' "'Molly,' said Cynthia, after Mr. Osborne Hamley had gone, "'what sort of a man is this Roger Hamley? One can't tell how much to believe of his brother's praises, for it is the one subject on which Osborne Hamley becomes enthusiastic. I've noticed it once or twice before." While Molly hesitated on which point of the large round to begin her description, Mrs. Gibson struck in. "'It just shows what a sweet disposition Osborne Hamley is of, that he should praise his brother as he does. I dare say he is a senior wrangler, and much good may it do him. I don't deny that, but as for conversation, he's as heavy as heavy can be. A great awkward fellow to boot, who looks as if he did not know two and two made four, for all he is such a mathematical genius. You would hardly believe he was Osborne Hamley's brother to see him. I should not think he has a profile at all." "'What do you think of him, Molly?' said the persevering Cynthia. I like him," said Molly. He has been very kind to me. I know he isn't handsome like Osborne." It was rather difficult to say all this quietly, but Molly managed to do it, quite aware that Cynthia would not rest till she had extracted some kind of an opinion out of her. "'I suppose he will come home at Easter,' said Cynthia, "'and then I shall see him for myself. It's a great pity that their being in mourning will prevent them from going to the Easter charity ball said Mrs. Gibson plaintively. "'I shan't like to take you two girls, if you are not to have any partners. It will put me in such an awkward position. I wish we could join on to the Towers party. That would secure you partners, for they always bring a number of dancing men, who might dance with you after they had done their duty by the ladies of the house. But really everything is so changed, since dear Lady Cumnor has been an invalid, that perhaps they won't go at all. This Easter ball was a great subject of conversation with Mrs. Gibson. She sometimes spoke of it as her first appearance in society as a bride, though she had been visiting once or twice a week all winter long. Then she shifted her ground, and said she felt so much interest in it because she would then have the responsibility of introducing both her own and Mr. Gibson's daughter to public notice, though the fact was that pretty nearly every one who was going to this ball had seen the two young ladies, though not in their ball-dresses before. But, aping the manners of the aristocracy as far as she knew them, she intended to bring out Molly and Cynthia on this occasion, which she regarded as something of the light of a presentation at court. "'They are not out yet,' was her favourite excuse when either of them was invited to any house to which she did not wish them to go, or they were invited without her. She even made a difficulty about their not being out, when Miss Browning, that old friend of the Gibson family, came in one morning to ask the two girls to come to a friendly tea and a round game afterwards, this mild piece of gaiety being designed as an attention to three of Mrs. Goodenough's grandchildren, two young ladies and their schoolboy brother, who were staying on a visit to their grandmamma. "'You are very kind, Miss Browning, but you see I hardly like to let them go. They are not out, you know, till after the Easter ball.' "'Till when we are invisible,' said Cynthia always ready with her mockery to exaggerate any pretension of her mother's. We are so high in rank that our sovereign must give us her sanction before we can play a round game at your house." Cynthia enjoyed the idea of her own full-grown size and stately gait as contrasted with that of a meek, half-fledged girl in the nursery, but Miss Browning was half-puzzled and half-affronted. "'I don't understand it at all. 
In my days girls went wherever it pleased people to ask them, without this farce of bursting out in all their new fine clothes at some public place. I don't mean but what the gentry took their daughters to York or Matlock or Bath, to give them a taste of gay society when they were growing up, and the quality went up to London, and their young ladies were presented to Queen Charlotte, and went to a birthday ball, perhaps. But for us little Hollingford people, why, we knew every child amongst us from the day of its birth, and many a girl of twelve or fourteen have I seen go out to a card-party, and sit quiet at her work, and know how to behave as well as any lady there. There was no talk of coming out in those days for any one under the daughter of a squire. After Easter, Molly and I shall know how to behave at a card-party, but not before," said Cynthia demurely. "'You are always fond of your quips and your cranks, my dear,' said Miss Browning, "'and I wouldn't quite answer for your behaviour. You sometimes let your spirits carry you away. But I'm quite sure Molly will be a little lady as she always is, and always was, and I have known her from a babe." Mrs. Gibson took up arms on behalf of her daughter, or rather she took up arms against Molly's praises. "'I don't think you would have called Molly a lady the other day, Miss Browning, if you had found her where I did, sitting up in a cherry-tree, six feet from the ground at least, I do assure you.' "'Oh, but that wasn't pretty,' said Miss Browning, shaking her head at Molly. "'I thought you'd left off those tomboy ways.' "'She wants the refinement which good society gives in several ways.' said Mrs. Gibson, returning to the attack on poor Molly. She's very apt to come upstairs two steps at a time." "'Only two, Molly,' said Cynthia. Why, to-day I found I could manage four of these broad, shallow steps." "'My dear child, what are you saying?' "'Only confessing that I, like Molly, want the refinements which good society gives. Therefore, do please let us go to Miss Browning's this evening. I will pledge myself for Molly that she shan't sit in a cherry-tree, and Molly shall see that I don't go upstairs in an unladylike way. I will go upstairs as meekly as if I were a come-out young lady, and had been to the Easter ball." So it was agreed that they should go. If Mr. Osborne Hamley had been named as one of the probable visitors, there would have been none of this difficulty about the affair. But though he was not there, his brother Roger was. Molly saw him in a minute when she entered the little drawing-room, but Cynthia did not. "'And see, my dears,' said Miss Phoebe Browning, turning them round to the side where Roger stood waiting for his turn of speaking to Molly, "'we've got a gentleman for you after all. Wasn't it fortunate? Just as sister said that you might find it dull. You, Cynthia, she meant, because you know you come from France. Then, just as if he had been sent from heaven, Mr. Roger came in to call. And I won't say we laid violent hands on him, because he was too good for that, but really we should have been near it if he had not stayed of his own accord." The moment Roger had done his cordial greeting to Molly, he asked her to introduce him to Cynthia. "'I want to know her, your new sister,' he added, with the kind smile Molly remembered so well since the very first day she had seen it directed towards her, as she sat crying under the weeping ash. Cynthia was standing a little behind Molly when Roger asked for this introduction. She was generally dressed with careless grace. Molly, who was delicate neatness itself, used sometimes to wonder how Cynthia's tumbled gowns, tossed away so untidily, had the art of looking so well, and falling in such graceful folds. For instance, the pale lilac muslin gown she wore this evening had been worn many times before, and it looked unfit to wear again, till Cynthia put it on. Then the limpness became softness, and the very creases took the lines of beauty. Molly, in a daintily clean pink muslin, did not look half so elegantly dressed as Cynthia. The grave eyes of the latter raised when she had to be presented to Roger had a sort of childlike innocence and wonder about them, which did not quite belong to Cynthia's character. She put on her armour of magic that evening, involuntarily as she always did, but on the other side, she could not help trying her power on strangers. Molly had always felt that she should have a right to a good long talk with Roger when she next saw him, and that he would tell her, or she should gather from him all the details she so longed to hear about the squire, about the hall, about Osborne, about himself. He was just as cordial and friendly as ever with her. If Cynthia had not been there, all would have gone on as she had anticipated. But of all the victims to Cynthia's charms, he fell most prone and abject. Molly saw it all. As she was sitting next to Miss Phoebe at the tea-table, 
acting right hand, and passing cake, cream, sugar, with such busy assiduity that every one besides herself thought that her mind, as well as her hands, was fully occupied. She tried to talk to the two shy girls, as in virtue of her two years' seniority she thought herself bound to do, and the consequence was, she went upstairs with the twain clinging to her arms and willing to swear an eternal friendship. Nothing would satisfy them but that she must sit between them at Vintin, and they were so desirous of her advice in the important point of fixing the price of the counters that she could not ever have joined in the animated conversation going on between Roger and Cynthia. Or, rather, it would be more correct to say that Roger was talking in a most animated manner to Cynthia, whose sweet eyes were fixed upon his face with a look of great interest in all he was saying, while well, it was only now and then she made her low replies. Molly caught a few words occasionally in intervals of business. "'At my uncle's we always give a silver threepence for three dozen. You know what a silver threepence is, don't you, dear Miss Gibson?' "'The three classes are published in the Senate House at nine o'clock on the Friday morning, and you can't imagine—' "'I think it will be thought rather shabby to play at anything less than sixpence. That gentleman—this in a whisper—is at Cambridge, and you know they always play very high there, and sometimes ruin themselves, don't they, dear Miss Gibson?' "'Oh, on this occasion the Master of Arts who precedes the candidates for honours when they go into the Senate House is called the father of the college to which he belongs. I think I mentioned that before, didn't I?' So Cynthia was hearing all about Cambridge, and the very examination about which Molly had felt such keen interest, without having ever been able to have her question answered by a competent person. And Roger, to whom she had always looked as the final and most satisfactory answerer, was telling the whole of what she wanted to know and she could not listen. It took all her patience to make up little packets of counters, and settle, as the arbiter of the game, whether it would be better for the round or the oblong counters to be reckoned as six. And when all was done, and every one sat in their places round the table, Roger and Cynthia had to be called twice before they came. They stood up, it is true, at the first sound of their names, but they did not move. Roger went on talking, Cynthia listening till the second call. When they hurried to the table and tried to appear, all in a sudden, quite interested in the great questions of the game, namely the price of three dozen counters, and whether all things considered, it would be better to call the round counters or the oblong half a dozen each. Miss Browning, drumming the pack of cards on the table, and quite ready to begin dealing, decided the matter by saying, "'Rounds are sixes, and three dozen counters cost sixpence. Pay up, if you please, and let us begin at once.' Cynthia sat between Roger and William Orford, the young schoolboy, who bitterly resented on this occasion his sister's habit of calling him Willie, as he thought it was this boyish sobriquet which prevented Cynthia from attending as much to him as to Mr. Roger Hamley. He also was charmed by the charmer, who found leisure to give him one or two of her sweet smiles. On his return home to his grandmamma's, he gave out one or two very decided and rather original opinions, quite opposed, as was natural, to his sister's. One was, that after all a senior wrangler was no great shakes. Any man might be one if he liked, but there were a lot of fellows that he knew who would be very sorry to go in for anything so slow. Molly thought the game would never end. She had no particular turn for gambling in her, and whatever her card might be, she regularly put on two counters, indifferent as to whether she won or lost. Cynthia, on the contrary, staked high, and was at one time very rich but ended by being in debt to Molly something like six shillings. She had forgotten her purse, she said, and was obliged to borrow from the more provident Molly, who was aware that the round game of which Miss Browning had spoken to her was likely to require money. If it was not a very merry affair for all the individuals concerned, it was a very noisy one on the whole. Molly thought it was going to last till midnight, but punctually as the clock struck nine, the little maid-servant staggered in under the weight of a tray loaded with sandwiches, cakes, and jelly. This brought on a general move, and Roger, who appeared to have been on the watch for something of the kind, came and took a chair by Molly. "'I am so glad to see you again. It seems such a long time since Christmas,' said he, dropping his voice, and not alluding more exactly to the day when she had left the hall. "'It is a long time,' she replied. We are close to Easter now. I have so wanted to tell you how glad I was to hear about your honours at Cambridge. I once thought of sending you a message through your brother, but then I thought it might be making too much fuss, because I know nothing of mathematics, or of the value of a senior wranglership, and you were sure to have so many congratulations from people who did know." 
I missed yours, though, Molly," said he kindly. But I felt sure you were glad for me. Glad and proud, too," said she. I should so like to hear something more about it. I heard you telling Cynthia. Yes, what a charming person she is. I should think you must be happier than we expected long ago. But tell me something about the senior anglership, please," said Molly. It's a long story, and I ought to be helping the Miss Brownings to hand sandwiches. Besides, you wouldn't find it very interesting. It's so full of technical details." "'Cynthia looked very much interested,' said Molly. "'Well, then I refer you to her, for I must go now. I can't for shame go on sitting here and letting those good ladies have all the trouble. But I shall come and call on Mrs. Gibson soon. Are you walking home to-night?' "'Yes, I think so,' replied Molly, eagerly foreseeing what was to come. "'Then I shall walk home with you. I left my horse at the George, and that's half-way. I suppose old Betty will allow me to accompany you and your sister. You used to describe her as something of a dragon." "'Betty has left us,' said Molly sadly. "'She's gone to live at a place at Ashcombe." He made a face of dismay, and then went off to do his duties. The short conversation had been very pleasant, and his manner had had just the brotherly kindness of old times. But it was not quite the manner he had to Cynthia and Molly half thought she would have preferred the latter. He was now hovering about Cynthia, who had declined the offer of refreshments from Willie Orford. Roger was tempting her, and with playful entreaties urging her to take something from him. Every word they said could be heard by the whole room, yet every word was said, on Roger's part at least, as if he could not have spoken it in that peculiar manner to any one else. At length, and rather more because she was weary of being entreated than because it was his wish, Cynthia took a macaroon, and Roger seemed as happy as though she had crowned him with flowers. The whole affair was as trifling and commonplace as could be in itself, hardly worth noticing. And yet Molly did notice it, and felt uneasy. She could not tell why. As it turned out, it was a rainy night, and Mrs. Gibson sent a fly for the two girls instead of old Betty's substitute. Both Cynthia and Marley thought of the possibility of their taking the two Orford girls back to their grandmothers, and so saving them a wet walk. But Cynthia got the start in speaking about it, and the thanks and the implied praise for thoughtfulness were hers. When they got home Mr. and Mrs. Gibson were sitting in the drawing-room, quite ready to be amused by any details of the evening. Cynthia began. "'Oh, it wasn't very entertaining. One didn't expect that.' And she yawned wearily. "'Who were there?' asked Mr. Gibson. "'Quite a young party, wasn't it?' "'They'd only asked Lizzie and Fanny Orford and their brother, but Mr. Roger Hamley had ridden over and called on Miss Browning's, and they kept him to tea. No one else.' "'Roger Hamley there,' said Mr. Gibson. "'He's come home, then. I must make time to ride over and see him.' "'You'd much better ask him here,' said Mrs. Gibson. "'Suppose you invite him and his brother to dine here on Friday, my dear. It would be a very pretty attention, I think." "'My dear, these young Cambridge men have a very good taste in wine, and don't spare it. My cellar won't stand many of their attacks." "'I didn't think you were so inhospitable, Mr. Gibson." "'I'm not inhospitable, sure. If you'll put bitter beer in the corner of your notes of invitation, just as the smart people put quadrilles as a sign of the entertainment offered, we'll have Rosborne and Roger to dinner any day you like. And what did you think of my favourite, Cynthia? You hadn't seen him before, I think." "'Oh, he's nothing like so handsome as his brother, nor so polished, nor so easy to talk to. He entertained me for more than an hour, with a long account of some examination or other. But there's something one likes about him." "'Well, and Molly,' said Mrs. Gibson, who piqued herself on being an impartial stepmother, and who always tried hard to make Molly talk as much as Cynthia. "'What sort of an evening have you had?' "'Very pleasant, thank you. Her heart a little belied her as she said this. She had not cared for the round game, and she would have cared for Roger's conversation. She had had what she was indifferent to, and not had what she would have liked. "'We've had our unexpected visitor, too,' said Mr. Gibson. "'Just after dinner, who should come in but Mr. Preston? I fancy he's having more of the management of the Hollingford property than formerly. Sheepshanks is getting an old man. And if so, I suspect we shall see a good deal of Preston. He's no blate, as they used to say in Scotland, and made himself quite a home to-night. If I'd asked him to stay, or indeed if I'd done anything but yawn, he'd have been here to know. But I defy any man to stay when I have a fit of yawning."
"'Do you like Mr. Preston, papa?' asked Molly. "'About as much as I do half the men I meet. He talks well, and has seen a good deal. I know very little of him, except that he's my lord steward, which is a guarantee for a good deal.' "'Lady Harriet spoke pretty strongly against him that day I was with her at the manor-house.' "'Lady Harriet's always full of fancies. She likes persons to-day and dislikes them to-morrow,' said Mrs. Gibson, who was touched on her sore point whenever Molly quoted Lady Harriet, or said anything to imply ever so transitory an intimacy with her. "'You must know a good deal about Mr. Preston, my dear. I suppose you saw a good deal of him at Ashcombe. Mrs. Gibson coloured, and looked at Cynthia before she replied. Cynthia's face was set into a determination not to speak, however much she might be referred to. "'Yes, we saw him a good deal. At one time, I mean. He's changeable, I think. But he always sent us game, and sometimes fruit. There were some stories against him, but I never believed them.' "'What kind of stories?' said Mr. Gibson quickly. "'Oh, vague stories, you know. Scandal, I dare say. No one ever believed them. He could be so agreeable if he chose, and my lord, who is so very particular, would never have kept him as an agent if they were true. Not that I ever knew what they were for I consider all scandal as abominable gossip." "'I am very glad I yawned in his face,' said Mr. Gibson. "'I hope he'll take the hint.' "'If it was one of your giant gapes, papa, I should call it more than a hint,' said Molly. "'And if you want a yawning chorus the next time he comes, I'll join in. Won't you, Cynthia?' "'I don't know,' replied the latter shortly as she lighted her bed-candle. The two girls had usually some nightly conversation in one or other of their bedrooms, but to-night Cynthia said something or other about being terribly tired, and hastily shut her door. The very next day Roger came to pay his promised call. Molly was out in the garden with Williams, planning the arrangement of some new flower-beds, and deep in her employment of placing pegs upon the lawn to mark out the different situations, when standing up to mark the effect, her eye was caught by the figure of a gentleman, sitting with his back to the light, leaning forwards and talking, or listening, eagerly. Molly knew the shape of the head perfectly, and hastily began to put off her brown holland gardening apron, emptying the pockets as she spoke to Williams. "'You can finish it now, I think,' said she. "'You know about the bright-coloured flowers being against the privet hedge, and where the new rose-bed is to be?' "'I can't justly say as I do,' said he. "'Maybe you'll just go o'er it once again, Miss Molly. I'm not so young as I once was, and my head is not so clear nowadays, and I'd be loath to make mistakes when you're so set upon your plans.' Molly gave up her impulse in a moment. She saw that the old gardener was really perplexed, yet that he was as anxious as he could be to do his best. So she went over the ground again, pegging and explaining till the wrinkled brow was smooth again, and he kept saying, "'I see, miss. All right, Miss Molly. I got it in my head as clear as patchwork now.' So she could leave him and go in, but just as she was close to the garden door Roger came out. It really was for once a case of virtue its own reward for it was far pleasanter to her to have him in a tête-à-tête, -tête, however short, than in the restraint of Mrs. Gibson's and Cynthia's presence. "'I only just found out where you were, Molly. Mrs. Gibson said you had gone out, but she didn't know where, and it was the greatest chance that I turned round and saw you.' "'I saw you some time ago, but I couldn't leave Williams. I think he was unusually slow to-day, and he seemed as if he couldn't understand my plans for the new flower-beds. "'Is that the paper you've got in your hand?' Let me look at it, will you?" Ah, I see, you've borrowed some of your ideas from our garden at home, haven't you? This bed of scarlet geraniums with the border of young oaks pegged down. That was a fancy of my dear mother's." They were both silent for a minute or two. Then Molly said, "'How's the squire? I've never seen him since.' "'No. He told me how much he wanted to see you, but he couldn't make up his mind to come and call. I suppose it would never do now for you to come and stay at the hall, would it? It would give my father so much pleasure. He looks upon you as a daughter, and I'm sure both Osborne and I shall always consider you alike a like sister to us, after all my mother's love for you, and your tender care of her at last. But I suppose it wouldn't do." "'No, certainly not,' said Molly hastily. "'I fancy if you could come it would put us a little to rights. You know, as I think I once told you, Osborne has behaved differently to what I should have done, though not wrongly, only what I call an error of judgment. But my father, I am sure, has taken up some notion of—never mind. 
Only the end of it is that he holds Osborne still in tacit disgrace, and is miserable himself all the time. Osborne, too, is sore and unhappy, and estranged from my father. It is just what my mother would have put right very soon, and perhaps you could have done it—unconsciously, I mean. For this wretched mystery that Osborne preserves about his affairs is at the root of it all. But there's no use talking about it. I don't know why I began." Then, with a wrench changing the subject, while Molly still thought of what he had been telling her, he broke out, "'I can't tell you how much I like Miss Kirkpatrick, Molly. It must be a great pleasure to you having such a companion.' "'Yes,' said Molly, half smiling. "'I am very fond of her, and I think I like her better every day. But how quickly you have found out her virtues!' "'I didn't say virtues, did I?' asked he, reddening, but putting the question in all good faith. Yet I don't think one could be deceived in that face. And Mrs. Gibson appears to be a very friendly person. She has asked Osborne and me to dine here on Friday." Bitter beer came into Molly's mind, but what she said was, "'And are you coming?' "'Certainly I am, unless my father wants me. And I've given Mrs. Gibson a conditional promise for Osborne, too. So I shall see you all very soon again. But I must go now. I have to keep an appointment seven miles from here in half an hour's time. Good luck to your flower garden, Molly. End of chapter twenty one. Chapter twenty two. The Old Squire's Troubles. Affairs were going on worse at the hall than Roger had liked to tell. Moreover, very much of the discomfort there arose from mere manner, as people express it, which is always indescribable and indefinable. Quiet and passive as Mrs. Hamley had always been in appearance, she was the ruling spirit of the house as long as she lived. The directions to the servants, down to the most minute particulars, came from her sitting-room, or from the sofa on which she lay. Her children always knew where to find her and to find her was to find love and sympathy. Her husband, who was often restless and angry from one cause or another, always came to her to be smoothed down and put right. He was conscious of her pleasant influence over him, and became at peace with himself when in her presence, just as a child is at ease when with some one who is both firm and gentle. But the keystone of the family arch was gone and the stones of which it was composed began to fall apart. It is always sad when a sorrow of this kind seems to injure the character of the mourning survivors. Yet perhaps this injury may be only temporary or superficial. The judgments so constantly passed upon the way in which people bear the loss of those whom they have deeply loved appear to be even more cruel and wrongly meted out than human judgments generally are. To careless observers, for instance, it would seem as though the squire was rendered more capricious and exacting, more passionate and authoritative by his wife's death. The truth was, that it occurred at a time when many things came to harass him, and some to bitterly disappoint him, and she was no longer there to whom he used to carry his sore heart for the gentle balm of her sweet words. So the sore heart ached and smarted intensely, and often when he saw how his violent conduct affected others, he could have cried out for their pity, instead of their anger and resentment. "'Have mercy upon me, for I am very miserable.' How often have such dumb thoughts gone up from the hearts of those who have taken hold of their sorrow by the wrong end, as prayers against sin! And when the squire saw that his servants were learning to dread him, and his first-born to avoid him, he did not blame them. He knew he was becoming a domestic tyrant, it seemed as if all circumstances conspired against him, and as if he was too weak to struggle with them. Else why did everything indoors and out of doors go so wrong, just now, when all he could have done, had things been prosperous, was to have submitted, in very imperfect patience, to the loss of his wife? But just when he needed ready money to pacify Osborne's creditors, the harvest had turned out remarkably plentiful, and the price of corn had sunk down to a level it had not touched for years. The squire had insured his life at the time of his marriage for a pretty large sum. It was to be a provision for his wife if she survived him, and for their younger children. Roger was the only representative of these interests now. 
but the squire was unwilling to lose the insurance by ceasing to pay the annual sum. He would not, if he could, have sold any part of the estate which he inherited from his father, and besides it was strictly entailed. He had sometimes thought how wise a step it would have been could he have sold a portion of it, and with the purchase money have drained and reclaimed the remainder, and at length learning from some neighbour that the government would make certain advances for drainage, etc., at a very low rate of interest, on condition that the work was done and the money repaid within a given time, his wife had urged him to take advantage of the proffered loan. But now that she was no longer there to encourage him and take an interest in the progress of the work, he grew indifferent to it himself, and cared no more to go out on his stout roan cob and sit square on his seat watching the labourers on the marshy land all overgrown with rushes, speaking to them from time to time in their own strong, nervous country dialect. But the interest to government had to be paid all the same, whether the men worked well or ill. Then the roof of the hall let in the melted snow-water this winter, and on examination it turned out that a new roof was absolutely required. The men who had come about the advances made to Osborne by the London money-lender had spoken disparagingly of the timber on the estate. "'Very fine trees, sound perhaps two fifty years ago, but gone to rot now, had wanted lopping and clearing. Was there no wood-ranger or forester? They were nothing like the value young Mr. Hamley had represented them to be.' The remarks had come round to the squire's ears. He loved the trees that he had played under as a boy as if they were living creatures. That was on the romantic side of his nature. Merely looking at them as representing so many pounds sterling, he had esteemed them highly, and had had, until now, no opinion of another by which to correct his own judgment. So these words of the valuers cut him sharp, although he affected to disbelieve them, and tried to persuade himself that he did so. But, after all, these cares and disappointments did not touch the root of his deep resentment against Osborne. There is nothing like wounded affection for giving poignancy to anger. And the squire believed that Osborne and his advisers had been making calculations based upon his own death. He hated the idea so much, it made him so miserable, that he would not face it and define it and meet it with full inquiry and investigation. He chose rather to cherish the morbid fancy that he was useless in this world, born under an unlucky star, that all things went badly under his management. But he did not become humble in consequence. He put his misfortunes down to the score of fate, not to his own, and he imagined that Osborne saw his failures, and that his first-born grudged him his natural term of life. All these fancies would have been set to rights, could he have talked them over with his wife or even had he been accustomed to mingle much in the society of those whom he esteemed his equals. But, as has been stated, he was inferior in education to those who should have been his mates, and perhaps the jealousy and mauvaise honte that this inferiority had called out long ago extended itself in some measure to the feelings he entertained towards his sons, less to Roger than to Osborne, though the former was turning out by far the most distinguished man. But Roger was practical interested in all out-of-doors things, and he enjoyed the details, homely enough, which his father sometimes gave him of the everyday occurrences which the latter had noticed in the woods and the fields. Osborne, on the contrary, was what is commonly called fine, delicate almost to effeminacy in dress and in manner, careful in small observances. All this his father had been rather proud of in the days when he looked forward to a brilliant career at Cambridge for his son, he had at that time regarded Osborne's fastidiousness and elegance as another stepping-stone to the high and prosperous marriage which was to restore the ancient fortunes of the Hamley family. But now that Osborne had barely obtained his degree, that all the boastings of his father had proved vain, that the fastidiousness had led to unexpected expenses, to attribute the most innocent cause to Osborne's debts, the poor young man's ways and manners became a subject of irritation to his father. Osborne was still occupied with his books and his writings when he was at home, and this mode of passing the greater part of the day gave him but few subjects in common with his father when they did meet at meal-times, or in the evenings. Perhaps if Osborne had been able to have more out-of-door amusements it would have been better, but he was short-sighted, and cared little for the carefully observant pursuits of his brother. He knew but few young men of his own standing in the county. His hunting, even, of which he was passionately fond, had been curtailed this season as his father had disposed of one of the two hunters he had been hitherto allowed. The whole stable establishment had been reduced, 
perhaps because it was the economy which told most on the enjoyment of both the squire and Osborne, and which, therefore, the former took a savage pleasure in enforcing. The old carriage, a heavy family coach bought in the days of comparative prosperity, was no longer needed after Madame's death, and fell to pieces in the cobweb seclusion of the coach-house. The best of the two carriage-horses was taken for a gig, which the squire now set up, saying many a time to all who might care to listen to him, that it was the first time for generations that the Hamleys of Hamley had not been able to keep their own coach. The other carriage-horse was turned out to grass, being too old for regular work. Conqueror used to come whinnying up to the park palings whenever he saw the squire, who had always a piece of bread or some sugar or an apple for the old favourite, and would make many a complaining speech to the dumb animal, telling him of the change of time since both were in their prime. It had never been the squire's custom to encourage his boys to invite their friends to the hall. Perhaps this too was owing to his mauvaise aunt, and also to an exaggerated consciousness of the deficiencies of his establishment, as compared with what he imagined these lads were accustomed to at home. He explained this once or twice to Osborne and Roger, when they were at Rugby. "'You see, all you public schoolboys have a kind of freemasonry of your own, and outsiders are looked on by you much as I look on rabbits and all that isn't game. Ay, you may laugh, but it is so, and your friends will throw their eyes askance at me, and never think on my pedigree, which would beat theirs all to shivers, I'd be bound. No, I'll have no one here at the hall who will look down on a Hamley of Hamley, even if he only knows how to make a cross instead of write his name." Then, of course, they must not visit at houses to whose sons the squire could not or would not return a like hospitality. On all these points Mrs. Hamley had used her utmost influence without avail. His prejudices were immovable. As regarded his position as head of the oldest family in three counties, his pride was invincible. As regarded himself personally, ill at ease in the society of his equals, deficient in manners and in education, his morbid sensitiveness was too sore and too self-conscious to be called humility. Take one instance from among many similar scenes of the state of feeling between him and his eldest son, which, if it could not be called active discord, showed at least passive estrangement. It took place on an evening in the march succeeding Mrs. Hamley's death. Roger was at Cambridge. Osborne had also been from home, and he had not volunteered any information as to his absence. The squire believed that Osborne had been either at Cambridge with his brother, or in London. He would have liked to hear where his son had been, what he had been doing, and whom he had seen, purely as pieces of news, and as some diversion from the domestic worries and cares which were pressing him hard. But he was too proud to ask any questions, and Osborne had not given him any details of his journey. This silence had aggravated the squire's internal dissatisfaction, and he came home to dinner weary and sore-hearted a day or two after Osborne's return. It was just six o'clock, and he went hastily into his own little business-room on the ground floor, and after washing his hands, came into the drawing-room feeling as if he were very late, but the room was empty. He glanced at the clock over the mantelpiece as he tried to warm his hands at the fire. The fire had been neglected, and had gone out during the day. It was now piled up with half-dried wood, which sputtered and smoked instead of doing its duty in blazing and warming the room, through which the keen wind was cutting its way in all directions. The clock had stopped, no one had remembered to wind it up, but by the squire's watch it was already past dinner-time. The old butler put his head into the room, but seeing the squire alone, he was about to draw it back and wait for Mr. Osborne, before announcing dinner. He had hoped to do this unperceived, but the squire caught him in the act. "'Why isn't dinner ready?' he called out sharply. "'It's ten minutes past six. And pray, why are you using this wood? It's impossible to get oneself warm by such a fire as this." "'I believe, sir, that Thomas—don't talk to me of Thomas. Send dinner in directly.' About five minutes elapsed, spent by the hungry squire in all sorts of impatient ways, attacking Thomas, who came in to look after the fire, knocking the logs about, scattering out sparks, but considerably lessening the chances of warmth, touching up the candles, which appeared to him to give a light unusually insufficient for the large, cold room. While he was doing this, Osborne came in dressed in full evening dress. He always moved slowly, and this, to begin with, irritated the squire. Then an uncomfortable consciousness of a black coat, drab trousers, checked cotton cravat, and splashed boots forced itself upon him as he saw Osborne's point device costume. He chose to consider it affectation and finery in Osborne, 
and was on the point of bursting out with some remark, when the butler, who had watched Osborne downstairs before making the announcement, came in to say that dinner was ready. "'It surely isn't six o'clock,' said Osborne, pulling out his dainty little watch. He was scarcely more unaware than it of the storm that was brewing. Six o'clock! It's more than a quarter past!' growled out his father. "'I fancy your watch must be wrong, sir. I set mine by the horse-guards only two days ago.' Now impugning that old, steady, turnip-shaped watch of the squire's was one of the insults which, as it could not reasonably be resented, was not to be forgiven. That watch had been given him by his father when watches were watches long ago. It had given the law to house-clocks, stable-clocks, kitchen-clocks, nay, even to Hamley Church clock in its day. And was it now, in its respectable old age, to be looked down upon by a little whipper-snapper of a French watch, which could go into a man's waistcoat-pocket, instead of having to be extracted with due effort like a respectable watch of size and position from a fob in the waistband? No! Not if the whipper-snapper were backed by all the horse-guards that ever were, with the life-guards to boot. Poor Osborne might have known better than to cast this slur on his father's flesh and blood, for so dear did he hold his watch. "'My watch is like myself,' said the squire, gurning, as the Scotch say. "'Plain but steady going. At any rate, it gives the law in my house. The king may go by the horse-guards if he likes.' "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Osborne, really anxious to keep the peace. "'I went by my watch, which is certainly right by London time, and I'd no idea you were waiting for me. Otherwise I could have dressed much quicker.' "'I should think so.' said the squire, looking sarcastically at his son's attire. "'When I was a young man I should have been ashamed to have spent as much time at my looking-glass as if I'd been a girl. I could make myself as smart as any one when I was going to a dance, or to a party where I was likely to meet pretty girls. But I should have laughed at myself to scorn if I'd stood fiddle-faddling at a glass, smirking at my own likeness all for my own pleasure.' Osborne reddened, and was on the point of letting fly some caustic remark of his father's dress at the present moment but he contented himself with saying in a low voice, "'My mother always expected us all to dress for dinner. I got into the habit of doing it to please her, and I keep it up now.' Indeed, he had a certain kind of feeling of loyalty to her memory in keeping up all the little domestic habits and customs she had instituted or preferred. But the contrast which the squire thought was implied by Osborne's remark put him beside himself. "'And I, too, try to attend to her wishes. I do, and in more important things. I did when she was alive, and I do so now.' "'I never said you did not,' said Osborne, astonished at his father's passionate words and manner. "'Yes, you did, sir. You meant it. I could see by your looks. I saw you look at my morning coat. At any rate, I never neglected any wish of hers in her lifetime. If she'd wished me to go to school again and learn my ABC, I would. By God, I would!' that I wouldn't have gone playing me and lounging away my time, for fear of vexing and disappointing her. Yet some folks older than schoolboys—' The squire choked here, but though the words would not come, his passion did not diminish. "'I'll not have you casting up your mother's wishes to me, sir! You who went near to break her heart at last!' Osborne was strongly tempted to get up and leave the room. Perhaps it would have been better if he had. It might then have brought about an explanation, and a reconciliation between father and son. But he thought he did well in sitting still and appearing to take no notice. This indifference to what he was saying appeared to annoy the squire still more, and he kept on grumbling and talking to himself, till Osborne, unable to bear it any longer, said very quietly, but very bitterly, "'I am only a cause of irritation to you, and home is no longer home to me, but a place in which I am to be controlled in trifles and scolded about trifles as if I were a child. Put me in a way of making a living for myself. That much your oldest son has a right to ask of you. I will then leave this house, and you shall no longer be vexed by my dress or my want of punctuality." "'You make your request pretty much as another son did long ago. Give me the portion that falleth to me. But I don't think what he did with his money is much encouragement for me to—' Then the thought of how little he could give his son his portion, or any part of it, stopped the squire. Osborne took up the speech. "'I'm as ready as any man to earn my living. Only the preparation for any profession will cost money, and money I haven't got.' "'No more have I,' said the squire shortly. "'What is to be done, then?' said Osborne, only half believing his father's words. 
Why, you must learn to stop at home, and not take expensive journeys, and you must reduce your tailor's bill. I don't ask you to help me in the management of the land. You're far too fine a gentleman for that. But if you can't earn money, at least you needn't spend it." "'I told you I'm willing enough to earn money,' cried Osborne passionately at last. "'But how am I to do it? You really are very unreasonable, sir.' "'Am I?' said the squire, cooling in manner, though not in temper, as Osborne grew warm. "'But I don't set up for being reasonable. Men who have to pay away money that they haven't got for their extravagant sons aren't likely to be reasonable. There's two things you've gone and done which put me beside myself when I think of them. You've turned out next door to a dunce at college, when your poor mother thought so much of you, and when you might have pleased and gratified her so if you chose. And, well, I won't say what the other thing is." "'Tell me, sir,' said Osborne, almost breathless with the idea that his father had discovered his secret marriage, but the father was thinking of the money-lenders, who were calculating how soon Osborne would come into the estate. "'No,' said the squire, "'I know what I know, and I'm not going to tell you how I know it. Only I'll just say this. Your friends no more know a good piece of timber when they see it, than you or I know how you could earn five pounds if it was to keep you from starving. Now there's Roger. We none of us made an ado about him. But he'll have his fellowship now, I'll warrant him, and be a bishop, or a chancellor or something, before we found out he's clever. We've been so much taken up thinking about you. I don't know what's come over me to speak of we. We in this way," said he, suddenly dropping his voice, a change of tone as sad as sad could be. I ought to say I. It will be I, for evermore in this world." He got up and left the room in quick haste, knocking over his chair and not stopping to pick it up. Osborne, who was sitting and shading his eyes with his hand, as he had been doing for some time, looked up at the noise, and then rose as quickly and hurried after his father, only in time to hear the study door locked on the inside the moment he reached it. Osborne returned into the dining-room chagrined and sorrowful. But he was always sensitive to any omission of the usual observances, which might excite remark, and even with his heavy heart he was careful to pick up the fallen chair and restore it to its place near the bottom of the table, and afterwards so as to disturb the dishes as to make it appear that they had been touched, before ringing for Robinson. When the latter came in, followed by Thomas, Osborne thought it necessary to say to him that his father was not well, and had gone early into the study, and that he himself wanted no dessert, but would have a cup of coffee in the drawing-room. The old butler sent Thomas out of the room, and came up confidentially to Osborne. "'I thought Master wasn't justly himself, Mr. Osborne, before dinner, and therefore I made excuses for him. I did. He spoke to Thomas about the fire, sir, which is a thing I could in no wise put up with, unless by reason of sickness which I am always ready to make allowances for." "'Why shouldn't my father speak to Thomas?' said Osborne. "'But perhaps he spoke angrily, I dare say, for I am sure he's not well.' "'No, Mr. Osborne, it wasn't that. I myself am given to anger, and I am blessed with as good health as any man in my years. Besides, anger's a good thing for Thomas. He needs a great deal of it. But it should come from the right quarter, and that is me, myself, Mr. Osborne. I know my place, and I know my rights and duties as well as any butler that lives and it's my duty to scold Thomas, and not Master's. Master ought to have said, Robinson, you must speak to Thomas about letting out the fire, and I'd have given him well, and I shall do now, for that matter. But as I said before, I make excuses for Master, as being in mental distress and bodily ill-health, so I've brought myself round not to give warning, as I should have done, for certain under happier circumstances." "'Really, Robinson, I think it's all great nonsense said Osborne, weary of the long story the butler had told him, and to which he had not half attended. "'What in the world does it signify whether my father speaks to you or to Thomas? Bring me coffee in the drawing-room, and don't trouble your head any more about scolding Thomas.' Robinson went away, offended at his grievance being called nonsense. He kept muttering to himself in the intervals of scolding Thomas, and saying, "'Things is a deal changed since poor Missus went. I don't wonder Master feels it, for I'm sure I do.' She was a lady who had always become in respect for a butler's position, and could have understood how he might be hurt in his mind. She'd never accord his delicacies of feelings nonsense. Not she. No more would Mr. Roger. He's a merry young gentleman, and over-fond of bringing dirty, slimy creatures into the house. But he's always a kind word for a man who is hurt in his mind. He'd cheer up the squire, and keep him from getting so cross and willful. I wish Mr. Roger was here. I do. 
the poor squire shut up with his grief and his ill-temper as well, in the dingy, dreary study where he daily spent more and more of his indoors life, turned over his cares and troubles till he was as bewildered with the process as a squirrel must be in going round in a cage. He had out day-books and ledgers, and was calculating up back rents, and every time the sum totals came to different amounts. He could have cried like a child over his sums. He was worn out and weary, angry and disappointed. He closed his books at last with a bang. "'I'm getting old,' he said, "'and my head's less clear than it used to be. I think sorrow for her has dazed me. I never was much to boast on, but she thought a deal of me. Bless her! She'd never let me call myself stupid, but for all that I am stupid. Osborne ought to help me. He's had money enough spent on his learning, but instead he comes down dressed like a popinjay, and never troubles his head to think how I'm to pay his debts. I wish I'd told him to earn his living as a dancing-master," said the squire, with a sad smile at his own wit. He's dressed for all the world like one, and how he's spent the money no one knows. Perhaps Roger will turn up some day with a heap of creditors at his heels. No, he won't. Not Roger. He may be slow, but he's steady as old Roger. I wish he was here. He's not the eldest son, but he'd take an interest in the estate, and he'd do up these weary accounts for me. I wish Roger was here." End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 Osborne Hamley Reviews His Position Osborne had his solitary cup of coffee in the drawing-room. He was very unhappy, too, after his fashion. He stood on the hearth-rug pondering over his situation. He was not exactly aware how hardly his father was pressed for ready money. The squire had never spoken to him on the subject without being angry, and many of his loose contradictory statements, all of which, however contradictory they might appear, had their basis in truth, were set down by his son to the exaggeration of passion. But it was uncomfortable enough to a young man of Osborne's age to feel himself constantly hampered for want of a five-pound note. The principal supplies for the liberal, almost luxurious table at the hall came off the estate, so that there was no appearance of poverty as far as the household went, and as long as Osborne was content at home he had everything he could wish for. But he had a wife elsewhere, he wanted to see her continually, and that necessitated journeys. She, poor thing, had to be supported. Where was the money for the journeys, and for Aimée's modest wants to come from? That was the puzzle in Osborne's mind just now. While he had been at college his allowance, heir of the Hamleys, had been three hundred, while Roger had to be content with a hundred less. The payment of these annual sums had given the squire a good deal of trouble, but he thought of it as merely a temporary inconvenience, perhaps unreasonably thought so. Osborne was to do great things, take high honours, get a fellowship, marry a long-descended heiress, live in some of the many uninhabited rooms at the hall, and help the squire in the management of the estate that would some day be his. Roger was to be a clergyman. Steady, slow Roger was just fitted for that, and when he declined entering the church, preferring a life of more activity and adventure, Roger was to be anything. He was useful and practical, and fit for all the employments from which Osborne was shut out by his fastidiousness and his pseudo-genius. So it was well he was an eldest son, for he would never have done to struggle through the world, and as for his settling down to a profession, it would be like cutting blocks with a razor. And now here was Osborne, living at home, but longing to be elsewhere. His allowance stopped in reality. Indeed, the punctual payment of it during the last year or two had been owing to his mother's exertions, but nothing had been said about its present cessation by either father or son. Money matters were too sore a subject between them. Every now and then the squire threw him a ten-pound note or so, but the sort of suppressed growl with which it was given, and the entire uncertainty as to when he might receive such gifts, rendered any calculation based upon their receipt exceedingly vague and uncertain. "'What in the world can I do to secure an income?' thought Osborne, as he stood on the hearth-rug, his back to a blazing fire, his cup of coffee sent up in the rare old china that had belonged to the hall for generations. His dress finished as dress of Osborne's could hardly fail to be. One could hardly have thought that this elegant young man, standing there in the midst of comfort that verged on luxury, 
should have been turning over that one great problem in his mind. But so it was. What can I do to be sure of a present income? Things cannot go on as they are. I should need support for two or three years, even if I entered myself at the Temple or Lincoln's Inn. It would be impossible to live on my pay in the army. Besides, I should hate that profession. In fact, there are evils attending all professions. I couldn't bring myself to become a member of any I have ever heard of. Perhaps I am more fitted to take orders than anything else. But to be compelled to write weekly sermons whether one had anything to say or not, and probably doomed only to associate with people below one in refinement and education. Yet poor M. A. must have money. I can't bear to compare our dinners here, overloaded with joints and game and sweets, as Morgan will persist in sending them up, with M. A.'s two little mutton-chops. Yet what would my father say if he knew I had married a Frenchwoman? In his present mood he'd disinherit me, if that is possible, and he'd speak about her in a way I couldn't stand. A Roman Catholic, too. Well, I don't repent it. I do it again. Only if my mother had been in a good health, if she could have heard my story and known M.A. As it is, I must keep it secret. But where to get money? Where to get money? Then he bethought him of his poems. Would they sell? And bring him in money? In spite of Milton, he thought they might, and he went to fetch his manuscript out of his room. He sat down near the fire, trying to study them with a critical eye, to represent public opinion as far as he could. He had changed his style since the Mrs. Hemans' days. He was essentially imitative in his poetic faculty, and of late he had followed the lead of a popular writer of sonnets. He turned his poems over. They were almost equivalent to an autobiographical passage in his life. Arranging them in this order, they came as follows. To M. A., walking with a little child. To M. A., singing at her work. To M. A., turning away from me while I told my love. M. A.'s confession. M. A. in despair. The foreign land in which my M. A. dwells. The wedding ring. The wife. When he came down to this last sonnet, he put down his bundle of papers and began to think. The wife. Yes, and a French wife, and a Roman Catholic wife, and a wife who might be said to have been in service and his father's hatred of the French, both collectively and individually, collectively as tumultuous brutal ruffians who murdered their king and committed all kinds of bloody atrocities, individually as represented by Boney, and the various caricatures of the Johnny Crapeau that had been in full circulation about five and twenty years before this time, when the squire had been young and capable of receiving impressions. As for the form of religion in which Mrs. Osborne Hamley had been brought up, it is enough to say that Catholic emancipation had begun to be talked about by some politicians, and that the sullen roar of the majority of Englishmen, at the bare idea of it, was surging in the distance with ominous threatenings. The very mention of such a measure before the squire was, as Osborne well knew, like shaking a red flag before a bull. And then he considered that if M. A. had had the unspeakable, the uncomparable blessing of being born of English parents in the very heart of England, Warwickshire, for instance, and had never heard of priests, or mass, or confession, or the Pope, or Guy Fawkes, but had been born, baptized, and bred in the Church of England, without having ever seen the outside of a dissenting meeting-house or a papist chapel, even with all these advantages, her having been a—what was the equivalent for bonne in English? Nursery governess was a term hardly invented. Nursery maid, with wages paid down once a quarter, liable to be dismissed at a month's warning, and having her tea and sugar doled out to her, would be a shock to his father's old ancestral pride that he would hardly ever get over. "'If he saw her,' thought Osborne, "'if he could but see her!' But if the squire were to see M. A., he would also hear her speak her pretty broken English, precious to her husband, as it was in it that she had confessed brokenly with her English tongue that she loved him soundly with her French heart, and Squire Hamley piqued himself on being a good hater of the French. She would make such a loving, sweet, docile little daughter to my father. She would go as near as any one could towards filling up the blank void in this house. If he would but have her. But he won't. He never would. And he shan't have the opportunity of scouting her. Yet if I called her Lucy in these sonnets, and if they made a great effect, were praised in Blackwood and the Quarterly, and all the world was agog to find out the author, and I told him my secret, 
I could if I were successful. I think, then, he would ask who Lucy was, and I could tell him all then. If! How I hate ifs! If me no ifs! My life has been based on whens, and first they have turned into ifs, and then they have vanished away. It was, when Osborne gets honours, and then if Osborne, and then a failure altogether. I said to M.A., when my mother sees you, and now it is, if my father saw her, with the very faint prospect of its ever coming to pass. So he let the evening hours flow on and disappear in reveries like these, winding up with a sudden determination to try the fate of his poems with a publisher, with the direct expectation of getting money for them, and an ulterior fancy that, if successful, they might work wonders with his father. When Roger came home Osborne did not let a day pass before telling his brother of his plans. He never did conceal anything long from Roger. The feminine part of his character made him always desirous of a confidant, and as sweet sympathy as he could extract. But Roger's opinion had no effect on Osborne's actions, and Roger knew this full well. So when Osborne began with, "'I want your advice on a plan I have got in my head,' Roger replied, "'Some one told me that the Duke of Wellington's maxim was never to give advice, unless he could enforce its being carried into effect. Now I can't do that. And you know, old boy, you don't follow out my advice when you've got it.' "'Not always, I know. Not when it doesn't agree with my own opinion. You're thinking about this concealment of my marriage, but you're not up in all the circumstances. You know how fully I meant to have done it, if there hadn't been that row about my debts and then my mother's illness and death. And now you've no conception how my father has changed, how irritable it's become. Wait till you've been at home a week. Robinson, Morgan, it's the same with them all, but worst of all with me." "'Poor fellow,' said Roger. I thought he looked terribly changed, shrunken, and his ruddiness of complexion altered. Why, he hardly takes half the exercise he used to do, so it's no wonder. He has turned away all the men off the new works, which used to be such an interest to him, and because the roan cob stumbled with him one day, and nearly threw him, he won't ride it, and yet he won't sell it and buy another, which would be the sensible plan. So there are two old horses eating their heads off, while he is constantly talking about money and expense. And that brings me to what I was going to say. I'm desperately hard up for money, and so I've been collecting my poems, weeding them well, you know, going over them quite critically, in fact and I want to know if you think Dayton would publish them. You've a name in Cambridge, you know, and I dare say he would look at them if you offered them to him." "'I can but try,' said Roger. "'But I'm afraid you won't get much by them." "'I don't expect much. I'm a new man, and must make my name. I should be content with a hundred. If I'd a hundred pounds I'd set myself to do something. I might keep myself and M.A. by my writings while I studied for the bar. Or if the worst came to the worst, a hundred pounds would take us to Australia." "'Australia? Why, Osborne, what would you do there? And leave my father? I hope you'll never get your hundred pounds, if that's the use you're to make of it. Why, you'd break the squire's heart." "'It might have done once,' said Osborne gloomily. "'But it wouldn't now. He looks at me askance and shies away from conversation with me. Let me alone for noticing and feeling this kind of thing. It's this very susceptibility to outward things that gives me what faculty I have, and it seems to me as if my bread and my wife's too were to depend upon it. You'll soon see for yourself the terms which I am on with my father." Roger did soon see. His father had slipped into a habit of silence at meal-times, a habit which Osborne, who was troubled and anxious enough for his own part, had not striven to break. Father and son sat together and exchanged all the necessary speeches connected with the occasion civilly enough, but it was a relief to them when their intercourse was over and they separated, the father to brood over his sorrow and his disappointment, which were real and deep enough, and the injury he had received from his boy, which was exaggerated in his mind by his ignorance of the actual steps Osborne had taken to raise money. If the money-lenders had calculated the chances of his father's life or death in making their bargain, Osborne himself had thought only of how soon and how easily he could get the money requisite for clearing him from all imperious claims at Cambridge, and for enabling him to follow M. A. to her home in Alsace, and for the subsequent marriage. As yet, Roger had never seen his brother's wife, 
Indeed, he had only been taken into Osborne's full confidence after all was decided in which his advice could have been useful. And now, in the enforced separation, Osborne's whole thought, both the poetical and practical sides of his mind, ran upon the little wife who was passing her lonely days in farmhouse lodgings, wondering when her bridegroom husband would come to her next. With such an engrossing subject, it was perhaps no wonder that he unconsciously neglected his father, but it was none the less sad at the time, and to be regretted in its consequences. "'I may come in and have a pipe with you, sir, mayn't I?' said Roger that first evening, pushing gently against the study door, which his father held only half open. "'You'll not like it,' said the squire, still holding the door against him, but speaking in a relenting tone. "'The tobacco I use isn't what young men like. Better go and have a cigar with Osborne.' "'No, I want to sit with you, and I can stand pretty strong tobacco.' Roger pushed in, the resistance slowly giving way before him. "'It'll make your clothes smell. You'll have to borrow Osborne's sense to sweeten yourself,' said the squire grimly, at the same time pushing a short, smart, amber-mouthed pipe to his son. "'No, I'll have a churchwarden. What, father, do you think I'm a baby to put up with a doll's head like this?' looking at the carving upon it. The squire was pleased in his heart, though he did not choose to show it. He only said, "'Osborne brought it me when he came back from Germany. That's three years ago.' And then for some time they smoked in silence. But the voluntary companionship of his son was very soothing to the squire, though not a word might be said. The next speech he made showed the direction of his thoughts. Indeed, his words were always a transparent medium through which the current might be seen. "'A deal of a man's life comes and goes in three years. I've found that out.' And he puffed away at his pipe again. While Roger was turning over in his mind what answer to make to this truism, the squire again stopped his smoking and spoke. "'I remember when there was all that fuss about the Prince of Wales being made regent. I read somewhere—' I dare say it was in a newspaper, that kings and their heirs apparent were always on bad terms. Osborne was quite a little chap then. He used to go out riding with me on White Surrey. You won't remember the pony we called White Surrey?" "'I remember it. But I thought it a tall horse in those days.' "'Ah! That was because you were such a small lad, you know. I'd seven horses in the stable then, not counting the farm horses. I don't recollect having a care then. Except— she was always delicate, you know. But what a beautiful boy Osborne was! He was always dressed in black velvet. It was a foppery, but it wasn't my doing, and it was all right, I'm sure. He's a handsome fellow now, but the sunshine has gone out of his face. He's a good deal troubled about this money, and the anxiety he has given you," said Roger, rather taking his brother's feelings for granted. Not he! said the squire, taking the pipe out of his mouth, and hitting the bowl so sharply against the hob that it broke in pieces. Oh, there! But never mind. I say not he, Roger. He's none troubled about the money. It's easy getting money from Jews if you're the eldest son of the heir. They just ask, how old is your father, and has he had a stroke or a fit? And it's settled out of hand. Then they come prowling about a place and running down the timber and land. Don't let us speak of him. It's no good, Roger. He and I are out of tune, and it seems to me as if only God Almighty could put us to rights. It's thinking of how he grieved her at last that makes me so bitter with him. And yet there's a deal of good in him, and he's so quick and clever if only he'd give his mind to things. Now you were always slow, Roger. All your masters used to say so." Roger laughed a little. "'Yes, I had many a nickname at school for my slowness,' said he. "'Never mind,' said the squire, consolingly. "'I'm sure I don't. If you were a clever fellow like Osborne yonder, you'd be all for caring for books and writing, and you'd perhaps find it as dull as he does to keep company with a bumpkin Squire Jones like me. Yet I dare say they think a deal of you at Cambridge,' said he, after a pause, "'since you've got this fine wranglership. I'd nearly forgotten that. The news came at such a miserable time.' "'Well, yes. They're always proud of the senior wrangler of the year up at Cambridge. Next year I must abdicate." The squire sat and gazed into the embers, still holding his useless pipe-stem. At last he said, in a low voice, as if scarcely aware he had got a listener, "'I used to write to her when she was away in London, and tell her the home news. 
but no letter will reach her now. Nothing reaches her." Roger started up. "'Where's the tobacco-box, father? Let me fill you another pipe.' And when he had done so, he stooped over his father and stroked his cheek. The squire shook his head. "'You've only just come home, lad. You don't know me as I am nowadays. Ask Robinson. I won't have you asking Osborne, he ought to keep it to himself. But any of the servants will tell you I am not like the same man for getting into passions with them. I used to be reckoned a good master. But that's past now. Osborne was once a little boy. And she was once alive. And I was once a good master. A good master. Yes, it's all past now." He took up his pipe and began to smoke afresh and Roger, after a silence of some minutes, began a long story about some Cambridge man's misadventure on the hunting-field, telling it with such humour that the squire was beguiled into hearty laughing. When they rose to go to bed, his father said to Roger, "'Well, we've had a pleasant evening. At least I have. But perhaps you haven't, for I am but poor company now, I know.' "'I don't know when I've passed a happier evening, father,' said Roger. And he spoke truly though he did not trouble himself to find out the cause of his happiness. End of chapter 23《Chapter 24 Mrs. Gibson's Little Dinner All this had taken place before Roger's first meeting with Molly and Cynthia at Miss Browning's, and the little dinner on the Friday at Mr. Gibson's which followed in due sequence. Mrs. Gibson intended the Hamleys to find this dinner pleasant, and they did. Mr. Gibson was fond of the two young men, both for their parents' sake and their own, for he had known them since boyhood, and to those whom he liked Mr. Gibson could be remarkably agreeable. Mrs. Gibson really gave them a welcome, and cordiality in a hostess is a very becoming mantle for any other deficiencies there may be. Cynthia and Molly looked their best which was all the duty Mrs. Gibson absolutely required of them, as she was willing enough to take her full share in the conversation. Osborne fell to her lot, of course, and for some time he and she prattled on with all the ease of manner and commonplaceness of meaning which go far to make the art of polite conversation. Roger, who ought to have made himself agreeable to one or the other of the young ladies, was exceedingly interested in what Mr. Gibson was telling him of a paper on comparative osteology in some foreign journal of science, which Lord Hollingford was in the habit of forwarding to his friend the country surgeon. Yet every now and then, while he listened, he caught his attention wandering to the face of Cynthia, who was placed between his brother and Mr. Gibson. She was not particularly occupied with attending to anything that was going on. Her eyelids were carelessly dropped, as she crumbled her bread on the tablecloth, and her beautiful long eyelashes were seen on the clear tint of her oval cheek. She was thinking of something else. Molly was trying to understand with all her might. Suddenly Cynthia looked up, and caught Roger's gaze of intent admiration too fully for her to be unaware that he was staring at her. She coloured a little, but after the first moment of rosy confusion at his evident admiration of her, she flew to the attack, diverting his confusion at thus being caught, to the defence of himself from her accusation. "'It is quite true,' she said to him. "'I was not attending. You see I don't even know the ABC of science. But please don't look so severely at me, even if I am a dunce.' "'I didn't know. I didn't mean to look severely, I am sure,' replied he, not knowing well what to say. "'Cynthia is not a dunce, either,' said Mrs. Gibson afraid lest her daughter's opinion of herself might be taken seriously. But I have always observed that some people have a talent for one thing and some for another. Now Cynthia's talents are not for science and the severer studies. Do you remember, love, what trouble I had to teach you the use of the globes? Yes, and I don't know longitude from latitude now, and I am always puzzled as to which is perpendicular and which is horizontal. Yes, I do assure you her mother continued, rather addressing herself to Osborne, that her memory for poetry is prodigious. I have heard her repeat the prisoner of Chillon from beginning to end." "'It would be rather a bore to have to hear her, I think,' said Mr. Gibson, smiling at Cynthia, who gave him back one of her bright looks of mutual understanding. "'Ah, Mr. Gibson, I have found out before now that you have no soul for poetry, 
and Molly there is your own child. She reads such deep books, all about facts and figures. She'll be quite a blue stocking by and by." Mamma said Molly, reddening, you think it was a deep book, because there were the shapes of the different cells of bees in it. But it was not at all deep. It was very interesting." "'Never mind, Molly,' said Osborne. "'I stand up for blue stockings." "'And I object to the distinction implied in what you say,' said Roger. "'It was not deep, ergo, it was very interesting. Now a book may be both deep and interesting. Oh, if you're going to chop logic and use Latin words, I think it is time for us to leave the room," said Mrs. Gibson. "'Don't let us run away as if we were beaten, mamma," said Cynthia. "'Though it may be logic, I for one can understand what Mr. Roger Hamley said just now, and I read some of Molly's books. And whether it was deep or not, I found it very interesting. More so than I should think the prisoner of Chillon nowadays. I have displaced the prisoner to make room for Johnny Gilpin as my favourite poem." "'How could you talk such nonsense, Cynthia?' said Mrs. Gibson, as the girls followed her upstairs. "'You know you are not a dunce. It is all very well not to be a blue stocking, because gentle people don't like that kind of woman. But running yourself down, and contradicting all I said about your liking for Byron, and poets and poetry, to Osborne Hamley of all men, too!' Mrs. Gibson spoke quite crossly for her. "'But, mamma," Cynthia replied, I am either a dunce or I am not. If I am, I did right to own it. If I am not, he's a dunce if he doesn't find out I was joking." "'Well,' said Mrs. Gibson, a little puzzled by this speech, and wanting some elucidatory addition. "'Only that if he's a dunce his opinion of me is worth nothing. So anyway it doesn't signify. You really bewilder me with your nonsense, child. Molly is worth twenty of you." "'I quite agree with you, mamma said Cynthia, turning round to take Molly's hand. "'Yes, but she ought not to be,' said Mrs. Gibson, still irritated. "'Think of the advantages you've had.' "'I'm afraid I had rather be a dunce than a blue-stocking,' said Molly, for the term had a little annoyed her, and the annoyance was rankling still. "'Hush! Here they are coming. I hear the dining-room door. I never meant you were a blue-stocking, dear, so don't look vexed. Cynthia, my love, where did you get those lovely flowers? Anemones, are they? They suit your complexion so exactly." "'Come, Molly, don't look so grave and thoughtful,' exclaimed Cynthia. "'Don't you perceive Mamma wants us to be smiling and amiable?' Mr. Gibson had had to go out to his evening round, and the young men were all too glad to come up into the pretty drawing-room. The bright little wood fire, the comfortable easy chairs which, with so small a party, might be drawn round the hearth, the good-natured hostess the pretty, agreeable girls. Roger sauntered up to the corner where Cynthia was standing, playing with a hand-screen. "'There is a charity ball in Hollingford soon, isn't there?' asked he. "'Yes, on Easter Tuesday,' she replied. "'Are you going? I suppose you are.' "'Yes. Mamma is going to take Molly and me.' "'You will enjoy it very much. Going together?' For the first time during this little conversation she glanced up at him real honest pleasure shining out of her eyes. "'Yes. Going together will make the enjoyment of the thing. It would be dull without her.' "'You are great friends, then?' he asked. "'I never thought I should like any one so much. Any girl, I mean.' She put in the final reservation in all simplicity of heart, and in all simplicity did he understand it. He came ever so little nearer, and dropped his voice a little. "'I was so anxious to know. I am so glad. I have often wondered how you two were getting on." "'Have you?' said she, looking up again. "'At Cambridge. You must be very fond of Molly.' "'Yes, I am. She was with us so long, and at such a time. I look upon her almost as a sister.' "'And she is very fond of all of you. I seem to know you all from hearing her talk about you so much. All of you,' she said laying an emphasis on all to show that it included the dead as well as the living. Roger was silent for a minute or two. "'I didn't know you, even by hearsay. So you mustn't wonder that I was a little afraid. But as soon as I saw you I knew how it must be, and it was such a relief.' "'Cynthia!' said Mrs. Gibson, who thought that the younger son had had quite his share of low confidential conversation. 
Come here and sing that little French ballad to Mr. Osborne Hamley. Which do you mean, Mamma? Tout en repentira, Colin? Yes, such a pretty, playful little warning to young men, said Mrs. Gibson, smiling up at Osborne. The refrain is Tout en repentira, Colin, tout en repentira, car si tu prends une femme, Colin, tout en repentira. The advice may apply very well when there is a French wife in the case, but not, I am sure, to an Englishman who is thinking of an English wife. This choice of a song was exceedingly mal a propos, had Mrs. Gibson but known it. Osborne and Roger, knowing that the wife of the former was a Frenchwoman, and conscious of each other's knowledge, felt doubly awkward, while Molly was as much confused as though she herself were secretly married. However, Cynthia carolled the saucy ditty out, and her mother smiled at it, in total ignorance of any application it might have. Osborne had instinctively gone to stand behind Cynthia as she sat at the piano, so as to be ready to turn over the leaves of her music if she required it. He kept his hands in his pockets, and his eyes fixed on her fingers, his countenance clouded with gravity at all the merry quips which she so playfully sang. Roger looked grave as well, but was much more at his ease than his brother. Indeed, he was half amused by the awkwardness of the situation. He caught Molly's troubled eyes and heightened colour, and he saw that she was feeling this contretemps more seriously than she needed to do. He moved to a seat by her and half whispered, "'Too late a warning, is it not?' Molly looked up at him as he leant towards her, and replied in the same tone, "'Oh, I am so sorry.' "'You need not be. He won't mind it long, and a man must take the consequences when he puts himself in a false position.' Molly could not tell what to reply to this, so she hung her head and kept silence. Yet she could see that Roger did not change his attitude or remove his hand from the back of his chair, and, impelled by curiosity to find out the cause of his stillness, she looked up at him at length, and saw his gaze fixed on the two who were near the piano. Osborne was saying something eagerly to Cynthia, whose grave eyes were upturned to him with soft intentness of expression, and her pretty mouth half open, with a sort of impatience for him to cease speaking, that she might reply. "'They are talking about France,' said Roger, in answer to Molly's unspoken question. "'Osborne knows it well, and Miss Kirkpatrick has been at school there, you know.' It sounds very interesting. Shall we go nearer and hear what they are saying?" It was all very well to ask this civilly, but Molly thought it would have been better to wait for her answer. Instead of waiting, however, Roger went to the piano, and, leaning on it, appeared to join in the light merry talk, while he feasted his eyes as much as he dared by looking at Cynthia. Molly suddenly felt as if she could scarcely keep from crying. A minute ago he had been so near to her, and talking so pleasantly and confidentially and now he almost seemed as if he had forgotten her existence. She thought that all this was wrong, and she exaggerated its wrongness to herself. Mean, and envious of Cynthia, and ill-natured, and selfish, were the terms she kept applying to herself. But it did no good. She was just as naughty at the last as at the first. Mrs. Gibson broke into the state of things which Molly thought was to endure for ever. Her work had been intricate up to this time, and had required a great deal of counting, so she had had no time to attend to her duties, one of which she always took to be to show herself to the world as an impartial stepmother. Cynthia had played and sung, and now she must give Molly her turn of exhibition. Cynthia's singing and playing was light and graceful, but anything but correct. But she herself was so charming that it was only fanatics for music who cared for false chords and omitted notes. Molly, on the contrary, had an excellent ear, if she had ever been well taught, and both from inclination and conscientious perseverance of disposition, she would go over an incorrect passage for twenty times. But she was very shy of playing in company, and when forced to do it, she went through her performance heavily, and hated her handiwork more than any one. "'Now you must play a little, Molly,' said Mrs. Gibson. "'Play us that beautiful piece of Kalkbrenner's, my dear.' Molly looked up at her stepmother with beseeching eyes, but it only brought out another form of request, still more like a command. "'Go at once, my dear. You may not play it quite rightly, and I know you are very nervous, but you are quite amongst friends.' So there was a disturbance made in the little group at the piano, and Molly sat down to her martyrdom. "'Please go away,' said she to Osborne, who was standing behind her, ready to turn over. "'I can quite well do it for myself.' and, oh, if you would but talk!" 
Osborne remained where he was in spite of her appeal, and gave her what little approval she got. For Mrs. Gibson, exhausted by her previous labour of counting her stitches, fell asleep in her comfortable sofa-corner near the fire. And Roger, who began at first to talk a little in compliance with Molly's request, found his conversation with Cynthia so agreeable that Molly lost her place several times in trying to catch a sudden glimpse of Cynthia sitting at her work, and Roger by her, intent on catching her low replies to what he was saying. "'There, now, I've done,' said Molly, standing up quickly as soon as she had finished the eighteen dreary pages. "'And I think I will never sit down to play again.' Osborne laughed at her vehemence. Cynthia began to take some part in what was being said, and thus made the conversation general. Mrs. Gibson wakened up gracefully, as was her way of doing all things, and slid into the subjects they were talking about so easily that she almost succeeded in making them believe she had never been asleep at all. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 Hollingford in a Bustle All Hollingford felt as if there was a great deal to be done before Easter this year. There was Easter proper, which always required new clothing of some kind, for fear of certain consequences from little birds, who were supposed to resent the impiety of those that did not wear some new article of dress on Easter day. And most ladies considered it wiser that the little birds should see the new article for themselves, and not have to take it upon trust, as they would have to do if it were merely a pocket-handkerchief, or a petticoat, or any article of underclothing. So piety demanded a new bonnet, or a new gown, and was barely satisfied with an Easter pair of gloves. Miss Rose was generally very busy just before Easter in Hollingford. Then this year there was the charity ball. Ashcombe, Hollingford, and Coram were three neighbouring towns, of about the same number of population, lying at the three equidistant corners of a triangle. In imitation of greater cities with their festivals, these three towns had agreed to have an annual ball for the benefit of the county hospital to be held in turn at each place, and Hollingford was to be the place this year. It was a fine time for hospitality, and every house of any pretension was as full as it could hold, and flies were engaged long months before. If Mrs. Gibson could have asked Osborne, or in default Roger Hamley, to go to the ball with them and to sleep at their house, or if, indeed, she could have picked up any stray scion of a county family to whom such an offer would have been a convenience, she would have restored her own dressing-room to its former use as the spare-room with pleasure. But she did not think it was worth her while to put herself out for any of the humdrum and ill-dressed women who had been her former acquaintances at Ashcombe. For Mr. Preston it might have been worth while to give up her room, considering him in the light of a handsome and prosperous young man, and a good dancer besides but there were more lights in which he was to be viewed. Mr. Gibson, who really wanted to return the hospitality shown to him by Mr. Preston at the time of his marriage, had yet an instinctive distaste to the man, which no wish of freeing himself from obligation, nor even the more worthy feeling of hospitality could overcome. Mrs. Gibson had some old grudges of her own against him, but she was not one to retain angry feelings, or be very active in her retaliation. She was afraid of Mr. Preston, and admired him at the same time. It was awkward, too, so she said, to go into a ballroom without any gentleman at all, and Mr. Gibson was so uncertain. On the whole, partly for this last given reason, and partly because conciliation was the best policy, Mrs. Gibson was slightly in favour of inviting Mr. Preston to be their guest. But as soon as Cynthia heard the question discussed, or rather, as soon as she heard it discussed in Mr. Gibson's absence, she said that if Mr. Preston came to be their visitor on the occasion, she for one would not go to the ball at all. She did not speak with vehemence or in anger, but with such quiet resolution that Molly looked up in surprise. She saw that Cynthia was keeping her eyes fixed on her work, and that she had no intention of meeting any one's gaze, or giving any further explanation. Mrs. Gibson, too, looked perplexed, and once or twice seemed on the point of asking some question, but she was not angry as Molly had fully expected. She watched Cynthia furtively and in silence for a minute or two, and then said that, after all, she could not conveniently give up her dressing-room, and altogether they had better say no more about it. So no stranger was invited to stay at Mr. Gibson's at the time of the ball, but Mrs. Gibson spoke openly of her regret at the unavoidable inhospitality, and hoped that they might be able to build an addition to their house before the next triennial Hollingford ball. 
Another cause of unusual bustle at Hollingford this Easter was the expected return of the family to the Towers, after their unusually long absence. Mr. Sheepshanks might be seen trotting up and down on his stout old cob, speaking to attentive masons, plasterers, and glaziers about putting everything, on the outside at least, about the cottages belonging to my lord, in perfect repair. Lord Cumnor owned the greater part of the town, and those who lived under other landlords, or in houses of their own, were stirred up by the dread of contrast to do up their dwellings. So the ladders of whitewashers and painters were sadly in the way of the ladies tripping out in these days. The housekeeper and steward from the towers might also be seen coming in to give orders at the various shops, and stopping here and there at those kept by favourites, to avail themselves of the eagerly tendered refreshments. Lady Harriet came to call on her old governess the day after the arrival of the family at the Towers. Molly and Cynthia were out walking when she came, doing some errands for Mrs. Gibson, who had a secret idea that Lady Harriet would call at the particular time she did, and had a not uncommon wish to talk to her ladyship without the corrective presence of any member of her own family. Mrs. Gibson did not give Molly the message of remembrance that Lady Harriet had left for her but she imparted various pieces of news relating to the Towers with great animation and interest. The Duchess of Menteith and her daughter Lady Alice were coming to the Towers, would be there the day of the ball, would come to the ball, and the Menteith diamonds were famous. That was piece of news the first. The second was that ever so many gentlemen were coming to the Towers, some English, some French. This piece of news would have come first in order of importance, had there been much probability of their being dancing men and, as such, possible partners at the coming ball. But Lady Harriet had spoken of them as Lord Hollingford's friends, useless scientific men in all probability. Then, finally, Mrs. Gibson was to go to the Towers next day to lunch. Lady Cumnor had written a little note by Lady Harriet to beg her to come. If Mrs. Gibson could manage to find her way to the Towers, one of the carriages in use should bring her back to her own house in the course of the afternoon. "'The dear Countess!' said Mrs. Gibson, with soft affection. It was a soliloquy, uttered after a minute's pause, at the end of all this information. And all the rest of that day her conversation had an aristocratic perfume hanging about it. One of the few books she had brought with her into Mr. Gibson's house was bound in pink, and in it she studied Menteith, Duke of, Adolphus George, etc., etc., till she was fully up in all the Duchess's connections and probable interests. Mr. Gibson made his mouth up into a droll whistle when he came home at night, and found himself in a tower's atmosphere. Molly saw the shade of annoyance through the drollery. She was beginning to see it oftener than she liked. Not that she reasoned upon it, or that she consciously traced the annoyance to its source, but she could not help feeling uneasy in herself when she knew her father was in the least put out. Of course a fly was ordered for Mrs. Gibson. In the early afternoon she came home. If she had been disappointed in her interview with the Countess, she never told her woe, nor revealed the fact that when she first arrived at the Towers she had to wait for an hour in Lady Cumnor's morning-room, uncheered by any companionship save that of her old friend Mrs. Bradley, till suddenly, Lady Harriet coming in, she exclaimed, "'Why, Clare, you dear woman, are you here all alone? Does Mamma know?' And after a little more affectionate conversation she rushed to find her ladyship, who was perfectly aware of the fact but too deep in giving the Duchess the benefit of her wisdom and experience in trousseau, to be at all aware of the length of time Mrs. Gibson had been passing in patient solitude. At lunch Mrs. Gibson was secretly hurt by my lord supposing it to be her dinner, and calling out his urgent hospitality from the very bottom of the table, giving as a reason for it that she must remember it was her dinner. In vain she piped out in her soft high voice, "'Oh, my lord, I never eat meat in the middle of the day. I can hardly eat anything at lunch.' Her voice was lost, and the Duchess might go away with the idea that the Hollingford doctor's wife dined early, that is to say, if her grace ever condescended to have any idea on the subject at all, which presupposes that she was cognizant of the fact of there being a doctor at Hollingford, and that he had a wife, and that his wife was the pretty, faded, elegant-looking woman, sending away her plate of untasted food, food which she longed to eat, for she really was desperately hungry after her drive and her solitude. And then, after her lunch, there did come a tete-a-tete with Lady Cumnor, which was conducted after this wise. "'Well, Clare, I am really glad to see you. I once thought I should never get back to the Towers, but here I am. There was such a clever man at Bath, a Dr. Snape. He cured me at last, quite set me up. 
I really think if I am ever ill again I shall send for him. It is such a thing to find a really clever medical man. Oh, by the way, I always forget you've married Mr. Gibson. Of course he is very clever and all that. The carriage to the door in ten minutes, Brown, and desire Bradley to bring my things down. What was I asking you? Oh, how do you get on with the stepdaughter? She seemed to me a young lady with a pretty stubborn will of her own. I put a letter for the post down somewhere, and I cannot think where. Do help me look for it. There's a good woman. Just run to my room and see if Brown can find it, for it is of great consequence." Off went Mrs. Gibson rather unwillingly, for there were several things she wanted to speak about, and she had not heard half of what she had expected to learn of the family gossip. But all chance was gone, for when she came back from her fruitless errand, Lady Cumnor and the Duchess were in full talk, Lady Cumnor with the missing letter in her hand, which she was using something like a baton to enforce her words. "'Every iota from Paris! Every iota!' Lady Cumnor was too much of a lady not to apologize for useless trouble, but they were nearly the last words she spoke to Mrs. Gibson, for she had to go out and drive with the Duchess, and the broom to take Clare, as she persisted in calling Mrs. Gibson, back to Hollingford followed the carriage to the door. Lady Harriet came away from her entourage of young men and young ladies, all prepared for some walking expedition, to wish Mrs. Gibson good-bye. "'We shall see you at the ball,' she said. "'You'll be there with your two girls, of course, and I must have a little talk with you there. With all these visitors in the house, it has been impossible to see anything of you to-day, you know.' Such were the facts, but rose colour was the medium through which they were seen by Mrs. Gibson's household listeners on her return. "'There are many visitors staying at the Towers. Oh, yes, a great many. The Duchess and Lady Alice, and Mr. and Mrs. Gray, and Lord Albert Monson and his sister, and my old friend Captain James of the Blues. Many more, in fact. But, of course, I preferred going to Lady Cumnor's own room, where I could see her and Lady Harriet quietly, and where we were not disturbed by the bustle downstairs. Of course, we were obliged to go down to lunch, and then I saw my old friends, and renewed pleasant acquaintances. But I really could hardly get any connected conversation with any one. Lord Cumnor seemed so delighted to see me there again, though there were six or seven between us, and he was always interrupting with some civil or kind speech especially addressed to me. And after lunch Lady Cumnor asked me all sorts of questions about my new life, with as much interest as if I had been her daughter. To be sure, when the Duchess came in we had to leave off, and talk about the trousseau she is preparing for Lady Alice. Lady Harriet made such a point of our meeting at the ball. She is such a good, affectionate creature, is Lady Harriet." This last was said in a tone of meditative appreciation. The afternoon of the day on which the ball was to take place, a servant rode over from Hamley with two lovely nosegays, with the Mr. Hamley's compliments to Miss Gibson and Miss Kirkpatrick. Cynthia was the first to receive them. She came dancing into the drawing-room, flourishing the flowers about in either hand, and danced up to Molly, who was trying to settle to her reading, by way of passing the time away till the evening came. "'Look, Molly, look! Here are bouquets for us. Long life to the givers!' "'Who are they from?' asked Molly, taking hold of one, and examining it with tender delight at its beauty. "'Who from? Why, the two paragons of Hamleys, to be sure. Is it not a pretty attention?' "'How kind of them!' said Molly. "'I am sure it is Osborne who thought of it. He has been so much abroad, where it is such a common compliment to send bouquets to young ladies." "'I don't see why I should think it is Osborne's thought,' said Molly, reddening a little. "'Mr. Roger Hamley used to gather nosegays constantly for his mother, and sometimes for me.' "'Well, never mind whose thought it was, or who gathered them. We've got the flowers, and that's enough. Molly, I'm sure these red flowers will just match your coral necklace and bracelets,' said Cynthia, pulling out some camellias, then a rare kind of flower. "'Oh, please don't!' exclaimed Molly. "'Don't you see how carefully the colours are arranged? They've taken such pains. Please don't.' "'Nonsense!' said Cynthia, continuing to pull them out. "'See, here are quite enough. I'll make you a little coronet of them, sewn on black velvet, which will never be seen, just as they do in France.' "'Oh, I am so sorry. It is quite spoilt,' said Molly. "'Never mind. I'll take this spoilt bouquet. I can make it up again just as prettily as ever and you shall have this, which has never been touched." Cynthia went on arranging the crimson buds and flowers to her taste. Molly said nothing, but kept watching Cynthia's nimble fingers tying up the wreath. "'There,' said Cynthia at last, "'when that is sewn on black velvet to keep the flowers from dying, you'll see how pretty it will look. 
and there are enough red flowers in this untouched nosegay to carry out the idea." "'Thank you,' very slowly. "'But shan't you mind having only the wrecks of the other?' "'Not I. Red flowers would not go with my pink dress.' "'But I dare say they arranged each nosegay so carefully.' "'Perhaps they did. But I never would allow sentiment to interfere with my choice of colours, and pink does tie one down. Now you, in white muslin, just tipped with crimson, like a daisy, may wear anything." Cynthia took the utmost pains in dressing Molly, leaving the clever housemaid to her mother's exclusive service. Mrs. Gibson was more anxious about her attire than was either of the girls. It had given her occasion for deep thought and not a few sighs. Her deliberation had ended in her wearing her pearl-gray satin wedding-gown, with a profusion of lace, and white and coloured lilacs. Cynthia was the one who took the affair most lightly. Molly looked upon the ceremony of dressing for a first ball as rather a serious ceremony, certainly as an anxious proceeding. Cynthia was almost as anxious as herself. Only Molly wanted her appearance to be correct and unnoticed, and Cynthia was desirous of setting off Molly's rather peculiar charms, her cream-coloured skin, her profusion of curly black hair, her beautiful long-shaped eyes with their shy, loving expression. Cynthia took up so much time in dressing Molly to her mind that she herself had to perform her toilette in a hurry. Molly, ready dressed, sat on a low chair in Cynthia's room, watching the pretty creature's rapid movements as she stood in her petticoat before the glass, doing up her hair, with quick certainty of effect. At length Molly heaved a sigh and said, "'I should like to be pretty.' "'Why, Molly!' said Cynthia, turning round with an exclamation on the tip of her tongue, but when she caught the innocent wistful look on Molly's face, she instinctively checked what she was going to say, and half smiling to her own reflection in the glass, she said, "'The French girls would tell you, to believe that you were pretty would make you so.' Molly paused before replying. "'I suppose they would mean that if you knew you were pretty, you would never think about your looks. You would be so certain of being liked, and that it is caring. Listen, that's eight o'clock striking. Don't trouble yourself with trying to interpret a French girl's meaning, but help me on with my frock. There's a dear one." The two girls were dressed, and were standing over the fire waiting for the carriage in Cynthia's room, when Maria, Betty's successor, came hurrying into the room. Maria had been officiating as maid to Mrs. Gibson, but she had had intervals of leisure, in which she had rushed upstairs, and under the pretense of offering her services, had seen the young ladies' dresses and the sight of so many nice clothes had sent her into a state of excitement which made her think of nothing of rushing upstairs for the twentieth time, with a nosegay still more beautiful than the two previous ones. "'Here, Miss Kirkpatrick! No, it's not for you, miss,' as Molly, being nearer to the door, offered to take it and pass it to Cynthia. "'It's for Miss Kirkpatrick, and there's a note for her besides.' Cynthia said nothing, but took the note and the flowers. She held the note so that Molly could read it at the same time she did. I send you some flowers, and you must allow me to claim the first dance after nine o'clock, before which time I fear I cannot arrive. R. P. Who is it? asked Molly. Cynthia looked extremely irritated, indignant, perplexed. What was it turned her cheek so pale, and made her eyes so full of fire? It is Mr. Preston, said she in answer to Molly. I shall not dance with him, and here go his flowers into the very middle of the embers, which she immediately stirred down upon the beautiful shrivelling petals, as if she wished to annihilate them as soon as possible. Her voice had never been raised, it was as sweet as usual, nor, though her movements were prompt enough, were they hasty or violent. "'Oh!' said Molly, "'those beautiful flowers! We might have put them in water!' "'No,' said Cynthia, "'it's best to destroy them. We don't want them, and I can't bear to be reminded of that man.' It was an impertinent familiar note," said Molly. What right had he to express himself in that way? No beginning, no end, and only initials. Did you know him well when you were at Ashcombe, Cynthia?" "'Oh, don't let us think any more about him,' replied Cynthia. It is quite enough to spoil any pleasure at the ball to think that he will be there. But I hope I shall get engaged before he comes, so that I can't dance with him. And don't you, either." "'There, they are calling for us,' exclaimed Molly, and with quick step yet careful of their draperies, they made their way downstairs to the place where Mr. and Mrs. Gibson awaited them. Yes, Mr. Gibson was going, even if he had to leave them afterwards to attend to any professional call. And Molly suddenly began to admire her father as a handsome man, 
when she saw him now in full evening attire. Mrs. Gibson, too, how pretty she was! In short, it was true that no better-looking a party than these four people entered the Hollingford ballroom that evening. End of chapter 25《Chapter Twenty Six: A Charity Ball At the present time there are few people at a public ball besides the dancers and their chaperones, or relations in some degree interested in them. But in the days when Molly and Cynthia were young, before railroads were, and before their consequences, the excursion trains, which take every one up to London nowadays, there to see their fill of gay crowds and fine dresses, to go to an annual charity ball, even though all thought of dancing had passed by years ago, and without any of the responsibilities of a chaperone, was a very allowable and favourite piece of dissipation to all the kindly old maids who thronged the country towns of England. They aired their old lace and their best dresses, they saw the aristocratic magnates of the countryside, they gossiped with their coevals and speculated on the romances of the young around them in a curious yet friendly spirit. The Miss Brownings would have thought themselves sadly defrauded of the gayest event of the year if anything had prevented their attending the charity ball, and Miss Browning would have been indignant, Miss Phoebe aggrieved, had they not been asked to Ashcombe and Coram by friends at each place, who had like them gone through the dancing stage of life some five and twenty years before, but who liked still to haunt the scenes of their former enjoyment, and see a younger generation dance on, regardless of their doom. They had come in one of the two sedan-chairs that yet lingered in use at Hollingford. Such a night as this brought a regular harvest of gains to the two old men, who, in what was called the town's livery, trotted backwards and forwards with their many loads of ladies and finery. There were some post-chaises and some flies, but after mature deliberation Miss Browning had decided to keep to the more comfortable custom of the sedan-chair. Which, as she said to Miss Piper, one of her visitors, came into the parlour and got full of the warm air and nipped you up and carried you tight and cosy into another warm room where you could go walk out without having to show your legs by going up steps or down steps. Of course, only one could go at a time, but here again a little of Miss Browning's good management arranged everything so very nicely, as Miss Hornblower, their other visitor, remarked. She went first, and remained in the warm cloak-room until her hostess followed and then the two ladies went arm in arm into the ballroom, finding out convenient seats whence they could watch the arrivals and speak to their passing friends, until Miss Phoebe and Miss Piper entered, and came to take possession of the seats reserved for them by Miss Browning's care. These two younger ladies came in also arm in arm, but with a certain timid flurry in look and movement very different from the composed dignity of their seniors, by two or three years. When all four were once more assembled together, they took a breath and began to converse. "'Upon my word, I really do think this is a better room than our Ashcombe Courthouse. "'And how prettily it is decorated!' piped out Miss Piper. "'How well the roses are made! But you all have such taste at Hollingford!' "'There's Mrs. Dempster!' cried Miss Hornblower. "'She said she and her two daughters were asked to stay at Mr. Sheepshanks.' Mr. Preston was to be there, too, but I suppose they could not all come at once. Look, and there is young Roscoe, our new doctor. I declare it seems as if all Ashcombe were here. Mr. Roscoe! Mr. Roscoe! Come here and let me introduce you to Miss Browning, the friend we are staying with. We think very highly of our young doctor, I can assure you, Miss Browning." Mr. Roscoe bowed and simpered at hearing his own praises. But Miss Browning had no notion of having any doctor praised, who had come to settle on the very verge of Mr. Gibson's practice, so she said to Miss Hornblower, "'You must be very glad, I am sure, to have somebody you can call in, if you are in any sudden hurry, or for things that are too trifling to trouble Mr. Gibson about, and I should think Mr. Roscoe would feel it a great advantage to profit, as he will naturally have the opportunity of doing, by witnessing Mr. Gibson's skill.' Probably Mr. Roscoe would have felt more aggrieved by this speech than he really was, if his attention had not been called off just then by the entrance of the very Mr. Gibson who was being spoken of. Almost before Miss Browning had ended her severe and depreciatory remarks, he had asked his friend, Miss Hornblower, "'Who is that lovely girl in pink just come in?' "'Why, that's Cynthia Kirkpatrick,' 
said Miss Hornblower, taking up a ponderous gold eyeglass to make sure of her fact. "'How she has grown! To be sure, it is two or three years since she left Ashcombe. She was very pretty then. People did say Mr. Preston admired her very much, but she was so young.' "'Can you introduce me?' asked the impatient young surgeon. "'I should like to ask her to dance.' When Miss Hornblower returned from greeting to her former acquaintance, Mrs. Gibson, and had accomplished the introduction which Mr. Watsco had requested, she began her little confidences to Miss Browning. "'Well, to be sure! How condescending we are! I remember the time when Mrs. Kirkpatrick wore old black silks, and was thankful and civil as became her place as a schoolmistress, and as having to earn her bread. And now she is in satin, and she speaks to me as if she could just recollect who I was, if she tried very hard. It isn't so long ago since Mrs. Dempster came to consult me as to whether Mrs. Kirkpatrick would be offended if she sent her a new breadth for her lilac silk gown, in place of one that had been spoilt by Mrs. Dempster's servant spilling the coffee over it the night before. And she took it and was thankful, for all she's dressed in pearl grey satin now, and she would have been glad enough to marry Mr. Preston in those days. "'I thought you said he admired her daughter,' put in Miss Browning to her irritated friend. "'Well, perhaps I did, and perhaps it was so. I'm sure I can't tell. He was a great deal at the house. Miss Dixon keeps a school in the same house now, and I'm sure she does it a great deal better.' "'The Earl and the Countess are very fond of Mrs. Gibson,' said Miss Browning. "'I know, for Lady Harriet told us when she came to drink tea with us last autumn, and they desired Mr. Preston to be very attentive to her when she lived at Ashcombe. "'For goodness sake, don't go and repeat what I have been saying about Mr. Preston and Mrs. Kirkpatrick to her ladyship. One may be mistaken, and you know I only said people talked about it.' Miss Hornblower was evidently alarmed lest her gossip should be repeated to Lady Harriet, who appeared to be on such an intimate footing with her Hollingford friends. Nor did Miss Browning dissipate the illusion. Lady Harriet had drunk tea with them, and might do it again, and at any rate the little fright she had put her friend into was not a bad return for that praise of Mr. Roscoe, which had offended Miss Browning's loyalty to Mr. Gibson. Meanwhile Miss Piper and Miss Phoebe, who had not the character of Esprit Four to maintain, talked of the dresses of the people present, beginning by complimenting each other. "'What a lovely turban you have got on, Miss Piper, if I may be allowed to say so, so becoming to your complexion.' "'Do you think so?' said Miss Piper, with ill-concealed gratification. It was something to have a complexion at forty-five. "'I got it at Brown's at Summerton for this very ball. I thought I must have something to set off my gown, which isn't quite so new as it once was, and I have no handsome jewellery like you.' looking with admiring eyes at a large miniature set round with pearls, which served as a shield to Miss Phoebe's breast. "'It is handsome,' that lady replied. "'It is a likeness of my dear mother. Dorothy has got my father on. The miniatures were both taken at the same time, and just about then my uncle died and left us each a legacy of fifty pounds, which we agreed to spend on the setting of our miniatures. But because they are so valuable, Dorothy always keeps them locked up with the best silver, and hides the box somewhere.' She never will tell me where, because she says I've such weak nerves, and that if a burglar with a loaded pistol at my head were to ask me where we kept our plate and jewels, I should be sure to tell him. And she says, for her part, she would never think of revealing under any circumstances. I'm sure I hope she won't be tried. But that's the reason I don't wear it often. It's only the second time I've had it on, and I can't even get at it and look at it, which I should like to do. I shouldn't have had it on to-night, but that Dorothy gave it out to me, saying it was but a proper compliment to pay to the Duchess of Menteith, who is to be here in all her diamonds. "'Dear! Ah, oh, me! Is she really? Do you know, I never saw a Duchess before!' And Miss Piper drew herself up and craned her neck, as if resolved to behave herself properly, as she had been taught to do at boarding-school thirty years before, in the presence of her grace. By and by she said to Miss Phoebe, with a sudden jerk out of position. "'Look, look, that's our Mr. Cholmley, the magistrate!' He was the great man of Coram. "'And that's Mrs. Cholmley in red satin, and Mr. George and Mr. Harry from Oxford, I do declare, and Miss Cholmley and pretty Miss Sophie. I should like to go and speak to them, but then it's so formidable crossing a room without a gentleman. And there is Cox, the butcher, and his wife. Why, all Coram seems to be here. And how Mrs. Cox can afford such a gown I can't make out for one for I know Cox has had some difficulty in paying for the last sheep he bought of my brother. 
Just at this moment the band, consisting of two violins, a harp, and an occasional clarinet, having finished their tuning, and brought themselves as nearly into accord as was possible, struck up a brisk country dance, and partners quickly took their places. Mrs. Gibson was secretly a little annoyed at Cynthia's being one of those to stand up in this early dance, the performers in which were principally the punctual plebeians of Hollingford, who, when a ball was fixed to begin at eight, had no notion of being later, and so losing part of the amusement for which they had paid their money. She imparted some of her feelings to Molly, sitting by her, longing to dance, and beating time to the spirited music with one of her pretty little feet. "'Your dear papa is always so very punctual. To-night it seems almost a pity, for we really are here before there is any one come that we know.' "'Oh, I see so many people here that I know. There are Mr. and Mrs. Smeaton, and that nice good-tempered daughter. Oh, booksellers and butchers, if you will. Papa has found a great many friends to talk to. Patience, my dear, hardly friends. There are some nice-looking people here,' catching her eye on the Cholmleys. "'But I dare say they have driven over from the neighbourhood of Ashcombe or Coram, and have hardly calculated how soon they would get here. I wonder when the Towers' party will come.' "'Ah, there's Mr. Ashton and Mr. Preston. Come, the room is beginning to fill.' So it was, for this was to be a very good ball, people said, and a large party from the Towers was coming, and a duchess in diamonds among the number. Every great house in the district was expected to be full of guests on these occasions, but at this early hour the townspeople had the floor almost entirely to themselves. The county magnates came dropping in later, and chiefest among them all was the Lord Lieutenant from the Towers. But to-night they were unusually late, and the aristocratic ozone being absent from the atmosphere, there was a flatness about the dancing of all those who considered themselves above the plebeian ranks of the tradespeople. They, however, enjoyed themselves thoroughly, and sprang and bounded till their eyes sparkled and their cheeks glowed with exercise and excitement. Some of the more prudent parents, mindful of the next day's duties, began to consider at what hour they ought to go home, but with all there was an expressed or unexpressed curiosity to see the Duchess and her diamonds, for the Menteith diamonds were famous in higher circles than that now assembled, and their fame had trickled down to it through the medium of ladies' maids and housekeepers. Mr. Gibson had had to leave the ballroom for a time, as he had anticipated, but he was to return to his wife as soon as his duties were accomplished, and in his absence, Mrs. Gibson kept herself a little aloof from the Miss Brownings and those of her acquaintance who would willingly have entered into conversation with her, with the view of attaching herself to the skirts of the Towers party when they should make their appearance. If Cynthia would not be so very ready in engaging herself to every possible partner who asked her to dance, there were sure to be young men staying at the Towers who would be on the lookout for pretty girls, and who could tell to what a dance might lead? Molly, too, though not so good a dancer as Cynthia, and, from her timidity, less graceful and easy, was becoming engaged pretty deeply, and it must be confessed, she was longing to dance every dance, no matter with whom. Even she might not be available for the more aristocratic partners Mrs. Gibson anticipated. She was feeling very much annoyed with the whole proceedings of the evening, when she was aware of some one standing by her, and turning a little to one side, she saw Mr. Preston keeping guard, as it were, over the seats which Molly and Cynthia had just quitted. He was looking so black that if their eyes had not met, Mrs. Gibson would have preferred not speaking to him. As it was, she thought it unavoidable. "'The rooms are not well lighted to-night, are they, Mr. Preston?' "'No,' said he. "'But who could light such dingy old paint as this, loaded with evergreens, too, which always darken a room? And the company, too. I always think that freshness and brilliancy of dress go as far as anything to brighten up a room. Look what a set of people are here. The greater part of the women are dressed in dark silks, really only fit for a morning. The place will be quite different by and by, when the county families are in a little more force." Mr. Preston made no reply. He had put his glass in his eye, apparently for the purpose of watching the dancers. If its exact direction could have been ascertained, it would have been found that he was looking intently and angrily at a flying figure in pink muslin. Many a one was gazing at Cynthia with intentness besides himself, but no one in anger. Mrs. Gibson was not so fine an observer as to read all this, but here was a gentlemanly and handsome young man to whom she could prattle, instead of either joining herself on to objectionable people, or sitting all forlorn until the Towers' party came. 
So she went on with her small remarks. "'You are not dancing, Mr. Preston?' "'No. The partner I had engaged has made some mistake. I am waiting to have an explanation with her.' Mrs. Gibson was silent. An uncomfortable tide of recollections appeared to come over her. She, like Mr. Preston, watched Cynthia. The dance was ended, and she was walking round the room in easy unconcern as to what might await her. Presently her partner, Mr. Harry Cholmley, brought her back to her seat. She took that vacant next to Mr. Preston, leaving the one by her mother for Molly's occupation. The latter returned a moment afterwards to her place. Cynthia seemed entirely unconscious of Mr. Preston's neighbourhood. Mrs. Gibson leaned forwards and said to her daughter, "'Your last partner was a gentleman, my dear. You are improving in your selection. I really was ashamed of you before, figuring away with that attorney's clerk. Molly, do you know who you have been dancing with? I have found out he is the Coram bookseller.' "'That accounts for his being so well up in all the books I have been wanting to hear about,' said Molly eagerly, but with a little spice of malice in her mind. "'He really was very pleasant, mamma," she added, "'and he looks quite a gentleman, and dances beautifully.' "'Very well. But remember, if you go on this way, you will have to shake hands over the counter to-morrow morning with some of your partners of to-night,' said Mrs. Gibson coldly. "'But I really don't know how to refuse when people are introduced to me and ask me, and I am longing to dance. You know to-night is a charity ball, and Papa said everybody danced with everybody,' said Molly, in a pleading tone of voice, for she could not quite thoroughly enjoy herself if she was out of harmony with any one. What reply Mrs. Gibson would have made to this speech cannot now be ascertained, for before she could answer, Mr. Preston stepped a little forwards, and said, in a tone which he meant to be icily indifferent, but which trembled with anger, "'If Miss Gibson finds any difficulty in refusing a partner, she has only to apply to Miss Kirkpatrick for instructions.' Cynthia lifted up her beautiful eyes, and fixing them on Mr. Preston's face, said very quietly, as if only stating a matter of fact, "'You forget, I think, Mr. Preston. Miss Gibson implied that she wished to dance with the person who asked her. That makes all the difference. I can't instruct her how to act in that difficulty.' And to the rest of this little conversation Cynthia appeared to lend no ear, and she was almost directly claimed by her next partner. Mr. Preston took the seat now left empty much to Molly's annoyance. At first she feared lest he might be going to ask her to dance but instead he put out his hand for Cynthia's nosegay, which she had left on rising, entrusted to Molly. It had suffered considerably from the heat of the room, and was no longer full and fresh, not so much so as Molly's, which had not, in the first instance, been pulled to pieces in picking out the scarlet flowers which now adorned Molly's hair, and which had been since cherished with more care. Enough, however, remained of Cynthia's to show very distinctly that it was not the one Mr. Preston had sent and it was perhaps to convince himself of this that he rudely asked to examine it. But Molly, faithful to what she imagined would be Cynthia's wish, refused to allow him to touch it. She only held it a little nearer. "'Miss Kirkpatrick has not done me the honour of wearing the bouquet I sent her. I see. She received it, I suppose, and my note.' "'Yes,' said Molly, rather intimidated by the tone in which this was said. "'But we had already accepted these two nosegays.' Mrs. Gibson was just the person to come to the rescue with her honeyed words on such an occasion as the present. She evidently was rather afraid of Mr. Preston, and wished to keep at peace with him. "'Oh, yes, we were so sorry. Of course I don't mean to say we should be sorry for any one's kindness, but two such lovely nosegays had been sent from Hamley Hall. You may see how beautiful from what Molly holds in her hand, and they had come before yours, Mr. Preston.' I should have felt honoured if you had accepted of mine, since the young ladies were so well provided for. I was at some pains in selecting the flowers at Green's. I think I may say it was rather more recherché than that of Miss Kirkpatrick's, which Miss Gibson holds so tenderly and securely in her hand." "'Oh, because Cynthia would take out the most effective flowers to put in my hair!' exclaimed Molly eagerly. "'Did she?' said Mr. Preston, with a certain accent of pleasure in his voice, as though he were glad she set so little store by the nosegay, and he walked off to stand behind Cynthia in the quadrille that was being danced, and Molly saw him making her reply to him, against her will, Molly was sure. But somehow his face and manner implied power over her. She looked grave, deaf, indifferent, indignant, defiant, 
but after a half-whispered speech to Cynthia at the conclusion of the dance, she evidently threw him an impatient consent to what he was asking, for he walked off with a disagreeable smile of satisfaction on his handsome face. All this time the murmurs were spreading at the lateness of the party from the towers, and person after person came up to Mrs. Gibson, as if she were the accredited authority as to the Earl and Countess's plans. In one sense this was flattering, but then the acknowledgment of common ignorance and wonder reduced her to the level of the inquirers. Mrs. Goodenough felt herself particularly aggrieved. She had had her spectacles on for the last hour and a half in order to be ready for the sight the very first minute any one from the towers appeared at the door. "'I had a headache,' she complained, "'and I should have sent my money and never stirred out of doors to-night, for I've seen many of these here balls, and my lord and my lady too, when they were better worth looking at nor than they are now but every one was talking of the Duchess, and the Duchess and her diamonds, and I thought I shouldn't like to be behind hand, and never have seen neither the Duchess nor her diamonds, so I'm here, and coal and candlelight wasting away at home, for I told Sally to sit up for me, and above everything I cannot abide waste. I took it from my mother, who was such a one against waste as you never see nowadays. She was a manager if ever there was one, and brought up nine children on less than any one else could do, I'll be bound. Why, she wouldn't let us be extravagant, not even in the matter of colds. Whenever any on us had a pretty bad cold, she took the opportunity and cut our hair. For, she said, said she, it was of no use having two colds when one would do, and cutting of our hair was sure to give us a cold. But for all that, I wish the Duchess would come." "'Ah, but fancy what it is to me,' sighed out Mrs. Gibson. "'So long as I have been without seeing the dear family, and seeing so little of them the other day when I was at the Towers for the Duchess would have my opinion on Lady Alice's trousseau, and kept asking me so many questions it took up all the time, and Lady Harriet's last words were a happy anticipation of our meeting to-night. It's nearly twelve o'clock." Every one of any pretensions to gentility was painfully affected by the absence of the family from the Towers. The very fiddlers seemed unwilling to begin playing a dance that might be interrupted by the entrance of the great folks. Miss Phoebe Browning had apologized for them. Miss Browning had blamed them with calm dignity. It was only the butchers and bakers and candlestick-makers who rather enjoyed the absence of restraint, and were happy and hilarious. At last there was a rumbling and a rushing and a whispering, and the music stopped. So the dancers were obliged to do so too, and in came Lord Cumnor in his state dress, with a fat, middle-aged woman on his arm. She was dressed almost like a girl, in a sprigged muslin, with natural flowers in her hair, but not a vestige of a jewel or a diamond. Yet it must be the Duchess. But what was a Duchess without diamonds? And in a dress which Farmer Hudson's daughter might have worn. Was it the Duchess? Could it be the Duchess? The little crowd of inquirers around Mrs. Gibson thickened, to hear her confirm their disappointing surmise. After the Duchess came Lady Cumnor, looking like Lady Macbeth in black velvet, a cloud upon her brow, made more conspicuous by the lines of age rapidly gathering on her handsome face. And Lady Harriet and other ladies, amongst whom there was one dressed so like the Duchess as to suggest the idea of a sister rather than a daughter, as far as dress went. There was Lord Hollingford, plain in face, awkward in person, gentlemanly in manner, and half a dozen younger men, Lord Albert Monson, Captain James, and others of their age and standing, who came in looking anything if not critical. This long-expected party swept up to the seats reserved for them at the head of the room, apparently regardless of the interruption they caused, for the dancers stood aside, and almost dispersed back to their seats, and when Money Musk struck up again, not half the former set of people stood up to finish the dance. Lady Harriet, who was rather different to Miss Piper, and no more minded crossing the room alone than if the lookers-on were so many cabbages, spied the Gibson party pretty quickly out, and came across to them. "'Here we are at last. How do you do, dear? Why, little one?' to Molly. "'How nice you're looking! Aren't we shamefully late?' "'Oh, it's only just past twelve, said Mrs. Gibson, "'and I dare say you dine very late.' "'It wasn't that. It was that ill-mannered woman who went to her own room after we came out from dinner, and she and Lady Alice stayed there invisible, till we thought they were putting on some splendid attire, as they ought to have done, and at half-past ten, when Mamma sent up to them to say the carriages were at the door, the Duchess sent down for some beef-tea, and at last appeared à l'enfant, as you see her. Mamma is so angry with her, and some of the others are annoyed at not coming earlier, 
and one or two are giving themselves airs about coming at all. Papa is the only one who is not affected by it." Then, turning to Molly, Lady Harriet asked, "'Have you been dancing much, Miss Gibson?' "'Yes, not every dance, but nearly all.' It was a simple question enough, but Lady Harriet's speaking at all to Molly had become to Mrs. Gibson almost like shaking a red rag at a bull. It was the one thing sure to put her out of temper. But she would not have shown this to Lady Harriet for the world, only she contrived to baffle any endeavours at further conversation between the two by placing herself betwixt Lady Harriet and Molly, whom the former asked to sit down in the absent Cynthia's room. "'I won't go back to those people. I am so mad with them. And besides, I hardly saw you the other day, and I must have some gossip with you.' So she sat down by Mrs. Gibson, and, as Mrs. Goodenough afterwards expressed it, looked like anybody else. Mrs. Goodenough said this to excuse herself for a little misadventure she fell into. She had taken a deliberate survey of the grandees at the upper end of the room, spectacles on nose, and had inquired, in no very measured voice, who everybody was, from Mr. Sheepshanks, my lord's agent, and her very good neighbour, who in vain tried to check her loud ardour for information by replying to her in whispers. But she was rather deaf as well as blind, so his low tones only brought upon him fresh inquiries. Now satisfied as far as she could be, and on her way to departure, and the extinguishing of fire and candlelight, she stopped opposite to Mrs. Gibson, and thus addressed her by way of renewal of their former subject of conversation. "'Such a shabby thing for a duchess I never saw! Not a bit of a diamond near her! They're none of em worth looking at except the countess, and she's always a personable woman, and not so lusty as she was. But they're not worth waiting up for till this time o' night." There was a moment's pause. Then Lady Harriet put her hand out and said, "'You don't remember me, but I know you from having seen you at the Towers. Lady Cumnor is a good deal thinner than she was, but we hope her health is better for it.' "'It's Lady Harriet,' said Mrs. Gibson to Mrs. Goodenough, in reproachful dismay. "'Dear me, your ladyship! I hope I've given no offence. But you see, that is to say, your ladyship sees, that it's late hours for such folks as me, and I only stayed out of my bed to see the Duchess, and I thought she'd come in diamonds and a coronet, and it puts one out at my age to be so disappointed in the only chance I'm like to have of so fine a sight." "'I'm put out, too,' said Lady Harriet. "'I wanted to have come early, and here we are as late as this. I'm so cross and ill-tempered, I should be glad to hide myself in bed as soon as you will do.' She said this so sweetly that Mrs. Goodenough relaxed into a smile, and her crabbedness into a compliment. "'I don't believe as ever your ladyship can be cross and ill-tempered with that pretty face. I'm an old woman, so you must let me say so.' Lady Harriet stood up and made a low curtsey. Then holding out her hand, she said, "'I won't keep you up any longer, but I'll promise one thing in return for your pretty speech. If ever I am a duchess, I'll come and show myself to you in all my robes and jewjaws. Good night, madam.' There, I knew how it would be," said she, not resuming her seat, and on the eve of a county election, too. Oh, you must not take old Mrs. Goodenough as a specimen, dear Lady Harriet. She is always a grumbler. I am sure no one else would complain of your being as late as you liked," said Mrs. Gibson. What do you say, Molly? said Lady Harriet, turning suddenly her eyes on Molly's face. Don't you think we've lost some of our popularity, which at this time means votes? by coming so late. Come, answer me. You used to be a famous little truth-teller." "'I don't know about popularity or votes,' said Molly, rather unwillingly. "'But I think many people were sorry you did not come sooner. And isn't that rather a proof of popularity?' she added. "'That's a very neat and diplomatic answer,' said Lady Harriet, smiling, and tapping Molly's cheek with her fan. "'Molly knows nothing about it said Mrs. Gibson, a little off her guard. It would be very impertinent if she or any one else questioned Lady Cumnor's perfect right to come when she chose. Well, all I know is, I must go back to Mamma now, but I shall make another raid into these regions by and by, and you must keep a place for me. Ah, there are Miss Brownings. You see, I don't forget my lesson, Miss Gibson." "'Molly, I cannot have you speaking so to Lady Harriet,' said Mrs. Gibson, as soon as she was left alone with her stepdaughter. You would never have known her at all if it had not been for me, and don't always be putting yourself into our conversation." "'But I must speak if she asks me questions,' pleaded Molly. "'Well, if you must, you must, I acknowledge. I'm candid about that at any rate. 
but there's no need for you to set up to have an opinion at your age. I don't know how to help it, said Molly. She's such a whimsical person. Look there, if she's not talking to Miss Phoebe, and Miss Phoebe is so weak she'll easily be led away into fancying she is hand and glove with Lady Harriet. If there is one thing I hate more than another, it is the trying to make out an intimacy with great people." Molly felt innocent enough, so she offered no justification of herself, and made no reply. Indeed, she was more occupied in watching Cynthia. She could not understand the change that seemed to have come over her. She was dancing, it was true, with the same lightness and grace as before, but the smooth bounding motion, as of a feather blown onwards by the wind, was gone. She was conversing with her partner, but without the soft animation that usually shone out upon her countenance. And when she was brought back to her seat, Molly noticed her changed colour, and her dreamily abstracted eyes. "'What is the matter, Cynthia?' asked she, in a very low voice. "'Nothing,' said Cynthia, suddenly looking up, and in an accent of what in her was sharpness. "'Why should there be?' "'I don't know. But you look different to what you did. Tired or something. There's nothing the matter. Or if it is, don't talk about it. It's all your fancy." This was a rather contradictory speech, to be interpreted by intuition rather than by logic. Molly understood that Cynthia wished for quietness and silence. But what was her surprise, after the speeches that had passed before, and the implication of Cynthia's whole manner to Mr. Preston, to see him come up to her, and without a word, offer his arm and lead her away to dance. It appeared to strike Mrs. Gibson as something remarkable, for forgetting her late passage at arms with Molly, she asked wonderingly, as if almost distrusting the evidence of her senses, "'Is Cynthia going to dance with Mr. Preston?' Molly had scarcely time to answer, before she herself was led off by her partner. She could hardly attend to him, or to the figures of the quadrille for watching for Cynthia among the moving forms. Once she caught a glimpse of her standing still, downcast, listening to Mr. Preston's eager speech. Again she was walking languidly among the dancers, almost as if she took no notice of those around her. When she and Molly joined each other again, the shade on Cynthia's face had deepened to gloom. But at the same time, if a physiognomist had studied her expression, he would have read in it defiance and anger, and perhaps also a little perplexity. While this quadrille had been going on, Lady Harriet had been speaking to her brother. "'Hollingford,' she said, laying her hand on his arm, and drawing him a little apart from the well-born crowd amid which he stood, silent and abstracted, "'you don't know how these good people here have been hurt and disappointed with our being so late, and with the Duchess's ridiculous simplicity of dress.' "'Why should they mind it?' asked he, taking advantage of her being out of breath with eagerness. "'Oh, don't be so wise and stupid! Don't you see? We're a show and a spectacle. It's like having a pantomime with harlequin and columbine and plain clothes.' "'I don't understand how,' he began. "'Then take it upon trust. They really are a little disappointed, whether they are logical or not in being so, and we must try and make it up to them for one thing, because I can't bear our vassals to look dissatisfied and disloyal, and then there's the election in June." "'I really would as soon be out of the house as in it.' "'Nonsense! It would grieve papa beyond measure. But there's no time to talk about that now. You must go and dance with some of the townspeople, and I'll ask Sheepshanks to introduce me to a respectable young farmer. Can't you get Captain James to make himself useful? There he goes with Lady Alice if I don't get him introduced to the ugliest tailor's daughter I can find for the next dance." She put her arm in her brother's as she spoke, as if to lead him to some partner. He resisted, however, resisted piteously. "'Pray don't, Harriet. You know I can't dance. I hate it. I always did. I don't know how to get through a quadrille." "'It's a country dance,' said she resolutely. "'It's all the same. And what shall I say to my partner? I haven't a notion. I shall have no subject in common. Speak of being disappointed. They'll be ten times more disappointed when they find I can neither dance nor talk." "'I'll be merciful. Don't be so cowardly. In their eyes a lord may dance like a bear, as some lords not very far from me are, if he likes, and they'll take it for grace. And you shall begin with Molly Gibson, your friend the doctor's daughter. She's a good, simple, intelligent little girl, 
which you'll think a great deal more of, I suppose, than of the frivolous fact of her being very pretty. Clare, will you allow me to introduce my brother to Miss Gibson? He hopes to engage her for this dance. Lord Hollingford, Miss Gibson." Poor Lord Hollingford! There was nothing for it but for him to follow his sister's very explicit lead, and Molly and he walked off to their places, each heartily wishing their dance together well over. Lady Harriet flew off to Mr. Sheepshanks to secure her respectable young farmer, and Mrs. Gibson remained alone, wishing that Lady Cumnor would send one of her attendant gentlemen for her. It would be so much more agreeable to be sitting even at the fag end of nobility than here on a bench with everybody, hoping that everybody would see Molly dancing away with a lord, yet vexed that the chance had so befallen that Molly instead of Cynthia was the young lady singled out, wondering if simplicity of dress was now become the highest fashion, and pondering on the possibility of cleverly inducing Lady Harriet to introduce Lord Albert Monson to her own beautiful daughter Cynthia. Molly found Lord Hollingford, the wise and learned Lord Hollingford, strangely stupid in understanding the mystery of cross hands and back again, down the middle and up again. He was constantly getting hold of the wrong hands, and as constantly stopping when he had returned to his place, quite unaware that the duties of society and the laws of the dance required that he should go on capering till he had arrived at the bottom of the room. He perceived that he had performed his part very badly, and apologized to Molly when once they had arrived at that haven of comparative peace, and he expressed his regret so simply and heartily that she felt at her ease with him at once, especially when he confided to her his reluctance at having to dance at all, and his only doing it under his sister's compulsion. To Molly he was an elderly widower, almost as old as her father, and by and by they got into very pleasant conversation. She learned from him that Roger Hamley had just been publishing a paper in some scientific periodical, which had excited considerable attention, as it was intended to confute some theory of a great French physiologist, and Roger's article proved the writer to be possessed of a most unusual amount of knowledge on the subject. This piece of news was of great interest to Molly, and in her questions she herself evinced so much intelligence, and a mind so well prepared for the reception of information, that Lord Hollingford at any rate would have felt his quest of popularity a very easy affair indeed, if he might have gone on talking quietly to Molly during the rest of the evening. When he took her back to her place, he found Mr. Gibson there and fell into talk with him, until Lady Harriet once more came to him to stir him up to his duties. Before very long, however, he returned to Mr. Gibson's side, and began telling him of this paper of Roger Hamley's, of which Mr. Gibson had not yet heard. In the midst of their conversation, as they stood close by Mrs. Gibson, Lord Hollingford saw Molly in the distance, and interrupted himself to say, "'What a charming little lady that daughter of yours is! Most girls of her age are so difficult to talk to. But she is intelligent and full of interest in all sorts of sensible things. Well read, too. She was up in La Reina Animal, and very pretty.' Mr. Gibson bowed, much pleased at such a compliment from such a man, were he lord or not. It is very likely that if Molly had been a stupid listener, Lord Hollingford would not have discovered her beauty, or the converse might be asserted, if she had not been young and pretty, he would not have exerted himself to talk on scientific subjects in a manner which she could understand. But in whatever way Molly had won his approbation and admiration, there was no doubt that she had earned it somehow. And when she next returned to her place, Mrs. Gibson greeted her with soft words and a gracious smile for it does not require much reasoning power to discover, that if it is a very fine thing to be mother-in-law to a very magnificent three-tailed Bashaw, it presupposes that the wife who makes the connection between the two parties is in harmony with her mother. And so far had Mrs. Gibson's thoughts wandered into futurity. She only wished that the happy chance had fallen to Cynthia's instead of to Molly's lot. But Molly was a docile, sweet creature, very pretty and remarkably intelligent, as my lord had said. It was a pity that Cynthia preferred making millinery to reading, but perhaps that could be rectified. And there was Lord Cumnor coming to speak to her, and Lady Cumnor nodding to her, and indicating a place by her side. It was not an unsatisfactory ball upon the whole to Mrs. Gibson although she paid the usual penalty for sitting up beyond her ordinary hour in perpetual glare and movement. The next morning she awoke irritable and fatigued, and a little of the same feeling oppressed both Cynthia and Molly. The former was lounging in the window-seat, holding a three-days-old newspaper in her hand, 
which she was making a pretense of reading, when she was startled by her mother's saying, "'Cynthia, can't you take up a book and improve yourself? I am sure your conversation will never be worth listening to unless you read something better than newspapers. Why don't you keep up your French? There was some French book that Molly was reading. Le Regne Animal, I think." "'No, I never read it,' said Molly, blushing. Mr. Roger Hamley sometimes read pieces out of it when I was first at the hall, and told me what it was about." "'Oh! Well, then I suppose I was mistaken. But it comes to all the same thing. Cynthia, you really must learn to settle yourself to some improving reading every morning." Rather to Molly's surprise, Cynthia did not reply a word, but dutifully went and brought down from among her Boulogne school-books Le siècle de Louis XIV. But after a while Molly saw that this improving reading was just as much an excuse for Cynthia's thinking her own thoughts as the newspaper had been. End of chapter 26「Chapter Twenty Seven, Fathers and Sons Things were not going on any better at Hamley Hall. Nothing had occurred to change the state of dissatisfied feeling into which the squire and his eldest son had respectively fallen, and the long continuance merely of dissatisfaction is sure of itself to deepen the feeling. Roger did all in his power to bring the father and son together, but sometimes wondered if it would not have been better to leave them alone for they were falling into the habit of each making him their confidant, and so defining emotions and opinions which would have had less distinctness if they had been unexpressed. There was little enough relief in the daily life at the hall to help them all to shake off the gloom, and it even told on the health of both the squire and Osborne. The squire became thinner, his skin as well as his clothes began to hang loose about him, and the freshness of his colour turned to red streaks till his cheeks looked like Eardiston Pippins, instead of resembling a Catherine Pear on the side that's next to the sun. Roger thought that his father sat indoors and smoked in his study more than was good for him, but it had become difficult to get him far afield. He was too much afraid of coming across some sign of the discontinued drainage works, or being irritated afresh by the side of his depreciated timber. Osborne was wrapped up in the idea of arranging his poems for the press and so working out his wish for independence. What with daily writing to his wife, taking his letters himself to a distant post-office and receiving hers there, touching up his sonnets, etc., with fastidious care, and occasionally giving himself the pleasure of a visit to the Gibsons, and enjoying the society of the two pleasant girls there, he found little time for being with his father. Indeed, Osborne was too self-indulgent, or sensitive, as he termed it, to bear well with the squire's gloomy fits, or too frequent querulousness. The consciousness of his secret, too, made Osborne uncomfortable in his father's presence. It was very well for all parties if Roger was not sensitive, for if he had been, there were times when it would have been too hard to bear little spurts of domestic tyranny by which his father strove to assert his power over both his sons. One of these occurred very soon after the night of the Hollingford charity ball. Roger had induced his father to come out with him, and the squire had, on his son's suggestion, taken with him his long unused spud. The two had wandered far afield, perhaps the elder man had found the unwonted length of exercise too much for him, for as he approached the house on his return he became what nurses call in children fractious, and ready to turn on his companion for every remark he made. Roger understood the case by instinct, as it were, and bore it all with his usual sweetness of temper. They entered the house by the front door. It lay straight on their line of march. On the old cracked yellow marble slab there lay a card with Lord Hollingford's name on it, which Robinson, evidently on the watch for their return, hastened out of his pantry to deliver to Roger. "'His lordship was very sorry not to see you, Mr. Roger, and his lordship left a note for you. Mr. Osborne took it, I think, when he passed through.' I asked his lordship if he would like to see Mr. Osborne, who was indoors, as I thought, but his lordship said he was pressed for time, and told me to make his excuses." "'Didn't he ask for me?' growled the squire. "'No, sir, I can't say as his lordship did. He would never have thought of Mr. Osborne, sir, if I hadn't named him. It was Mr. Roger he seemed so keen after." "'Very odd,' said the squire. Roger said nothing, although he naturally felt some curiosity. He went into the drawing-room, not quite aware that his father was following him. 
Osborne sat at a table near the fire, pen in hand, looking over one of his poems, and dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and now and then pausing over the alteration of a word. "'Oh, Roger,' he said as his brother came in, "'he has been Lord Hollingford wanting to see you.' "'I know,' replied Roger. "'And he's left a note for you. Robinson tried to persuade him it was for my father, so he's added a junior, Roger Hamney, Esquire, junior, in pencil. The squire was in the room by this time, and what he had overheard rubbed him up still more the wrong way. Roger took his unopened note and read it. "'What does he say?' asked the squire. Roger handed him the note. It contained an invitation to dinner to meet M. Geoffroy St. H., whose views on certain subjects Roger had been advocating in the article Lord Hollingford had spoken about to Molly when he danced with her at the Hollingford Ball. M. Geoffroy St. H. was in England now, and was expected to pay a visit at the Towers in the course of the following week. He had expressed a wish to meet the author of the paper which had already attracted the attention of the French comparative anatomists, and Lord Hollingford added a few words as to his own desire to make the acquaintance of a neighbour whose tastes were so similar to his own, and then followed a civil message from Lord and Lady Cumnor. Lord Hollingford's hand was cramped and rather illegible. The squire could not read it all at once, and was enough put out to decline any assistance in deciphering it. At last he made it out. "'So my Lord Lieutenant is taking some notice of the Hamleys at last. The election is coming on, is it? But I can tell him we're not to be got so easily. I suppose this trap is set for you, Osborne. What's this you've been writing that the French mound seer is so taken with?' "'It is not me, sir,' said Osborne. Both note and call are for Roger. "'I don't understand it,' said the squire. "'These Whig fellows have never done their duty by me, not that I want it of them. The Duke of Debenham used to pay the Hamleys a respect due to them, the oldest landowners in the county, but since he died and this shabby Whig lord has succeeded him, I have never dined at the Lord Lieutenant's, no, not once.' "'But I think, sir, I have heard you say Lord Cumnor used to invite you, only you did not choose to go,' said Roger. "'Yes, what do you mean by that? Do you suppose I was going to desert the principles of my family, and curry favour with the Whigs? No, leave that to them. They can ask the heir of the Hamleys fast enough when a county election is coming on.' "'I tell you, sir,' said Osborne, in the irritable tone he sometimes used when his father was particularly unreasonable, "'it is not me Lord Hollingford is inviting, it is Roger. Roger is making himself known for what he is, a first-rate fellow,' continued Osborne a sting of self-reproach mingling with his generous pride in his brother. And he's getting himself a name. He's been writing about these new French theories and discoveries, and his foreign savant naturally wants to make his acquaintance, and so Lord Hollingford asks him to dine. "'It's as clear as can be,' lowering his tone and addressing himself to Roger. "'It has nothing to do with politics, if my father would but see it.' Of course the squire heard this little aside with the unlucky uncertainty of hearing which is a characteristic of the beginning of deafness, and its effect on him was perceptible in the increased acrimony of his next speech. "'You young men think you know everything. I tell you it's a palpable Whig trick. And what business has Roger, if it is Roger the man wants, to go currying favour with the French? In my day we were content to hate him and to lick him.' But it's just like your conceit, Osborne, setting yourself up to say it's your younger brother they're asking, and not you. I tell you it's you. They think the eldest son was sure to be called after his father, Roger, Roger Hamley, Jr. It's as plain as a pikestaff. They know they can't catch me with chaff, but they've got up this French dodge. What business had you to go writing about the French, Roger? I should have thought you were too sensible to take any notice of their fancies and theories. But if it is you they've asked, I'll not have you going and meeting these foreigners at a Whig house. They ought to have asked Osborne. He's the representative of the Hamleys, if I'm not, and they can't get me, let him try ever so. Besides, Osborne has got a bit of the mound seer about him, which he caught with being so fond of going off to the continent, instead of coming back to his good old English home." He went on repeating much of what he had said before, till he left the room. Osborne had kept on replying to his unreasonable grumblings, which had only added to his anger, and as soon as the squire was fairly gone, Osborne turned to Roger and said, "'Of course you'll go, Roger. Ten to one he'll be in another mind to-morrow.' "'No,' said Roger, bluntly enough, for he was extremely disappointed. 
I won't run the chance of vexing him. I shall refuse." "'Don't be such a fool!' exclaimed Osborne. "'Really, my father is too unreasonable. You heard how he kept contradicting himself, and such a man as you to be kept under like a child by—' "'Don't let us talk any more about it, Osborne,' said Roger, writing away fast. When the note was written and sent off, he came and put his hand caressingly on Osborne's shoulder, as he sat pretending to read, but in reality vexed with both his father and his brother, though on very different grounds. "'How go the poems, old fellow? I hope they're nearly ready to bring out.' "'No, they're not. And if it weren't for the money I shouldn't care if they were never published. What's the use of fame if one mayn't reap the fruits of it?' "'Come now, we'll have no more of that. Let's talk about the money. I shall be going up for my fellowship examination next week, and then we'll have a person common, for they'll never think of not giving me a fellowship now I'm seeing your wrangler. I'm short enough myself at present, and I don't like to bother my father. But when I'm fellow you shall take me down to Winchester, and introduce me to the little wife." "'It'll be a month next Monday since I left her,' said Osborne, laying down his papers and gazing into the fire, as if by doing so he could call up her image. In her letter this morning she bids me give you such a pretty message. It won't bear translating into English. You must read it for yourself," continued he, pointing out a line or two in a letter he drew from his pocket. Roger suspected that one or two of the words were wrongly spelt, but their purport was so gentle and loving, and had such a touch of simple respectful gratitude in them, that he could not help being drawn afresh to the little unseen sister-in-law whose acquaintance Osborne had made by helping her to look for some missing article of the children's, whom she was taking for their daily walk in Hyde Park. For Mrs. Osborne Hamley had been nothing more than a French bonne, very pretty, very graceful, and very much tyrannized over by the rough little boys and girls she had in charge. She was a little orphan girl, who had charmed the heads of a travelling English family, as she had brought Madame some articles of lingerie at an hotel, and she had been hastily engaged by them as bonne to their children, partly as a pet and plaything herself, partly because it would be so good for the children to learn French from a native of Alsace. By and by her mistress ceased to take any particular notice of M.A. in the bustle of London and London gaiety, but, though feeling more and more forlorn in a strange land every day, the French girl strove hard to do her duty. One touch of kindness, however, was enough to set the fountain gushing and she and Osborne naturally fell into an ideal state of love, to be rudely disturbed by the indignation of the mother, when accident discovered to her the attachment existing between her children's bun and a young man of an entirely different class. M. A. answered truly to all her mistress's questions, but no worldly wisdom, nor any lesson to be learnt from another's experience, could in the least disturb her entire faith in her lover. Perhaps Mrs. Townsend did no more than her duty in immediately sending M. A. back to Metz, where she had first met with her, and where such relations as remained to the girl might be supposed to be residing. But altogether she knew so little of the kind of people or life to which she was consigning her deposed protégé, that Osborne, after listening with impatient indignation to the lecture which Mrs. Townsend gave him when he insisted on seeing her in order to learn what had become of his love, that the young man set off straight for Metz in hot haste and did not let the grass grow under his feet until he had made M. A. his wife. All this had occurred the previous autumn, and Roger did not know of the step his brother had taken until it was irrevocable. Then came the mother's death, which, besides the simplicity of its own overwhelming sorrow, brought with it the loss of the kind, tender mediatrix who could always soften and turn his father's heart. It is doubtful, however, if even she could have succeeded in this for the squire looked high and over high for the wife of his heir. He detested all foreigners, and overmore held all Roman Catholics in dread and abomination something akin to our ancestors' hatred of witchcraft. All these prejudices were strengthened by his grief. Argument would always have glanced harmless away off his shield of utter unreason, but a loving impulse, in a happy moment, might have softened his heart to what he most detested in the former days. But the happy moments came not now and the loving impulses were trodden down by the bitterness of his frequent remorse, not less than by his growing irritability, so M. A. lived solitary in a little cottage near Winchester in which Osborne had installed her when she first came to England as his wife, and in the dainty furnishing of which he had run himself so deeply into debt. For Osborne consulted his own fastidious taste in his purchases, rather than her simple childlike wishes and wants, 
and looked upon the little Frenchwoman rather as the future mistress of Hamley Hall than as the wife of a man who was wholly dependent on others at present. He had chosen a southern county as being far removed from those midland shires where the name of Hamley of Hamley was well and widely known, for he did not wish his wife to assume, if only for a time, a name which was not justly and legally her own. In all these arrangements he had willingly striven to do his full duty by her, and she repaid him with passionate devotion and admiring reverence. If his vanity had met with a check, or his worthy desires for college honours had been disappointed, he knew where to go for a comforter, one who poured out praise till her words were choked in her throat by the rapidity of her thoughts, and who poured out the small vials of her indignation on every one who did not acknowledge and bow down to her husband's merits. If she ever wished to go to the chateau, that was his home, and be introduced to his family, Aimée never hinted a word of it to him. Only she did yearn, and she did plead, for a little more of her husband's company, and the good reasons which had convinced her of the necessity of his being so much away when he was present to urge them, failed in their efficacy when she tried to reproduce them to herself in his absence. The afternoon of the day on which Lord Hollingford called, Roger was going upstairs, three steps at a time, when at a turn of the landing he encountered his father. It was the first time he had seen him since their conversation about the tower's invitation to dinner. The squire stopped his son by standing right in the middle of the passage. "'Thou'rt going to meet the Mount Seer, my lad,' said he, half as affirmation, half as question. "'No, sir. I sent off James almost immediately with a note declining it. I don't care about it. That's to say, not to signify.' "'Why did you take me up so sharp, Roger?' said his father pettishly. "'You all take me up so hastily nowadays. I think it's hard when a man mustn't be allowed a bit of crossness when he's tired and heavy at heart, that I do. But, father, I should never like to go to a house where they had slighted you." "'Nay, nay, lad,' said the squire, brightening up a little. "'I think I slighted them. They asked me to dinner after my lord was made lieutenant, time after time, but I would never go near em. I call that my slighting them.' And no more was said at the time but the next day the squire again stopped Roger. "'I've been making Jem try on his livery-coat that he hasn't worn this three or four years. He's got too stout for it now.' "'Well, he needn't wear it, need he? And Morgan's lad will be glad enough of it. He's sadly in want of clothes.' "'Aye, aye, but who's to go with you when you call at the Towers? It's but polite to call after Lord Watts's name has taken the trouble to come here, and I shouldn't like you to go without a groom.' My dear father, I shouldn't know what to do with a man riding at my back. I can find my way to the stable-yard for myself, or there'll be some man about to take my horse. Don't trouble yourself about that." "'Well, you're not Osborne, to be sure. Perhaps it won't strike him as strange for you. But you must look up and hold your own, and remember you're one of the Hamleys, who've been on the same land for hundreds of years, while they're but trumpery Whig folk, who only came into the county in Queen Anne's time." End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 Rivalry For some days after the ball Cynthia seemed languid and was very silent. Molly, who had promised herself fully as much enjoyment in talking over the past gaiety with Cynthia as in the evening itself, was disappointed when she found that all conversation on the subject was rather evaded than encouraged. Mrs. Gibson, it is true, was ready to go over the ground as many times as any one liked, but her words were always like ready-made clothes, and never fitted individual thoughts. Anybody might have used them, and with the change of proper names they might have served to describe any ball. She repeatedly used the same language in speaking about it, till Molly knew the sentences and their sequence even to irritation. "'Ah, Mr. Osborne, you should have been there. I said to myself how many a time you really should have been there, you and your brother, of course. I thought of you very often during the evening." "'Did you? Now that I call very kind of you. Cynthia, darling, do you hear what Mr. Osborne Hamley was saying?' as Cynthia came into the room just then. "'He thought of us all on the evening of the ball.' "'He did better than merely remember us, then,' said Cynthia, with her soft, slow smile. We owe him thanks for those beautiful flowers, mamma." "'Oh,' said Osborne, "'you must not thank me exclusively. I believe it was my thought, but Roger took all the trouble of it." "'I consider the thought as everything,' said Mrs. Gibson. 
thought is spiritual, while action is merely material." This fine sentence took the speaker herself by surprise, and in such conversation as was then going on, it is not necessary to accurately define the meaning of everything that is said. "'I'm afraid the flowers were too late to be of much use, though,' continued Osborne. "'I met Preston the next morning, and of course we talked about the ball. I was sorry to find he had been beforehand with us.' "'He only sent one nosegay, and that was for Cynthia,' said Molly, looking up from her work. "'And it did not come till after we had received the flowers from Hamley.' Molly caught a sight of Cynthia's face before she bent down again to her sewing. It was scarlet in colour, and there was a flash of anger in her eyes. Both she and her mother hastened to speak as soon as Molly had finished, but Cynthia's voice was choked with passion, and Mrs. Gibson had the word. "'Mr. Preston's bouquet was just one of those formal affairs any one can buy at a nursery garden, which always strike me as having no sentiment in them. I would far rather have two or three lilies of the valley gathered for me by a person I like than the most expensive bouquet than could be bought." "'Mr. Preston had no business to speak as if he had forestalled you,' said Cynthia. "'It came just as we were ready to go, and I put it into the fire directly.' "'Cynthia, my dear love,' said Mrs. Gibson, who had never heard of the fate of the flowers until now, "'what an idea of yourself you will give to Mr. Osborne Hamley! But to be sure I can quite understand it. You inherit my feeling, my prejudice, sentimental, I grant, against bought flowers." Cynthia was silent for a moment. Then she said, "'I used some of your flowers, Mr. Hamley, to dress Molly's hair. It was a great temptation, for the colour so exactly matched her coral ornaments. But I believe she thought it treacherous to disturb the arrangement, so I ought to take all the blame on myself." The arrangements was my brother's, as I told you, but I am sure he would have preferred seeing them in Miss Gibson's hair, rather than in the blazing fire. Mr. Preston comes far the worst off." Osborne was rather amused at the whole affair, and would have liked to probe Cynthia's motives a little farther. He did not hear Molly saying in as soft a voice as if she were talking to herself, "'I wore mine just as they were sent,' for Mrs. Gibson came in with a total change of subject. Speaking of lilies of the valley, is it true that they grow wild in Hurst Wood? It is not the season for them to be in flower yet, but when it is I think we must take a walk there, with our luncheon in a basket, a little picnic, in fact. You'll join us, won't you?" turning to Osborne. I think it's a charming plan. You could ride to Hollingford and put up your horse there, and we could have a long day in the woods and all come home to dinner—dinner with a basket of lilies in the middle of the table. I should like it very much," said Osborne. But I may not be at home. Roger is more likely to be here, I believe, at that time, a month hence." He was thinking of the visit to London to sell his poems, and the run down to Winchester which he anticipated afterwards. The end of May had been the period fixed for this pleasure for some time, not merely in his own mind, but in writing to his wife. "'Oh, but you must be with us. We must wait for Mr. Osborne Hamley, must we not, Cynthia? I'm afraid the lilies won't wait," replied Cynthia. "'Well, then, we must put it off till dog-rose and honeysuckle time. You'll be home then, won't you? Or does the London season present too many attractions?' "'I don't exactly know when dog-roses are in flower.' "'Not know! And you a poet! Don't you remember the lines? It was the time of roses, we plucked them as we passed.' "'Yes, but that doesn't specify the time of year that is the time of roses, and I believe my movements are guided more by the lunar calendar than the floral. You had better take my brother for your companion. He is practical in his love of flowers. I am only theoretical.' "'Does that fine word theoretical imply that you are ignorant?' asked Cynthia. "'Of course we shall be happy to see your brother, but why can't we have you too? I confess to a little timidity in the presence of one so deep and learned as your brother is from all accounts. Give me a little charming ignorance, if one must call it by that hard word." Osborne bowed. It was very pleasant to him to be petted and flattered, even though he knew all the time that it was only flattery. It was an agreeable contrast to the home that was so dismal to him, to come to this house, where the society of two agreeable girls and the soothing syrup of their mother's speeches awaited him whenever he liked to come. To say nothing of the difference that struck upon his senses, poetical though he might esteem himself, 
of a sitting-room full of flowers and tokens of women's presence, where all the chairs were easy, and all the tables well covered with pretty things, to the great drawing-room at home, where the draperies were threadbare and the seats uncomfortable, and no sign of feminine presence ever now lent a grace to the stiff arrangement of the furniture. Then the meals, light and well cooked, suited his taste and delicate appetite so much better than the rich and heavy viands prepared by the servants at the hall. Osborne was becoming a little afraid of falling into the habit of paying too frequent visits to the Gibsons, and that not because he feared the consequences of his intercourse with the two young ladies, for he never thought of them excepting as friends. The fact of his marriage was constantly present to his mind, and M. A. too securely enthroned in his heart, for him to remember that he might be looked upon by others in the light of a possible husband. But the reflection forced itself upon him occasionally, whether he was not trespassing too often on hospitality, which he had at present no means of returning. But Mrs. Gibson, in her ignorance of the true state of affairs, was secretly exultant in the attraction which made him come so often and lounge away the hours in her house and garden. She had no doubt that it was Cynthia who drew him thither, and if the latter had been a little more amenable to reason, her mother would have made more frequent allusions than she did to the crisis which she thought was approaching but she was restrained by the intuitive conviction that if her daughter became conscious of what was impending, and was made aware of Mrs. Gibson's cautious and quiet efforts to forward the catastrophe, the wilful girl would oppose herself to it with all her skill and power. As it was, Mrs. Gibson trusted that Cynthia's affections would become engaged before she knew where she was, and that, in that case, she would not attempt to frustrate her mother's delicate scheming, even though she did perceive it. But Cynthia had come across too many varieties of flirtation, admiration, and even passionate love, to be for a moment at fault as to the quiet, friendly nature of Osborne's attentions. She received him always as a sister might a brother. It was different when Roger returned from his election as Fellow of Trinity. The trembling diffidence, the hardly suppressed ardour of his manner, made Cynthia understand before long with what kind of love she had now to deal. She did not put it into so many words no, not even in her secret heart, but she recognized the difference between Roger's relation to her and Osborne's long before Mrs. Gibson found it out. Molly was, however, the first to discover the nature of Roger's attention. The first time they saw him after the ball it came out to her observant eyes. Cynthia had not been looking well since that evening. She went slowly about the house, pale and heavy-eyed, and fond as she usually was of exercise and the free fresh air, there was hardly any persuading her now to go out for a walk. Molly watched this fading with tender anxiety, but to all her questions as to whether she had felt over-fatigued with her dancing, whether anything had occurred to annoy her, and all such inquiries, she replied in languid negatives. Once Molly touched on Mr. Preston's name, and found that this was a subject on which Cynthia was raw. Now Cynthia's face lighted up with spirit, and her whole body showed her ill-repressed agitation, but she only said a few sharp words, expressive of anything but kindly feeling towards the gentleman, and then bade Molly never name his name to her again. Still the latter could not imagine that he was more than intensely distasteful to her friend as well as to herself. He could not be the cause of Cynthia's present indisposition. But this indisposition lasted so many days without change or modification that even Mrs. Gibson noticed it, and Molly became positively uneasy. Mrs. Gibson considered Cynthia's quietness and languor as the natural consequence of dancing with everybody who asked her at the ball. Partners whose names were in the red book would not have produced half the amount of fatigue, according to Mrs. Gibson's judgment apparently, and if Cynthia had been quite well, very probably she would have hit the blot in her mother's speech with one of her touches of sarcasm. Then again, when Cynthia did not rally, Mrs. Gibson grew impatient, and accused her of being fanciful and lazy. At length, and partly at Molly's insistence, there came an appeal to Mr. Gibson, and a professional examination of the supposed invalid, which Cynthia hated more than anything, especially when the verdict was that there was nothing very much the matter, only a general lowness of tone and depression of health and spirits, which would soon be remedied by tonics, and meanwhile she was not to be roused to exertion. "'If there is one thing I dislike,' said Cynthia to Mr. Gibson, after he had pronounced tonics to be the cure for her present state. It is the way doctors have of giving tablespoonful of nauseous mixtures a certain remedy for sorrows and cares. She laughed up in his face as she spoke. She had always a pretty word and smile for him, 
even in the midst of her loss of spirits. "'Come, you acknowledge that you have sorrows by that speech. We'll make a bargain. If you'll tell me your sorrows and cares, I'll try and find some other remedy for them than giving you what we are pleased to term my nauseous mixtures.' "'No,' said Cynthia, colouring. "'I never said I had sorrows and cares. I spoke generally. What should I have a sorrow about? You and Molly are only too kind to me.' Her eyes filling with tears. "'Well, well, we'll not talk of such gloomy things. And you shall have some sweet emulsion to disguise the taste of the bitters I shall be obliged to fall back upon.' "'Please don't. If you but knew how I dislike emulsions and disguises. I do want bitters. And if I sometimes—if I'm obliged to—if I'm not truthful myself, I do like truth in others. At least, sometimes." She ended her sentence with another smile, but it was rather faint and watery. Now the first person out of the house to notice Cynthia's change of look and manner was Roger Hamley, and yet he did not see her until, under the influence of the nauseous mixture, she was beginning to recover. But his eyes were scarcely off her during the first five minutes he was in the room. All the time he was trying to talk to Mrs. Gibson and replied to her civil platitudes, he was studying Cynthia. And at the first convenient pause he came and stood before Molly, so as to interpose his person between her and the rest of the room, for some visitors had come in subsequent to his entrance. "'Molly, how ill your sister is looking! What is it? Has she had advice? You must forgive me, but so often those who live together in the same house don't observe the first approaches of illness.' Now Molly's love for Cynthia was fast and unwavering, but if anything tried it, it was the habit Roger had fallen into of always calling Cynthia Molly's sister in speaking to the latter. From any one else it would have been a matter of indifference to her, and hardly to be noticed. It vexed both ear and heart when Roger used the expression, and there was a curtness of manner as well as of words in her reply. "'Oh, she was overtired by the ball. Papa has seen her, and says she will be all right very soon.' I wonder if she wants change of air," said Roger meditatively. I wish—I do wish we could have her at the hall. You and your mother too, of course. But I don't see how it would be possible. Or else how charming it would be. Molly felt as if a visit to the hall under such circumstances would be altogether so different an affair to all her former ones that she could hardly tell if she should like it or not. Roger went on. You got our flowers in time, did you not? Ah, oh, you don't know how often I thought of you that evening. And you enjoyed it too, didn't you? You had plenty of agreeable partners and all that makes a first ball delightful. I heard that your sister danced every dance." "'It was very pleasant,' said Molly quietly. "'But after all I am not sure if I want to go to another just yet. There seems to be so much trouble connected with the ball.' "'Ah, you were thinking of your sister, and her not being well?' "'No, I was not said Molly, rather bluntly. I was thinking of the dress, and the dressing, and the weariness the next day." He might think her unfeeling if he liked. She felt as if she had only too much feeling just then, for it was bringing on her a strange contraction of heart. But he was too inherently good himself to put any harsh construction on her speech. Just before he went away, while he was ostensibly holding her hand and wishing her good-bye, he said to her in a voice too low to be generally heard, is there anything I could do for your sister? We have plenty of books, as you know, if she cares for reading." Then, receiving no affirmative look or word from Molly in reply to this suggestion, he went on. "'Or flowers. She likes flowers. Oh, and our forced strawberries are just ready. I will bring some over to-morrow.' "'I am sure she will like them,' said Molly. For some reason or other unknown to the Gibsons, a longer interval than usual occurred between Osborne's visits while Roger came almost every day, always with some fresh offering by which he openly sought to relieve Cynthia's indisposition as far as it lay in his power. Her manner to him was so gentle and gracious that Mrs. Gibson became alarmed, lest, in spite of his uncouthness, as she was pleased to term it, he might come to be preferred to Osborne, who was so strangely neglecting his own interests in Mrs. Gibson's opinion. In her quiet way she contrived to pass many slights upon Roger but the darts rebounded from his generous nature that could not have imagined her motives, and fastened themselves on Molly. She had often been called naughty and passionate when she was a child, and she thought now that she began to understand that she really had a violent temper. 
what seemed neither to hurt Roger nor annoy Cynthia, made Molly's blood boil. And now she had once discovered Mrs. Gibson's wish to make Roger's visit shorter and less frequent, she was always on the watch for indications of this desire. She read her stepmother's heart when the latter made allusions to the squire's loneliness, now that Osborne was absent from the hall, and that Roger was so often away amongst his friends during the day. "'Mr. Gibson and I should be so delighted if you could have stopped to dinner. But of course we cannot be so selfish as to ask you to stay, when we remember how your father would be left alone. We were saying yesterday we wondered how he bore his solitude. Poor old gentleman!' or, as soon as Roger came with his bunch of early roses, it was desirable for Cynthia to go and rest in her own room, while Molly had to accompany Mrs. Gibson on some improvised errand or call. Still Roger, whose object was to give pleasure to Cynthia, and who had, from his boyhood, been always certain of Mr. Gibson's friendly regard, was slow to perceive that he was not wanted. If he did not see Cynthia, that was his loss. At any rate, he heard how she was, and left her some little thing which he believed she would like and was willing to risk the chance of his own gratification by calling four or five times in the hope of seeing her once. At last there came a day when Mrs. Gibson went beyond her usual negative snubbiness, and when, in some unwonted fit of crossness, for she was a very placid-tempered person in general, she was guilty of positive rudeness. Cynthia was very much better. Tonics had ministered to a mind diseased, though she hated to acknowledge it. Her pretty bloom and much of her light-heartedness had come back, and there was no cause remaining for anxiety. Mrs. Gibson was sitting at her embroidery in the drawing-room, and the two girls were at the window, Cynthia laughing at Molly's earnest endeavours to imitate the French accent in which the former had been reading a page of Voltaire. For the duty or the farce of settling to improving reading in the mornings was still kept up, although Lord Hollingford, the unconscious suggester of the idea, had gone back to town without making any of the efforts to see Molly again that Mrs. Gibson had anticipated on the night of the ball. That al Nasher vision had fallen to the ground. It was as yet early morning, a delicious, fresh, lovely June day, the air redolent with the scents of flower-growth and bloom, and half the time the girls had been ostensibly employed in the French reading, they had been leaning out of the open window trying to reach a cluster of climbing roses. They had secured them at last, and the buds lay on Cynthia's lap, but many of the petals had fallen off. So, though the perfume lingered about the window-seat, the full beauty of the flowers had passed away. Mrs. Gibson had once or twice reproved them for the merry noise they were making, which hindered her in the business of counting the stitches in her pattern, and she had set herself a certain quantity to do that morning before going out, and was of that nature which attaches infinite importance to fulfilling small resolutions, made about indifferent trifles without any reason whatever. "'Mr. Roger Hamley,' was announced. "'So tiresome!' said Mrs. Gibson, almost in his hearing, as she pushed away her embroidery frame. She put out her cold, motionless hand to him, with a half-murmured word of welcome, still eyeing her lost embroidery. He took no apparent notice, and passed on to the window. "'How delicious!' said he. "'No need for any more Hamley roses, now yours are out.' "'I agree with you,' said Mrs. Gibson replying to him before either Cynthia or Molly could speak, though he addressed his words to them. "'You've been very kind in bringing us flowers so long, but now our own are out we need not trouble you any more.' He looked at her with a little surprise clouding his honest face. It was perhaps more at the tone than the words. Mrs. Gibson, however, had been bold enough to strike the first blow, and she determined to go on as opportunity offered. Molly would perhaps have been more pained if she had not seen Cynthia's colour rise. She waited for her to speak, if need were, for she knew that Roger's defence, if defence were required, might be safely entrusted to Cynthia's ready wit. He put out his hand for the shattered cluster of roses that lay in Cynthia's lap. "'At any rate,' said he, "'my trouble, if Mrs. Gibson considers it has been trouble to me, will be overpaid if I may have this.' "'Old lamps for new,' said Cynthia, smiling as she gave it to him. I wish one could always buy nosegays such as you have brought us, as cheaply. "'You forget the waste of time that I think we must reckon as part of the payment,' said her mother. "'Really, Mr. Hamley, we must learn to shut our doors on you if you come so often, and at such early hours. I settle myself to my own employment regularly after breakfast till lunch-time, and it is my wish to keep Cynthia and Molly to a course of improving reading and study, 
so desirable for young people of their age, if they are ever to become intelligent, companionable women. But with early visitors it is quite impossible to observe any regularity of habits." All this was said in that sweet false tone which of late had gone through Molly like the scraping of a slate-pencil on a slate. Roger's face changed, his ruddy colour grew paler for a moment, and he looked grave and not pleased. In another moment the wonted frankness of expression returned. Why should not he, he asked himself, believe her? It was early to call. It did interrupt regular occupation. So he spoke, and said, "'I believe I have been very thoughtless. I'll not come so early again. But I had some excuse to-day. My brother told me you had made a plan for going to see Hurst Wood when the roses were out, and they are earlier than usual this year. I've been round to see. He spoke of a long day there, going before lunch. The plan was made with Mr. Osborne Hamley. I could not think of going without him.' said Mrs. Gibson coldly. "'I had a letter from him this morning, in which he named your wish, and he says he fears he cannot be at home until they are out of flower. I dare say they are not much to see in reality, but the day is so lovely I thought that the plan of going to Hurstwood would be a charming excuse for being out of doors.' "'Thank you. How kind you are, and so good, too, in sacrificing your natural desire to be with your father as much as possible.' I am glad to say my father is so much better than he was in the winter, that he spends much of his time out of doors in his fields. He has been accustomed to go about alone. And I, we, think that as great a return to his former habits as he can be induced to make is the best for him." "'And when do you return to Cambridge?' There was some hesitation in Roger's manner as he replied. "'It is uncertain. You probably know that I am to be a fellow of Cambridge now. I hardly yet know what my future plans may be. I am thinking of going up to London soon." "'Ah! London is the true place for a young man,' said Mrs. Gibson with decision, as if she had reflected a good deal on the question. "'If it were not that we are really so busy this morning, I should have been tempted to make an exception to our general rule. One more exception, for your early visits have made us make too many already. Perhaps, however, we may see you again before you go.' "'Certainly I shall come,' replied he, rising to take his leave, and still holding the demolished roses in his hand. Then, addressing himself more especially to Cynthia, he added, "'My stay in London will not exceed a fortnight or so. Is there anything I can do for you? Or you?' turning a little to Molly. "'No, thank you very much,' said Cynthia very sweetly, and then acting on a sudden impulse, she leant out of the window and gathered him some half-opened roses. You deserve these. Do throw that poor shabby bunch away." His eyes brightened, his cheeks glowed. He took the offered buds, but did not throw away the other bunch. "'At any rate, I may come over after lunch is over, and the afternoons and evenings will be the most delicious time of day a month hence.' He said this to both Molly and Cynthia, but in his heart he addressed it to the latter. Mrs. Gibson affected not to hear what he was saying, but held out her limp hand once more to him. I suppose we shall see you when you return, and pray tell your brother how we are longing to have a visit from him again." When he had left the room, Molly's heart was quite full. She had watched his face, and read something of his feelings, his disappointment at their non-acquiescence in his plan of a day's pleasure in Hurst Wood, the delayed conviction that his presence was not welcome to the wife of his old friend, which had come so slowly upon him. Perhaps, after all, these things touched Molly more keenly than they did him. His bright look when Cynthia gave him the rosebuds indicated a gush of sudden delight more vivid than the pain he had shown by his previous increase of gravity. "'I can't think why he will come at such untimely hours,' said Mrs. Gibson, as soon as she heard him fairly out of the house. "'It's different from Osborne. We are so much more intimate with him. He came and made friends with us all the time this stupid brother of his was muddling his brains with mathematics at Cambridge. Fellow of Trinity, indeed! I wish he would learn to stay there, and not come intruding here, and assuming that because I asked Osborne to join in a picnic, it was all the same to me which brother came." "'In short, mamma, one man may steal a horse, but another must not look over the hedge,' said Cynthia, pouting a little. "'And the two brothers have always been treated so exactly alike by their friends, and there has been such a strong friendship between them, that it is no wonder Roger thinks he may be welcome where Osborne is allowed to come at all hours.' continued Molly, in high dudgeon. 
Roger's muddled brains, indeed! Roger stupid! Oh, very well, my dears! When I was young it wouldn't have been thought becoming for girls of your age to fly out because a little restraint was exercised as to the hours at which they should receive the young men's calls. And they would have supposed that there might be good reasons why their parents disapproved of the visits of certain gentlemen, even while they were proud and pleased to see some members of the same family." "'But that was what I said, mamma," said Cynthia, looking at her mother with an expression of innocent bewilderment on her face. "'One man may—be quiet, child! All proverbs are vulgar, and I do believe that is the vulgarest of all. You are really catching Roger Hamley's coarseness, Cynthia." Mamma said Cynthia, roused to anger. "'I don't mind your abusing me, but Mr. Roger Hamley has been very kind to me, while I've not been well. I can't bear to hear him disparaged. If he's coarse, I've no objection to be coarse as well, for it seems to me it must mean kindliness and pleasantness, and the bringing of pretty flowers and presents.' Molly's tears were brimming over at these words. She could have kissed Cynthia for her warm partisanship. But afraid of betraying emotion and making a scene, as Mrs. Gibson called any signs of warm feeling, she laid down her book hastily, and ran upstairs to her room, and locked the door in order to breathe freely. There were traces of tears upon her face when she returned into the drawing-room half an hour afterwards, walking straight and demurely up to her former place, where Cynthia still sat and gazed idly out of the window, pouting and displeased. Mrs. Gibson, meanwhile, counting her stitches aloud with great distinctness and vigour. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 Bush Fighting During all the months that had elapsed since Mrs. Hamley's death, Molly had wondered many a time about the secret she had so unwittingly become possessed of that last day in the hall library. It seemed so utterly strange and unheard of a thing to her inexperienced mind, that a man should be married and yet not live with his wife, that a son should have entered into the holy state of matrimony without his father's knowledge, and without being recognized as the husband of some one known or unknown by all those with whom he came in daily contact, that she felt occasionally as if that little ten minutes of revelation must have been a vision in a dream. Roger had only slightly referred to it once and Osborne had kept entire silence on the subject ever since. Not even a look or a pause betrayed any allusion to it. It even seemed to have passed out of their thoughts. There had been the great sad event of their mother's death to fill their minds on the next occasion of their meeting Molly, and since then long pauses of intercourse had taken place, so that she sometimes felt as if both the brothers must have forgotten how she had come to know their important secret. She even found herself often entirely forgetting it, but perhaps the consciousness of it was present to her unawares, and enabled her to comprehend the real nature of Osborne's feelings towards Cynthia. At any rate she never for a moment had supposed that his kind, gentle manner towards Cynthia was anything but the courtesy of a friend. Strange to say, in these latter days Molly had looked upon Osborne's relation to herself as pretty much the same as that in which at one time she had regarded Roger's and she thought of the former as of some one as nearly a brother both to Cynthia and herself as any young man could well be, whom they had not known in childhood, and who was in no wise related to them. She thought that he was very much improved in manner, and probably in character, by his mother's death. He was no longer sarcastic, or fastidious, or vain, or self-confident. She did not know how often all these styles of talk or of behaviour were put on to conceal shyness or consciousness, and to veil the real self from strangers. Osborne's conversation and ways might very possibly have been just the same as before, had he been thrown amongst new people, but Molly only saw him in their own circle in which he was on terms of decided intimacy. Still there was no doubt that he was really improved though perhaps not to the extent for which Molly gave him credit, and this exaggeration on her part arose very naturally from the fact that he, perceiving Roger's warm admiration for Cynthia, withdrew a little out of his brother's way, and used to go and talk to Molly in order not to intrude himself between Roger and Cynthia. Of the two, perhaps, Osborne preferred Molly. To her he needed not to talk if the mood was not on him, they were on those happy terms where silence is permissible, and where efforts to act against the prevailing mood of the mind are not required. 
Sometimes, indeed, when Osborne was in the humour to be critical and fastidious as of yore, he used to vex Roger by insisting upon it that Molly was prettier than Cynthia. "'You mark my words, Roger. Five years hence the beautiful Cynthia's red and white will have become just a little coarse, and her figure will have thickened, while Molly's will only have developed into more perfect grace. I don't believe the girl has done growing yet. I am sure she's taller than when I first saw her last summer.' Miss Kirkpatrick's eyes must always be perfection. I cannot fancy any could come up to them—soft, grave, appealing, tender, and such a heavenly colour. I often try to find something in nature to compare them to. They are not like violets. That blue in the eyes is too like physical weakness of sight. They are not like the sky. That colour has something of cruelty in it. Come, don't go on trying to match her eyes as if you were a draper, and they a bit of ribbon. Say at once her eyes are lodestars, and have done with it. I set up Molly's grey eyes and curling black lashes, long odds above the other young woman's. But of course it's all a matter of taste." And now both Osborne and Roger had left the neighbourhood. In spite of all that Mrs. Gibson had said about Roger's visits being ill-timed and intrusive, she began to feel as if they had been a very pleasant variety, now that they had ceased altogether. He brought in a whiff of a new atmosphere from that of Hollingford. He and his brother had been always ready to do numberless little things which only a man can do for women—small services which Mr. Gibson was always too busy to render. For the good doctor's business grew upon him. He thought that this increase was owing to his greater skill and experience, and he would probably have been mortified if he could have known how many of his patients were solely biased in sending for him by the fact that he was employed at the Towers. Something of this sort must have been contemplated in the low scale of payment adopted long ago by the Cumnor family. Of itself the money he received for going to the Towers would hardly have paid him in horse-flesh, but then, as Lady Cumnor in her younger days had worded it, it is such a thing for a man just setting up in practice for himself to be able to say he attends at this house." So the prestige was tacitly sold and paid for, but neither buyer nor seller defined the nature of the bargain. On the whole it was as well that Mr. Gibson spent so much of his time from home. He sometimes thought so himself when he heard his wife's plaintive fret or pretty babble over totally indifferent things and perceived of how flimsy a nature were all her fine sentiments. Still he did not allow himself to repine over the step he had taken. He willfully shut his eyes and waxed up his ears to many small things that he knew would have irritated him if he had attended to them, and in his solitary rides he forced himself to dwell on the positive advantages that had accrued to him and his through his marriage. He had obtained an unexceptionable chaperone, if not a tender mother, for his little girl a skilful manager of his previously disorderly household, a woman who was graceful and pleasant to look at for the head of his table. Moreover, Cynthia reckoned for something on the favourable side of the balance. She was a capital companion for Molly, and the two were evidently very fond of each other. The feminine companionship of the mother and daughter was agreeable to him as well as to his child. When Mrs. Gibson was moderately sensible and not over-sentimental, he mentally added, and then he checked himself for he would not allow himself to become more aware of her faults and foibles by defining them. At any rate, she was harmless, and wonderfully just to Molly for a stepmother. She piqued herself upon this indeed, and would often call attention to the fact of her being unlike other women in this respect. Just then sudden tears came into Mr. Gibson's eyes, as he remembered how quiet and undemonstrative his little Molly had become in her general behaviour to him but how once or twice when they had met upon the stairs, or were otherwise unwitnessed, she had caught him and kissed him, hand or cheek, in a sad passionateness of affection. But in a moment he began to whistle an old Scotch air he had heard in his childhood, and which had never recurred to his memory since, and five minutes afterwards he was too busily treating a case of white swelling in the knee of a little boy, and thinking how to relieve the poor mother who went out charring all day, and had to listen to the moans of her child all night, to have any thought for his own cares, which, if they really existed, were of so trifling a nature compared to the hard reality of this hopeless woe. Osborne came home first. He returned, in fact, not long after Roger had gone away, but he was languid and unwell, and though he did not complain, he felt unequal to any exertion. 
Thus a week or more elapsed before any of the Gibsons knew that he was at the hall, and then it was only by chance that they became aware of it. Mr. Gibson met him in one of the lanes near Hamley. The acute surgeon noticed the gait of the man as he came near, before he recognised who it was. When he overtook him he said, "'Why, Osborne, is it you? I thought it was an old man of fifty loitering before me. I didn't know you would come back.' "'Yes,' said Osborne. I have been at home nearly ten days. I dare say I ought to have called on your people, for I made a half-promise to Mrs. Gibson to let her know as soon as I returned. But the fact is I am feeling very good for nothing. This air oppresses me. I could hardly breathe in the house. And yet I am already tired with this short walk. You would better get home at once, and I'll call and see you as I come back from Rose. No, you mustn't on any account," said Osborne hastily. My father is annoyed enough about my going from home so often, he says, though I hadn't been from it for six weeks. He puts down all my languor to my having been away. He keeps the purse-strings, you know," he added with a faint smile, and I'm in the unlucky position of a penniless heir, and I've been brought up so, in fact I must leave home from time to time, and if my father gets confirmed in this notion of his that my health is worse for my absences, he'll stop the supplies altogether. "'May I ask where you do spend your time when you are not at Hamley Hall?' asked Mr. Gibson, with some hesitation in his manner. "'No,' replied Osborne reluctantly. "'I will tell you this. I stay with friends in the country. I lead a life which ought to be conducive to health, because it is thoroughly simple, rational, and happy. And now I have told you more about it than my father himself knows. He never asks me where I have been, and I shouldn't tell him if he did. At least I think not." Mr. Gibson rode on by Osborne's side, not speaking for a moment or two. "'Osborne, whatever scrapes you may have got into, I should advise your telling your father boldly out. I know him, and I know he'll be angry enough at first, but he'll come round, take my word for it. And somehow or another he'll find money to pay your debts and set you free, if it's that kind of difficulty. And if it's any other kind of entanglement, why, he's still your best friend. It's this estrangement from your father that's telling on your health, I'll be bound." "'No,' said Osborne. "'I beg your pardon, but it's not that. I am really out of order. I dare say my unwillingness to encounter any displeasure from my father is the consequence of my indisposition, but I'll answer for it, it is not the cause of it. My instinct tells me there is something really the matter with me." "'Come, don't be setting up your instinct against the profession.' said Mr. Gibson cheerily. He dismounted, and throwing the reins of his horse around his arm, he looked at Osborne's tongue and felt his pulse, asking him various questions. At the end he said, "'We'll soon bring you about, though I should like a little more quiet talk with you, without this tugging brute for a third. If you'll manage to ride over and lunch with us to-morrow, Dr. Nichols will be with us. He's coming over to see old Roe, and you shall have the benefit of the advice of two doctors instead of one. Go home now. You've had enough exercise for the middle of a day as hot as this is. And don't mope in the house listening to the maunderings of your stupid instinct." "'What else have I to do?' said Osborne. "'My father and I are not companions. One can't read and write for ever, especially when there's no end to be gained by it. I don't mind telling you, but in confidence recollect, that I've been trying to get some of my poems published but there's no one like a publisher for taking the conceit out of one. Not a man among them would have them as a gift." Oh, So that's it, is it, Master Osborne? I thought there was some mental cause for this depression of health. I wouldn't trouble my head about it if I were you, though that's always very easily said, I know. Try your hand at prose, if you can't manage to please the publishers with poetry. But at any rate don't go on fretting over spilt milk. But I mustn't lose my time here. Come over to us to-morrow, as I said, and what with the wisdom of two doctors and the wit and folly of three women, I think we shall cheer you up a bit." So saying, Mr. Gibson remounted and rode away at the long, slinging trot so well known to the country people as the doctor's pace. "'I don't like his looks,' thought Mr. Gibson to himself that night, as over his day-books he reviewed the events of the day. "'And then his pulse! But how often we're all mistaken! And ten to one my own hidden enemy lies closer to me than his does to him, even taking the worse view of the case." 
Osborne made his appearance a considerable time before luncheon the next morning, and no one objected to the earliness of his call. He was feeling better. There were few signs of the invalid about him, and what few there were disappeared under the bright pleasant influence of such a welcome as he received from all. Molly and Cynthia had much to tell him of the small proceedings since he went away, or to relate the conclusions of half-accomplished projects. Cynthia was often on the point of some gay, careless inquiry as to where he had been, and what he had been doing. But Molly, who conjectured the truth, as often interfered to spare him the pain of equivocation, a pain that her tender conscience would have felt for him much more than he would have felt it for himself. Mrs. Gibson's talk was desultory, complimentary, and sentimental, after her usual fashion, but still on the whole, though Osborne smiled to himself at much that she said, it was soothing and agreeable. Presently Dr. Nichols and Mr. Gibson came in. The former had had some conference with the latter on the subject of Osborne's health, and from time to time the skilful old physician's sharp and observant eyes gave a comprehensive look at Osborne. Then there was lunch, when every one was merry and hungry, excepting the hostess, who was trying to train her midday appetite into the genteelest of all ways, and thought, falsely enough, that Dr. Nichols was a good person to practice the semblance of ill-health upon, and that he would give her the proper civil amount of commiseration for her ailments, which every guest ought to bestow upon a hostess who complains of her delicacy of health. The old doctor was too cunning a man to fall into this trap. He would keep recommending her to try the coarsest viands on the table, and at last he told her if she could not fancy the cold beef, to try a little with pickled onions. There was a twinkle in his eye as he said this, that would have betrayed his humour to any observer, but Mr. Gibson, Cynthia, and Molly were all attacking Osborne on the subject of some literary preference he had expressed, and Dr. Nichols had Mrs. Gibson quite at his mercy. She was not sorry when luncheon was over to leave the room to the three gentlemen, and ever afterwards she spoke of Dr. Nichols as, "'That bear!' Presently Osborne came upstairs, and after his old fashion, began to take up new books, and to question the girls as to their music. Mrs. Gibson had to go out and pay some calls, so she left the three together, and after a while they adjourned into the garden, Osborne lounging on a chair, while Molly employed herself busily in tying up carnations, and Cynthia gathered flowers in her careless, graceful way. "'I hope you notice the difference in our occupations, Mr. Hamley. Molly, you see, devotes herself to the useful, and I to the ornamental.' Please, under what head do you class what you were doing? I think you might help one of us, instead of looking on like the grand seigneur." "'I don't know what I can do,' said he, rather plaintively. "'I should like to be useful, but I don't know how, and my day is past for purely ornamental work. You must let me be, I'm afraid. Besides, I'm really rather exhausted by being questioned and pulled about by those good doctors. "'Why, you don't mean to say they have been attacking you since lunch?' exclaimed Molly. "'Yes, indeed, they have, and they might have gone on till now if Mrs. Gibson had not come in opportunely.' "'I thought Mamma had gone out some time ago,' said Cynthia, catching wafts of the conversation as she flitted hither and thither among the flowers. "'She came into the dining-room not five minutes ago. Do you want her? For I see her crossing the hall at this very moment.' And Osborne half rose. "'Oh, not at all,' said Cynthia. "'Only she seemed to be in such a hurry to go out. I fancied she had set off long ago. She had some errands to do for Lady Cumnor, and she thought she could manage to catch the housekeeper, who is always in the town on Thursday.' "'Are the family coming to the Towers this autumn?' "'I believe so. But I don't know, and I don't much care. They don't take kindly to me,' continued Cynthia. "'And so I suppose I am not generous enough to take kindly to them.' I should have thought that such a very unusual blot in their discrimination would have interested you in them as extraordinary people," said Osborne, with a little air of conscious gallantry. "'Isn't that a compliment?' said Cynthia, after a pause of mock meditation. "'If any one pays me a compliment, please let it be short and clear. I am very stupid at finding out hidden meanings.' "'Then such speeches as, "'You are very pretty,' or "'You have charming manners,' or what do you prefer?" Now I pique myself on wrapping up my sugar-plums delicately. Then would you please to write them down, and at my leisure I'll pass them. No, it would be too much trouble. I'll meet you half-way and study clearness next time. 
"'What are you two talking about?' said Molly, resting on her light spade. "'It's only a discussion on the best way of administering compliments,' said Cynthia, taking up her flower-basket again, but not going out of the reach of the conversation. "'I don't like them at all in any way,' said Molly. "'But perhaps it's rather sour grapes with me,' she added. "'Nonsense,' said Osborne. "'Shall I tell you what I heard of you at the ball?' "'Or shall I provoke Mr. Preston,' said Cynthia, "'to begin upon you? It's like turning a tap. Such a stream of pretty speeches flows out at the moment.' Her lip curled with scorn. "'For you, perhaps,' said Molly. "'But not for me.' "'For any woman. It's his notion of making himself agreeable. If you dare me, Molly, I'll try the experiment, and you'll see with what success.' "'No, don't pray,' said Molly, in a hurry. "'I do so dislike him.' "'Why?' said Osborne, roused to a little curiosity by her vehemence. "'Oh, I don't know. He never seems to know what one is feeling.' "'He wouldn't care if he did know,' said Cynthia. "'And he might know he is not wanted.' "'If he chooses to stay, he cares little whether he is wanted or not.' "'Come, this is very interesting,' said Osborne. It is like the strophe and antistrophe in a Greek chorus. Pray go on." "'Don't you know him?' asked Molly. "'Yes, by sight, and I think we were once introduced. But you know we are much farther from Ashcombe at Hamley than you are here at Hollingford. "'Oh, but he's coming to take Mr. Sheepshank's place, and then he'll live here altogether,' said Molly. "'Molly, who told you that?' said Cynthia, in quite a different tone of voice from that in which she had been speaking hitherto. "'Papa, didn't you hear him?' "'Oh, no, it was before you were down this morning. Papa met Mr. Sheepshanks yesterday, and he told him it was all settled. You know we heard rumour about it in the spring.' Cynthia was very silent after this. Presently she said that she had gathered all the flowers she wanted, and that the heat was so great she would go indoors. And then Osborne went away. But Molly had set herself a task to dig up such roots as has already flowered, and to put down some bedding-out plants in their stead. Tired and heated as she was, she finished it, and then went upstairs to rest and change her dress. According to her wont she sought for Cynthia. There was no reply to her soft knock at the bedroom door opposite to her own, and thinking that Cynthia might have fallen asleep and be lying uncovered in the draught of the open window, she went in softly. Cynthia was lying upon the bed as if she had thrown herself down on it without caring for the ease or comfort of her position. She was very still, and Molly took a shawl and was going to place it over her, when she opened her eyes and spoke. "'Is that you, dear? Don't go. I like to know that you were there.' She shut her eyes again and remained quite quiet for a few minutes longer. Then she started up into a sitting posture, pushed away her hair from her forehead and burning eyes, and gazed intently at Molly. "'Do you know what I've been thinking, dear?' she said. "'I've been thinking I'd been long enough here, and that I had better go out as a governess.' "'Cynthia, what do you mean?' asked Molly, aghast. "'You've been asleep. You've been dreaming. You're overtired,' continued she, sitting down on the bed and taking Cynthia's passive hand and stroking it softly, a mode of caressing that had come down to her from her mother, whether as an hereditary instinct or as a lingering remembrance of the tender ways of the dead woman, Mr. Gibson often wondered within himself when he observed it. "'Oh, how good you are, Molly! I wonder if I had been brought up like you whether I should have been as good. But I've been tossed about so.' "'Then don't go and be tossed about any more,' said Molly softly. "'Oh, dear, I'd better go. But you see, no one ever loved me like you. And I think your father. Doesn't he, Molly?' and it's hard to be driven out. "'Cynthia, I am sure you're not well, or else you're not half awake.' Cynthia sat with her arms encircling her knees, and looking at vacancy. "'Well,' said she, at last, heaving a great sigh, but then smiling as she caught Molly's anxious face, "'I suppose there's no escaping one's doom, and anywhere else I should be much more forlorn and unprotected.' "'What do you mean by your doom?' "'Ah, that's telling, little one,' said Cynthia, who seemed now to have recovered her usual manner. "'I don't mean to have one, though. I think that, though I am an arrant coward at heart, I can show fight.' "'With whom?' asked Molly, 
really anxious to probe the mystery, if indeed there was one, to the bottom, in the hope of some remedy being found for the distress Cynthia was in when first Molly entered. Again Cynthia was lost in thought. Then, catching the echo of Molly's last words in her mind, she said, "'With whom? Oh, shall fight with whom? Why, my doom, to be sure! Am not I a grand young lady to have a doom? Why, Molly, child, how pale and grave you look!' said she, kissing her all of a sudden. "'You ought not to care so much for me. I'm not good enough for you to worry yourself about me. I've given myself up long ago as a heartless baggage.' "'Nonsense! I wish you wouldn't talk so, Cynthia.' "'And I wish you wouldn't always take me at the foot of the letter, as an English girl at school used to translate it. Oh, how hot it is! Is it never going to get cool again? My child, what dirty hands you've got! And face, too! And I've been kissing you! I dare say I'm dirty with it, too. Now isn't that like one of Mamma's speeches? But for all that you look more like a delving Adam than a spinning Eve.' This had the effect that Cynthia intended. The daintily clean Molly became conscious of her soiled condition, which she had forgotten while she had been attending to Cynthia, and she hastily withdrew to her own room. When she had gone, Cynthia noiselessly locked the door, and taking her purse out of her desk, she began to count over her money. She counted it once, she counted it twice, as if desirous of finding out some mistake which should prove it to be more than it was, but the end of it all was a sigh. "'What a fool! What a fool I was!' said she at length. "'But even if I don't go out as a governess, I shall make it up in time.' Some weeks after the time he had anticipated when he had spoken of his departure to the Gibsons, Roger returned back to the hall. One morning when he called, Osborne told them that his brother had been at home for two or three days. "'And why has he not come here, then?' said Mrs. Gibson. "'It is not kind of him not to come and see us as soon as he can. Tell him I say so. Pray do." Osborne had gained one or two ideas as to her treatment of Roger the last time he had called. Roger had not complained of it, or even mentioned it, till that very morning. When Osborne was on the point of starting, and had urged Roger to accompany him, the latter had told him something of what Mrs. Gibson had said. He spoke rather as if he were more amused than annoyed, but Osborne could read that he was chagrined at those restrictions placed upon calls which were the greatest pleasure of his life. Neither of them let out the suspicion which had entered both their minds, the well-grounded suspicion arising from the fact that Osborne's visits, be they paid early or late, had never yet been met with a repulse. Osborne reproached himself with having done Mrs. Gibson injustice. She was evidently a weak but probably a disinterested woman, and it was only a little bit of ill-temper on her part which had caused her to speak to Roger as she had done. "'I dare say it was rather impertinent of me to call at such an untimely hour said Roger. "'Not at all. I call at all hours, and nothing is ever said about it. It was just because she was put out that morning. I'll answer for it she's sorry now, and I'm sure you may go there at any time you like in the future.' Still Roger did not choose to go again for two or three weeks, and the consequence was that the next time he called the ladies were out. Once again he had the same ill luck, and then he received a little pretty three-cornered note from Mrs. Gibson. "'My dear sir,' "'How is it that you have become so formal all in a sudden, leaving cards instead of awaiting our return? Fie for shame! If you had seen the faces of disappointment that I did when the horrid little bits of pasteboard were displayed to our view, you would not have borne malice against me so long, for it is really punishing others as well as my naughty self. If you will come to-morrow, as early as you like, and lunch with us, I'll own I was cross, and acknowledge myself a penitent. Yours ever, Hyacinth C. K. Gibson. There was no resisting this, even if there had not been such strong inclination to back up the pretty words. Roger went, and Mrs. Gibson caressed and petted him in her sweetest, silkiest manner. Cynthia looked lovelier than ever to him for the slight restriction that had been laid for a time on their intercourse. She might be gay and sparkling with Osborne, with Roger she was soft and grave. Instinctively she knew her men. She saw that Osborne was only interested in her because of her position in a family with whom he was intimate, that his friendship was without the least touch of sentiment, and that his admiration was only the warm criticism of an artist for unusual beauty. But she felt how different Roger's relation to her was. To him she was the one, alone, peerless. 
if his love was prohibited, it would be long years before he could sink down into tepid friendship. And to him her personal loveliness was only one of the many charms that made him tremble into passion. Cynthia was not capable of returning such feelings. She had had too little true love in her life, and perhaps too much admiration to do so. But she appreciated this honest ardour, this loyal worship that was new to her experience. Such appreciation and such respect for his true and affectionate nature gave a serious tenderness to her manner to Roger, which allured him with a fresh and separate grace. Molly sat by and wondered how it all would end, or rather how soon it would all end, for she thought that no girl could resist such reverent passion, and on Roger's side there could be no doubt. Alas, there could be no doubt. An older spectator might have looked far ahead, and thought of the question of pounds, shillings, and pence. Where was the necessary income for a marriage to come from? Roger had his fellowship now, it is true, but the income of that would be lost if he married. He had no profession, and the life interest of the two or three thousand pounds that he inherited from his mother belonged to his father. This older spectator might have been a little surprised at the empressement of Mrs. Gibson's manner to a younger son, always supposing this said spectator to have read to the depths of her worldly heart. Never has she tried to be more agreeable to Osborne, and though her attempt was a great failure when practised upon Roger, and he did not know what to say in reply to the delicate flatteries which he felt to be insincere, he saw that she intended him to consider himself henceforward free of the house, and he was too glad to avail himself of this privilege to examine over closely into what might be her motives for her change of manner. He shut his eyes, and chose to believe that she was now desirous of making up for her little burst of temper on his previous visit. The result of Osborne's conference with the two doctors had been certain prescriptions which appeared to have done him much good, and which in all probability would have done him yet more could he have been free of the recollection of the little patient wife in her solitude near Winchester. He went to her whenever he could, and thanks to Roger, money was far more plentiful with him now than it had been. But he still shrank, and perhaps even more and more from telling his father of his marriage. Some bodily instinct made him dread all agitation inexpressibly. If he had not had this money from Roger, he might have been compelled to tell his father all, and to ask for the necessary funds to provide for the wife and the coming child. But with enough in hand, and a secret though remorseful conviction that as long as Roger had a penny his brother was sure to have half of it, made him more reluctant than ever to irritate his father by a revelation of his secret. "'Not just yet, not just at present he kept saying both to Roger and to himself. "'By and by, if we have a boy, I will call it Roger.' And then visions of poetical and romantic reconciliations brought about between father and son, through the medium of a child, the offspring of a forbidden marriage, became still more vividly possible to him, and at any rate it was a staving off of an unpleasant thing. He atoned to himself for taking so much of Roger's fellowship money, by reflecting that, if Roger married, he would lose this source of revenue. Yet Osborne was throwing no impediment in the way of this event, rather forwarding it by promoting every possible means of his brother's seeing the lady of his love. Osborne ended his reflections by convincing himself of his own generosity. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 Old Ways and New Ways Mr. Preston was now installed in his new house at Hollingford, Mr. Sheepshanks having entered into dignified idleness at the house of his married daughter, who lived in the county town. His successor had plunged with energy into all manner of improvements, and among others he fell to draining a piece of outlying waste and unreclaimed land of Lord Cumnor's, which was close to Squire Hamley's property that very piece for which he had had the government grant, but which now lay neglected, and only half-drained, with stacks of mossy tiles, and lines of upturned furrows telling of abortive plans. It was not often that the squire rode in this direction nowadays, but the cottage of a man who had been the squire's gamekeeper in those more prosperous days when the Hamleys could afford to preserve, was close to the rush-grown ground. This old servant and tenant was ill and had sent a message up to the hall, asking to see the squire. 
not to reveal any secret or to say anything particular, but only from the feudal loyalty, which made it seem to the dying man as if it would be a comfort to shake the hand and look once more into the eyes of the lord and master whom he had served, and whose ancestors his own forebears had served for so many generations. And the squire was as fully alive as old Silas to the claims of the tie that existed between them. Though he hated the thought, and still more should hate the sight of the piece of land on the side of which Silas's cottage stood, the squire ordered his horse and rode off within half an hour of receiving the message. As he drew near the spot he thought he heard the sound of tools and the hum of many voices, just as he used to hear them a year or two before. He listened with surprise. Yes, instead of the still solitude he had expected, there was the clink of iron, the heavy gradual thud of the fall of barrows full of soil, the cry and shout of labourers. But not on his land, better worth expense and trouble by far than the reedy clay common on which the men were in fact employed. He knew it was Lord Cumnor's property, and he knew Lord Cumnor and his family had gone up in the world. The Whig rascals! Both in wealth and in station, as the Hamleys had gone down. But all the same, in spite of long-known facts and in spite of reason, the squire's ready anger rose high at the sight of his neighbour doing what he had been unable to do, and he a Whig, and his family only in the county since Queen Anne's time. He went so far as to wonder whether they might not, the labourers he meant, avail themselves of his tiles, lying so conveniently to hand. All those regrets, thoughts and wonders were in his mind as he rode up to the cottage he was bound to, and gave his horse in charge to a little lad, who had hitherto found his morning's business and amusement, in playing at houses with the still younger sister, and some of the squire's neglected tiles. But he was old Silas's grandson, and he might have battered the rude red earthenware to pieces, a whole stack, one by one, and the squire would have said little or nothing. It was only that he would not spare one to a labourer of Lord Cumnor's. No, not one. Old Silas lay in a sort of closet, opening out of the family living-room. The small window that gave it light looked right on to the moor, as it was called, and by day the check curtain was drawn aside so that he might watch the progress of the labour. Everything about the old man was clean, if coarse, and with death, the leveller so close at hand, it was the labourer who made the first advances, and put out his horny hand to the squire. "'I thought you'd come, squire. Your father came for to see my father as he lay a-dying.' "'Come, come, my man,' said the squire, easily affected as he always was. "'Don't talk of dying. We shall soon have you out, never fear. They've sent you up some soup from the hall as I bade em, haven't they?' "'Aye, aye. I've had all as I could want for to eat and drink. The young squire and Master Roger was here yesterday.' "'Yes, I know. But I'm a deal nearer heaven to-day, I am. I should like you to look after the covers in the West Spinney, squire. Them gorse, you know, where the old fox had a hole. Her as give him so many a run. You'll mind it, squire, though you was but a lad. I could laugh to think on her tricks yet." And with a weak attempt at a laugh he got himself into a violent fit of coughing, which alarmed the squire, who thought he would never get his breath again. His daughter-in-law came in at the sound, and told the squire that he had these coughing bouts very frequently, and that she thought he would go off in one of them before long. This opinion of hers was spoken simply out before the old man, who now lay gasping and exhausted upon his pillow. Poor people acknowledge the inevitableness and the approach of death in a much more straightforward manner than is customary among more educated folk. The squire was shocked at her hard-heartedness, as he considered it but the old man himself had received much tender kindness from his daughter-in-law, and what she had just said was no more news to him than the fact that the sun would rise to-morrow. He was more anxious to go on with his story. "'Them navvies! I call em navvies because some on em is strangers, though some on em is the men as was turned off your own work, squire, when there came orders to stop em last fall. They're a pullin' up gorse and brush to light their fire for warming up their messes. It's a long way off to their homes, and they mostly dine here, and there'll be nothing of a cover left if you don't see after em. I thought I should like to tell ye afore I died. Parson's been here, but I didna tell him. 
He's all for the Earl's folk, and he'd a not heed it. It's the Earl as put him into his church, I reckon, for he said what a fine thing it were to see so much employment to given to the poor, and he never said naught of the sort when your works were a gate, squire." This long speech had been interrupted by many a cough and gasp for breath, and having delivered himself of what was on his mind, he turned his face to the wall, and appeared to be going to sleep. Presently he roused himself with a start. "'I know I flogged him well, I did. But he were after pheasant's eggs, and I didn't know he were an orphan. Lord, forgive me!' "'He's thinking on David Morton, the cripple, as used to go about trapping vermin,' whispered the woman. "'Why, he died long ago, twenty year, I should think,' replied the squire. Ay, but when Grandfather goes off of this way to sleep after a bout of talking, he seems to be dreaming on old times. He'll not waken up yet, sir. You'd best sit down if you'd like to stay," she continued, as she went into the house-place and dusted a chair with her apron. He was very particular in bidding me wake him if he were asleep, and you or Mr. Roger was to call. Mr. Roger said he'd be coming again this morning, but he'll likely sleep an hour or more if he's let alone. I wish I'd said good-bye. I should like to have done that." "'He drops off so sudden,' said the woman. "'But you'd be better pleased to have said it, squire. I'll waken him up a bit.' "'No, no,' the squire called out as the woman was going to be as good as her word. "'I'll come again, perhaps to-morrow, and tell him I was sorry, for I am indeed. And be sure and send to the hall for anything you want. Mr. Roger is coming, is he? He'll bring me word how he is later on. I should like to have bidden him good-bye." So, giving sixpence to the child who had held his horse, the squire mounted. He sat still a moment looking at the busy work going on before him, and then at his own half-completed drainage. It was a bitter pill. He had objected to borrowing from government, in the first instance, and then his wife had persuaded him to the step, and after it was once taken, he was as proud as could be of the only concession to the spirit of progress he ever made in his life. He had read and studied the subject pretty thoroughly, if also very slowly, during the time his wife had been influencing him. He was tolerably well up in agriculture, if in nothing else, and at one time he had taken the lead among the neighbouring landowners when he first began tile drainage. In those days people used to speak of Squire Hamley's hobby, and at market ordinaries or county dinners they rather dreaded setting him off on long repetitions of arguments from the different pamphlets on the subject which he had read. And now the proprietors all around him were draining, draining. His interest to government was running on all the same, though his works were stopped, and his tiles deteriorating in value. It was not a soothing consideration, and the squire was almost ready to quarrel with his shadow. He wanted a vent for his ill-humour, and suddenly remembering the devastations on his covers, which he had heard about not a quarter of an hour before, he rode towards the men busy at work on Lord Cumnor's land. Just before he got up to them he encountered Mr. Preston, also on horseback, come to overlook his labourers. The squire did not know him personally, but from the agent's manner of speaking, and the deference that was evidently paid to him, Mr. Hamley saw that he was a responsible person. So he addressed the agent. I beg your pardon. I suppose you are the manager of these works?" Mr. Preston replied, "'Certainly. I am that, and many other things besides, at your service. I have succeeded Mr. Sheepshanks in the management of my lord's property. Mr. Hamley of Hamley, I believe." The squire bowed stiffly. He did not like his name to be asked or presumed upon in that manner. An equal might conjecture who he was or recognize him, but, till he announced himself, an inferior had no right to do more than address him respectfully as, Sir. That was the squire's code of etiquette. "'I am Mr. Hamley of Hamley. I suppose you are as yet ignorant of the boundary of Lord Cumnor's land, and so I will inform you that my property begins at the pond yonder, just where you see the rise in the ground.' "'I am perfectly acquainted with that fact, Mr. Hamley,' said Mr. Preston, a little annoyed at the ignorance attributed to him. But may I inquire why my attention is called to it just now?" The squire was beginning to boil over, but he tried to keep his temper in. The effort was very much to be respected, for it was a great one. 
There was something in the handsome and well-dressed agent's tone and manner inexpressibly irritating to the squire, and it was not lessened by an involuntary comparison of the capital roadster on which Mr. Preston was mounted with his own ill-groomed and aged cob. "'I have been told that your men out yonder do not respect these boundaries, but you are in the habit of plucking up gorse from my covers to light their fires.' "'It is possible they may,' said Mr. Preston, lifting his eyebrows, his manner more nonchalant than his words. "'I dare say they think no great harm of it. However, I'll inquire. "'Do you doubt my word, sir?' said the squire, fretting his mare until she began to dance about. "'I tell you, I've heard it only within this last half-hour.' "'I don't mean to doubt your word, Mr. Hamley. It's the last thing I should think of doing. But you must excuse my saying that the argument which you have twice brought up for the authenticity of your statement, that you have heard it within the last half-hour, is not quite so forceful as to preclude the possibility of a mistake. "'I wish you'd only say in plain language that you doubt my word,' said the squire, clenching and slightly raising his horsewhip. "'I can't make out what you mean. You use so many words.' "'Pray don't lose your temper, sir. I said I should inquire. You have not seen the men pulling up gorse yourself, or you would have named it. I surely may doubt the correctness of your information until I have made some inquiry. At any rate, that is the course I shall pursue. And if it gives you offence, I shall be sorry, but I shall do it just the same. When I am convinced that harm has been done to your property, I shall take steps to prevent it for the future. And, of course, in my lord's name, I shall pay you compensation. It may probably amount to half a crown." He added these last words in a lower tone, as if to himself, with a slight contemptuous smile on his face. "'Quiet, mare, quiet,' said the squire, totally unaware that he was the cause of her impatient movements by the way he was perpetually tightening her reins, and also, perhaps, he unconsciously addressed the injunction to himself. Neither of them saw Roger Hamley, who was just then approaching them with long, steady steps. He had seen his father from the door of old Silas's cottage, and as the poor fellow was still asleep, he was coming to speak to his father, and was near enough now to hear the next words. "'I don't know who you are, but I've known land agents who were gentlemen, and I've known some who were not. You belong to this last set, young man,' said the squire. "'That you do. I should like to try my horsewhip on you for your insolence.' "'Pray, Mr. Hamley,' replied Mr. Preston coolly. Curb your temper a little and reflect. I really feel sorry to see a man of your age in such a passion." Moving a little farther off, however, but really more with a desire to save the irritated man from carrying his threat into execution, out of a dislike to the slander and excitement it would cause, than from any personal dread. Just at this moment Roger Hamley came close up. He was panting a little, and his eyes were very stern and dark but he spoke quietly enough. "'Mr. Preston, I can hardly understand what you mean by your last words. But remember, my father is a gentleman of an age and position, and not accustomed to receive advice as to the management of his temper from young men like you.' "'I desired him to keep his men off my land,' said the squire to his son, his wish to stand well in Roger's opinion restraining his temper a little, but though his words might be a little calmer, there were all other signs of passion present, the discoloured complexion, the trembling hands, the fiery cloud in his eyes. "'He refused and doubted my word.' Mr. Preston turned to Roger, as if appealing from Philip drunk to Philip sober, and spoke in a tone of cool explanation, which, though not insolent in words, was excessively irritating in manner. "'Your father has misunderstood me. Perhaps it is no wonder.' trying to convey by a look of intelligence at the son his opinion that the father was in no state to hear reason. "'I never refused to do what was just and right. I only required further evidence as to the past wrong-doing. Your father took offence at this.' And then he shrugged his shoulders, and lifted his eyebrows in a manner he had formerly learnt in France. "'At any rate, sir, I can scarcely reconcile the manner and words to my father which I heard you use when I first came up with the deference you ought to have shown to a man of his age and position. As to the fact of the trespass, they are pulling up all the gorse, Roger. There'll be no cover whatever for game soon," put in the squire. 
Roger bowed to his father, but took up his speech at the point it was at before the interruption. "'I will inquire into it myself at a cooler moment, and if I find that such trespass or damage has been committed, of course I shall expect that you will see it put a stop to. Come, father, I am going to see old Silas. Perhaps you don't know that he is very ill.' So he endeavoured to while the squire away to prevent further words. He was not entirely successful. Mr. Preston was enraged by Roger's calm and dignified manner, and threw after them this parting shaft, in the shape of a loud soliloquy. "'Position, indeed! What are we to think of the position of a man who begins works like these without counting the cost, and comes to a standstill, and has to turn off his labourers just at the beginning of the winter, leaving—' They were too far off to hear the rest. The squire was on the point of turning back before this, but Roger took hold of the reins of the old mare, and led her over some of the boggy ground, as if to guide her into sure footing, but in reality because he was determined to prevent the renewal of the quarrel. It was well that the cob knew him, and was indeed old enough to prefer quietness to dancing, for Mr. Hamley plucked hard at the reins, and at last broke out with an oath. "'Damn it, Roger! I'm not a child. I won't be treated as such. Leave go, I say!' Roger let go. They were now on firm ground, and he did not wish any watchers to think that he was exercising any constraint over his father, and this quiet obedience to his impatient commands did more to soothe the squire than anything else could have effected just then. "'I know I turned them off. What could I do? I'd no more money for their weekly wages. It's a loss to me, as you know. He doesn't know. No one knows. But I think your mother would. How it cut me to turn them off just before winter set in! I lay awake many a night thinking of it, and I gave them what I had. I did indeed. I hadn't got money to pay him, but I had three barren cows fattened, and gave every scrap of meat to the men, and I let him go into the woods and gather what was fallen, and I winked at their breaking off old branches, and now to have it cast up against me by that cur, that servant! But I'll go on with the works, by God I will, if only to spite him. I'll show him who I am. My position, indeed! A Hamley of Hamley takes a higher position than his master. I'll go on with the work, see if I don't. I'm paying between one and two hundred a year, interest on government money. I'll raise some more if I go to the Jews. Osborne has shown me the way, and Osborne shall pay for it, he shall. I'll not put up with insults. You shouldn't have stopped me, Roger. I wish to heaven I'd horse-whipped the fellow." He was lashing himself again into an impotent rage, painful to a son to witness. But just then the little grandchild of old Silas, who had held the squire's horse during his visit to the sick man, came running up, breathless. "'Please, sir, please, squire, Mammy has sent me. Grandfather has wakened up sudden, and Mammy says he's dying, and would you please come? She says he'd take it as a kind compliment, she's sure.' So they went to the cottage, the squire speaking never a word, but suddenly feeling as if lifted out of a whirlwind, and set down in a still and awful place. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 A Passive Coquette It is not to be supposed that such an encounter as Mr. Preston had just had with Roger Hamley sweetened the regards in which the two young men henceforward held each other. They had barely spoken to one another before, and but seldom met, for the land agent's employment had hitherto lain at Ashcombe, some sixteen or seventeen miles from Hamley. He was older than Roger by several years, but during the time he had been in the county, Osborne and Roger had been at school and at college. Mr. Preston was prepared to dislike the Hamleys for many unreasonable reasons. Cynthia and Marley had both spoken of the brothers with familiar regard, implying considerable intimacy. Their flowers had been preferred to his on the occasion of the ball. Most people spoke well of them and Mr. Preston had an animal's instinctive jealousy and combativeness against all popular young men. Their position, poor as the Hamleys might be, was far higher than his own in the county. And moreover he was agent to the great Whig lord whose political interests were diametrically opposed to those of the old Tory squire. Not that Lord Cumnor troubled himself much about his political interests. His family had obtained property and title from the Whigs at the time of the Hanoverian succession, and so traditionally, 
He was a Whig, and had belonged in his youth to Whig clubs, where he had lost considerable sums of money to Whig gamblers. All this was satisfactory and consistent enough, and if Lord Hollingford had not been returned for the county on the Whig interest, as his father had been before him until he had succeeded to the title, it is quite probable Lord Cumnor would have considered the British constitution in danger, and the patriotism of his ancestors ungratefully ignored. But, excepting at elections, he had no notion of making Whig and Tory a party cry. He had lived too much in London, and was of too sociable a nature, to exclude any man who jumped with his humour from the hospitality he was always ready to offer, be the agreeable acquaintance Whig, Tory, or Radical. But, in the county of which he was Lord Lieutenant, the old party distinction was still a shibboleth by which men were tested as to their fitness for social intercourse, as well as on the hustings. If by any chance a Whig found himself at a Tory dinner-table, or vice versa, the food was hard of digestion, and wine and viands were criticised rather than enjoyed. A marriage between the young people of the separate parties was almost as unheard of and prohibited an alliance as that of Romeo and Juliet's. And, of course, Mr. Preston was not a man in whose breast such prejudices would die away. They were an excitement to him, for one thing, and called out all his talent for intrigue on behalf of the party to which he was allied. Moreover, he considered it as loyalty to his employer to scatter his enemies by any means in his power. He had always hated and despised the Tories in general, and after that interview on the marshy common in front of Silas's cottage, he hated the Hamleys, and Roger especially, with a very choice and particular hatred. That prig! as hereafter he always designated Roger. He shall pay for it yet, he said to himself, by way of consolation, after the father and son had left him. What a lout it is! Watching the receding figures. The old chap has twice as much spunk! As the squire tugged at his bridle reins. The old mare could make her way better without being led, my fine fellow. But I see through your dodge. You're afraid of your old father turning back and getting into another rage. Position, indeed! A beggarly squire! A man who did turn off his men just before winter to rot or starve for all he cared! It's just like a brutal old Tory!" And, under the cover of sympathy with the dismissed labourers, Mr. Preston indulged his own private pique very pleasantly. Mr. Preston had many causes for rejoicing. He might have forgotten the discomfiture, as he chose to feel it, in the remembrance of an increase of income, and in the popularity he enjoyed in his new abode. All Hollingford came forward to do the Earl's new agent honour. Mr. Sheepshanks had been a crabbed, crusty old bachelor, frequenting inn-parlours on market-days, not unwilling to give dinners to three or four chosen friends and familiars, with whom in return he dined from time to time, and with whom also he kept up an amicable rivalry in the matter of wines. But he did not appreciate female society, as Miss Browning elegantly worded his unwillingness to accept the invitations of the Hollingford ladies. He was even unrefined enough to speak of these invitations to his intimate friends aforesaid as, "'Those old women's worrying!' But of course they never heard of this. Little quarter of sheet notes without any envelopes—that invention was unknown in those days, but sealed in the corners when folded up instead of gummed as they are fastened at present—occasionally passed between Mr. Sheepshanks and the Miss Brownings, Mrs. Goodenough, or others. From the first mentioned ladies the form ran as follows. Miss Browning and her sister, Miss Phoebe Browning, present their respectful compliments to Mr. Sheepshanks, and beg to inform him that a few friends have kindly consented to favour them with their company at tea on Thursday next. Miss Browning and Miss Phoebe will take it very kindly if Mr. Sheepshanks will join their little circle. Now for Mrs. Goodenough. Mrs. Goodenough's respects to Mr. Sheepshanks, and hopes he is in good health. She would be very glad if he would favour her with his company on tea on Monday. My daughter in Combermere has sent me a couple of guinea fowls, and Mrs. Goodenough hopes Mr. Sheepshanks will stay and take a bit of supper." No need for the dates of the days of the month. The good ladies would have thought that the world was coming to an end if the invitation had been sent out a week before the party therein named. 
but not even guinea-fowls for supper could tempt Mr. Sheepshanks. He remembered the made wines he had tasted in former days at Hollingford parties, and shuddered. Bread and cheese with a glass of bitter beer, or a little brandy and water, partaken of in his old clothes, which had worn into shapes of loose comfort, and smelt strongly of tobacco, he liked better than roast guinea-fowl and birch-wine, even without throwing into the balance the stiff uneasy coat, and the tight neckcloth and tighter shoes. So the ex-agent had been seldom, if ever, seen at the Hollingford tea-parties. He might have had his form of refusal stereotyped, it was so invariably the shame. "'Mr. Sheepshank's duty to Miss Browning and her sister—to Mrs. Goodenough or to others, as the case might be. Business of importance prevents him from availing himself of their polite invitation, for which he begs to return his best thanks.' But now that Mr. Preston had succeeded and come to live in Hollingford, things were changed. He accepted every civility right and left, and won golden opinions accordingly. Parties were made in his honour. "'Just as if he had been a bride!' Miss Phoebe Browning said, and to all of them he went. "'What's the man after?' said Mr. Sheepshanks to himself, when he heard of his successor's affability and sociability and amiability, and a variety of other agreeable illities, from the friends whom the old steward still retained at Hollingford. "'Preston's not a man to put himself out for nothing. He's deep. He'll be after something solider than popularity.' The sagacious old bachelor was right. Mr. Preston was after something more than mere popularity. He went whenever he had a chance of meeting Cynthia Kirkpatrick. It might be that Molly's spirits were more depressed at this time than they were in general, or that Cynthia was exultant unawares to herself in the amount of attention and admiration she was receiving from Roger by day, from Mr. Preston in the evening, but the two girls seemed to have parted company in cheerfulness. Molly was always gentle, but very grave and silent. Cynthia, on the contrary, was merry, full of pretty mockeries, and hardly ever silent. When first she came to Hollingford one of her great charms had been that she was such a gracious listener. Now her excitement, by whatever caused, made her too restless to hold her tongue. Yet what she said was too pretty, too witty, not to be a winning and sparkling interruption, eagerly welcomed by those who were under her sway. Mr. Gibson was the only one who observed this change and reasoned upon it. "'She's in a mental fever of some kind,' thought he to himself. "'She's very fascinating, but I don't quite understand her.' If Molly had not been so entirely loyal to her friend, she might have thought this constant brilliancy a little tiresome when brought into everyday life. It was not the sunshiny rest of a placid lake. It was rather the glitter of the pieces of a broken mirror, which confuses and bewilders. Cynthia would not talk quietly about anything now. Subjects of thought or conversation seemed to have lost their relative value. There were exceptions to this mood of hers, when she sank into deep fits of silence, that would have been gloomy had it not been for the never-varying sweetness of her temper. If there was a little kindness to be done to either Mr. Gibson or Molly, Cynthia was just as ready as ever to do it, nor did she refuse to do anything her mother wished, however fidgety might be the humour that prompted the wish. But in this latter case Cynthia's eyes were not quickened by her heart. Molly was dejected, she knew not why. Cynthia had drifted a little apart, that was not it. Her stepmother had whimsical moods, and if Cynthia displeased her, she would oppress Molly with small kindnesses and pseudo-affection. Or else everything was wrong, the world was out of joint, and Molly had failed in her mission to set it right, and was to be blamed accordingly. But Molly was of too steady a disposition to be much moved by the changeableness of an unreasonable person. She might be annoyed or irritated, but she was not depressed. That was not it. The real cause was certainly this. As long as Roger was drawn to Cynthia, and sought her of his own accord, it had been a sore pain and bewilderment to Molly's heart. But it was a straightforward attraction, and one which Molly acknowledged, in her humility and great power of loving, to be the most natural thing in the world. She would look at Cynthia's beauty and grace, and feel as if no one could resist it. 
and when she witnessed all the small signs of honest devotion which Roger was at no pains to conceal, she thought with a sigh that surely no girl could help relinquishing her heart to such tender, strong keeping as Roger's character ensured. She would have been willing to cut off her right hand, if need were, to forward his attachment to Cynthia, and the self-sacrifice would have added a strange zest to a happy crisis. She was indignant at what she considered to be Mrs. Gibson's obtuseness to so much goodness and worth, and when she called Roger a country lout, or any other depreciative epithet, Molly would pinch herself in order to keep silent. But after all those were peaceful days compared to the present, when she, seeing the wrong side of the tapestry, after the wont of those who dwell in the same house with a plotter, became aware that Mrs. Gibson had totally changed her behaviour to Roger, from some cause unknown to Molly. But he was always exactly the same. "'Steady as old time,' as Mrs. Gibson called him, with her usual originality. "'A rock of strength, under whose very shadow there is rest,' as Mrs. Hamley had once spoken of him. So the cause of Mrs. Gibson's altered manner lay not in him. Yet now he was sure of a welcome, let him come at any hour he would. He was playfully reproved for having taken Mrs. Gibson's words too literally, and for never coming before lunch. But he said he considered her reasons for such words to be valid, and should respect them. And this was done out of his simplicity, and from no tinge of malice. Then in their family conversations at home Mrs. Gibson was constantly making projects for throwing Roger and Cynthia together, with so evident a betrayal of her wish to bring about an engagement, that Molly chafed at the net spread so evidently, and at Roger's blindness in coming so willingly to be entrapped. She forgot his previous willingness, his former evidences of manly fondness for the beautiful Cynthia. She only saw plots of which he was the victim, and Cynthia the conscious, if passive, bait. She felt as if she could not have acted as Cynthia did, no, not even to gain Roger's love. Cynthia heard and saw as much of the domestic background as she did, and yet she submitted to the role assigned to her. To be sure this role would have been played by her unconsciously, the things prescribed were what she would naturally have done, but because they were prescribed, by implication only, it is true, Molly would have resisted. Have gone out, for instance, when she was expected to stay at home, or have lingered in the garden when a long country walk was planned. At last, for she could not help loving Cynthia come what would, she determined to believe that Cynthia was entirely unaware of all, but it was with an effort that she brought herself to believe it. It may be all very pleasant to sport with Amaryllis in the shade, or with the tangles of Neria's hair, but young men at the outset of their independent life have many other cares in this prosaic England to occupy their time and their thoughts. Roger was fellow of Trinity, to be sure, and from the outside it certainly appeared as if his position, as long as he chose to keep unmarried, was a very easy one. His was not a nature, however, to sink down into inglorious ease, even had his fellowship income been at his disposal. He looked forward to an active life, in what direction he had not yet determined. He knew what were his talents and his tastes, and did not wish the former to lie buried, nor the latter, which he regarded as gifts, fitting him for some peculiar work, to be disregarded or thwarted. He rather liked awaiting an object, secure in his own energy to force his way to it, when once he saw it clearly. He reserved enough of money for his own personal needs, which were small, and for the ready furtherance of any project he might see fit to undertake. The rest of his income was Osborne's, given and accepted in the spirit which made the bond between these two brothers so rarely perfect. It was only the thought of Cynthia that threw Roger off his balance. A strong man in everything else, about her he was as a child. He knew that he could not marry and retain his fellowship. His intention was to hold himself loose from any employment or profession until he had found one to his mind, so there was no immediate prospect, no prospect for many years, indeed, that he would be able to marry. Yet he went on seeking Cynthia's sweet company, listening to the music of her voice, basking in her sunshine, and feeding his passion in every possible way, just like an unreasoning child. He knew that it was folly, and yet he did it and it was perhaps this that made him so sympathetic with Osborne. 
Roger racked his brains about Osborne's affairs much more frequently than Osborne troubled himself. Indeed, he had become so ailing and languid of late that even the squire made only very faint objections to his desire for frequent change of scene, though formerly he used to grumble so much at the necessary expenditure it involved. "'After all, it doesn't cost much,' the squire said to Roger one day. "'Choose how he does it, he does it cheaply. He used to come and ask me for twenty, where now he does it for five. But he and I have lost each other's language, that's what we have. And my dictionary—' only he called it Dictionary, has got all wrong because of those confounded debts, which he will never explain to me or talk about. He always holds me off at arm's length when I begin upon it. He does, Roger. Me, his old dad, as was his primest favourite of all when he was a little bit of a chap." The squire dwelt so much upon Osborne's reserved behaviour to himself, that brooding over this one subject perpetually he became much more morose and gloomy than ever in his manner to Osborne resenting the want of the confidence and affection that he thus repelled. So much so that Roger, who desired to avoid being made the receptacle of his father's complaints against Osborne, and Roger's passive listening was the sedative his father always sought, had often to have recourse to the discussion of the drainage works as a counter-irritant. The squire had felt Mr. Preston's speech about the dismissal of his workpeople very keenly. It fell in with the reproaches of his own conscience though, as he would repeat to Roger over and over again, "'I couldn't help it. How could I? I was drained dry of ready money. I wish the land was drained as dry as I am,' said he, with a touch of humour that came out before he was aware, and at which he smiled sadly enough. "'What was I to do, I ask you, Roger? I know I was in a rage. I've had a deal to make me so. And maybe I didn't think as much about consequences as I should have done when I gave orders for him to be sent off but I couldn't have done otherwise if I'd a thought for a twelve-month for cool blood. Consequences! I hate consequences. They've always been against me, they have. I'm so tied up I can't cut down a stick more. And that's a consequence of having the property so deuced well settled. I wish I'd never had any ancestors. I laugh, lad. It does me good to see thee laugh a bit after Osborne's long face, which always grows longer at sight of me. "'Look here, father,' said Roger, suddenly. "'I'll manage somehow about the money for the works. You trust to me. Give me two months to turn myself in, and you shall have some money at any rate to begin with.' The squire looked at him, and his face brightened as a child's does at the promise of a pleasure made to him by some one on whom he can rely. He became a little graver, however, as he said, "'But how will you get it? It's hard enough work.' "'Never mind. I'll get it. A hundred or so at first. I don't yet know how. But remember, father, I'm a senior wrangler, and a very promising young writer, as that review called me. Oh, you don't know what a fine fellow you've got for a son. You should have read that review to know all my wonderful merits. I did, Roger. I heard Gibson speaking of it, and I made him get it for me. I should have understood it better if they could have called the animals by their English names, and not put so much of their French jingo into it. "'But it was an answer to an article by a French writer,' pleaded Roger. "'I had to let him alone,' said the squire earnestly. "'We had to beat him, and we did it at Waterloo. But I'd not demean myself by answering any of their lies, if I was you. But I got through the review for all their Latin and French. I did. And if you doubt me, you just look at the end of the great ledger, turn it upside down, and you'll find I've copied out all the fine words they said of you. Careful observer! strong, nervous English, rising philosopher. Oh, I can nearly say it all off my heart, for many a time when I'm frabbed by bad debts, or Osborne's bills, or moidered with accounts, I turn the ledger the wrong way up and smoke a pipe over it, while I read those pieces out of the review which speak about you, lad. End of chapter 31「Chapter 32 Coming events. Roger had turned over many plans in his mind, by which he thought that he could obtain sufficient money for the purpose he desired to accomplish. His careful grandfather, who had been a merchant in the city, had so tied up the few thousands he had left to his daughter, that although in the case of her death before her husband's the latter might enjoy the life interest thereof, yet in the case of both their deaths, their second son did not succeed to the property until he was five-and-twenty, 
and if he died before that age, the money that would then have been his went to one of his cousins on the maternal side. In short, the old merchant had taken as many precautions about his legacy as if it had been for tens instead of units of thousands. Of course, Roger might have slipped through all these meshes by insuring his life until the specified age, and probably, if he had consulted any lawyer, this course would have been suggested to him. But he disliked taking any one into his confidence on the subject of his father's want of ready money. He had obtained a copy of his grandfather's will at Doctors' Commons, and he imagined that all the contingencies involved in it would be patent to the light of nature and common sense. He was a little mistaken in this, but not the less resolved that money in some way he would have in order to fulfil his promise to his father, and for the ulterior purpose of giving the squire some daily interest to distract his thoughts from the regrets and cares that were almost weakening his mind. It was Roger Hamley, senior wrangler and fellow of Trinity to the highest bidder, no matter what honest employment. And presently it came down to any bidder at all. Another perplexity and distress at this time weighed upon Roger. Osborne, heir to the estate, was going to have a child. The Hamley property was entailed on heirs male-born in lawful wedlock. Was the wedlock lawful? Osborne never seemed to doubt that it was never seemed, in fact, to think twice about it. And if he, the husband, did not, how much less did M. A., the trustful wife? Yet who could tell how much misery any shadows of illegality might cast into the future? One evening Roger, sitting by the languid, careless, dilettante Osborne, began to question him as to the details of the marriage. Osborne knew instinctively at what Roger was aiming. It was not that he did not desire perfect legality and justice to his wife, it was that he was so indisposed at the time that he hated to be bothered. It was something like the refrain of Gray's Scandinavian prophetess, Leave me, leave me to repose. But do try and tell me how you managed it. How tiresome you are, Roger! put in Osborne. Well, I dare say I am. Go on. I've told you, Morrison married us. You remember old Morrison at Trinity? "'Yes, as good and blunder-headed a fellow as ever lived.' "'Well, he's taken orders, and the examination for priest's orders fatigued him so much that he got his father to give him a hundred or two for a tour on the continent. He meant to get to Rome, because he heard that there were such pleasant winters there. So he turned up at Metz in August.' "'I don't see why.' "'No more did he. He never was great in geography, you know, and somehow he thought that Metz, pronounced French fashion, must be on the road to Rome. Some one had told him so in fun. However, it was very well for me that I met with him there, for I was determined to be married, and that without loss of time. But M.A. is a Catholic. That's true, but you see I am not. You don't suppose I would do her any wrong, Roger? asked Osborne, sitting up in his lounging chair, and speaking rather indignantly to Roger, his face suddenly flushing red. No, I am sure you would not mean it. But you see there's a child coming and this estate is entailed on heirs male. Now I want to know if the marriage is legal or not, and it seems to me it's a ticklish question." "'Oh,' said Osborne, falling back into repose, "'if that's all, I suppose you're next heir male, and I can trust you as I can myself. You know my marriage is bona fide in intention, and I believe it to be legal in fact. We went over to Strasbourg, M.A. picked up a friend, a good middle-aged Frenchwoman, who served half his bridesmaid, half his chaperone, and then we went before the mayor, préfet, what do you call them? I think Morrison rather enjoyed the spree. I signed all manner of papers in the prefecture. I did not read them over, for fear lest I could not sign them conscientiously. It was the safest plan. M.A. kept trembling, so I thought she would faint. And then we were off to the nearest English chaplaincy, Karlsruhe and the chaplain was away, so Morrison easily got the loan of the chapel, and we were married the next day." "'But surely some registration or certificate was necessary. Morrison said he would undertake all those forms, and he ought to know his own business. I know I tipped him pretty well for the job." "'You must be married again,' said Roger, after a pause, and before the child is born. Have you got a certificate of the marriage?" "'I dare say Morrison has got it somewhere. But I believe I'm legally married according to the laws both of England and France. I really do, old fellow. I've got the préfet's papers somewhere." 
Never mind. You shall be married again in England. Emma goes to the Roman Catholic chapel at Preston, doesn't she? Yes. She is so good I wouldn't disturb her in her religion for the world. Then you shall be married both there and at the church of the parish in which she lives as well," said Roger decidedly. It's a great deal of trouble, unnecessary trouble, and unnecessary expense, I should say," said Osborne. Why can't you leave well alone? Neither Emma nor I are of the sort of stuff to turn scoundrels and deny the legality of our marriage, and if the child is a boy and my father dies and I die, why, I'm sure you'll do him justice, as sure as I am of myself, old fellow. But if I die into the bargain, make a hecatomb of the present Hamleys all at once while you're at it. Who succeeds as heir male? Osborne thought for a moment. One of the Irish Hamleys, I suppose. I fancy they are needy chaps. Perhaps you're right. But what need to have such gloomy forebodings? The law makes one have foresight in such affairs," said Roger. So I'll go down to M.A. next week when I'm in town, and I'll make all necessary arrangements before you come. I think you'll be happier if it is all done. I shall be happier if I've a chance of seeing the little woman, that I grant you. But what is taking you up to town? I wish I'd money to run about like you instead of being shut up for ever in this dull old house." Osborne was apt occasionally to contrast his position with Roger's in a tone of complaint, forgetting that both were the results of character, and also that out of his income Roger gave up so large a portion for the maintenance of his brother's wife. But if this ungenerous thought of Osborne's had been set clearly before his conscience, he would have smote his breast and cried mea culpa with the best of them. It was only that he was too indolent to keep an unassisted conscience. "'I shouldn't have thought of going up,' said Roger, reddening as if he had been accused of spending another's money instead of his own. "'If I hadn't had to go up on business. Lord Hollingford has written for me. He knows my great wish for employment, and has heard of something which he considers suitable. There's his letter, if you care to read it. But it does not tell anything definitely.' Osborne read the letter and returned it to Roger. After a moment or two of silence, he said, "'Why do you want money? Are we taking too much from you? It's a great shame of me, but what can I do? Only suggest a career for me, and I'll follow it to-morrow.' He spoke as if Roger had been reproaching him. "'My dear fellow, don't get those notions into your head. I must do something for myself sometimes, and I've been on the lookout. Besides, I want my father to go on with his drainage. It would do good both to his health and his spirits. If I can advance any part of the money requisite, he and you shall pay me interest until you can return the capital." "'Roger, you're the providence of the family!' exclaimed Osborne, suddenly struck by admiration at his brother's conduct, and forgetting to contrast it with his own. So Roger went up to London and Osborne followed him, and for two or three weeks the Gibsons saw nothing of the brothers. But as wave succeeds to wave, so interest succeeds to interest. The family, as they were called, came down for their autumn sojourn at the Towers, and again the house was full of visitors, and the Towers servants and carriages and liveries were seen in the two streets of Hollingford, just as they might have been seen for scores of autumns past. So runs the round of life from day to day. Mrs. Gibson found the chances of intercourse with the Towers rather more personally exciting than Roger's visits, or the rarer calls of Osborne Hamley. Cynthia had an old antipathy to the great family who had made so much of her mother and so little of her, and whom she considered as in some measure the cause why she had seen so little of her mother in the days when the little girl had craved for love and found none. Moreover, Cynthia missed her slave, although she did not care for Roger one thousandth part of what he did for her, yet she had found it not unpleasant to have a man whom she thoroughly respected, and whom men in general respected, the subject of her eye the glad ministrant to each scarce-spoken wish, a person in whose sight all her words were pearls or diamonds, all her actions heavenly graciousness, and in whose thoughts she reigned supreme. She had no modest unconsciousness about her, and yet she was not vain. She knew of all this worship, and when from circumstances she no longer received it, she missed it. The Earl and Countess, Lord Hollingford and Lady Harriet, lords and ladies in general, liveries, dresses, bags of game, and rumours of riding-parties, were as nothing to her compared to Roger's absence. And yet she did not love him. No, she did not love him. 
Molly knew that Cynthia did not love him. Molly grew angry with her many and many a time as the conviction of this fact was forced upon her. Molly did not know her own feelings. Roger had no overwhelming interest in what they might be, while his very life-breath seemed to depend on what Cynthia felt and thought. Therefore Molly had keen insight into her sister's heart, and she knew that Cynthia did not love Roger. Molly could have cried with passionate regret at the thought of the unvalued treasure lying at Cynthia's feet, and it would have been merely an unselfish regret. It was the old, fervid tenderness. Do not wish for the moon, O oh my darling, for I cannot give it thee. Cynthia's love was the moon Roger yearned for, and Molly saw that it was far away and out of reach, else she would have strained her heart-cords to give it to Roger. "'I am his sister,' she would say to herself. "'That old bond is not done away with, though he is too much absorbed by Cynthia to speak about it just now. His mother called me Fanny. It was almost like an adoption. I must wait and watch, and see if I can do anything for my brother.' One day Lady Harriet came to call on the Gibsons, or rather on Mrs. Gibson, for the latter retained her old jealousy if any one else in Hollingford was supposed to be on intimate terms at the great house, or in the least acquainted with their plans. Mr. Gibson might possibly know as much, but then he was professionally bound to secrecy. Out of the house she considered Mr. Preston as her rival, and he was aware that she did so, and delighted in teasing her by affecting a knowledge of family plans and details of affairs of which she was ignorant. Indoors she was jealous of the fancy Lady Harriet had evidently taken for her stepdaughter, and she contrived to place quiet obstacles in the way of a too frequent intercourse between the two. These obstacles were not unlike the shield of the knight in the old story, only instead of the two sides presented to the two travellers approaching it from opposite quarters, one of which was silver and one of which was gold, Lady Harriet saw the smooth and shining yellow radiance, while poor Molly only perceived a dull and heavy lead. To Lady Harriet it was, "'Molly is gone out. She will be so sorry to miss you, but she was obliged to go to see some old friends of her mother's, whom she ought not to neglect. As I said to her, constancy is everything. It is stern, I think, you says, thine own and thy mother's friends forsake not. But, dear Lady Harriet, you'll stop till she comes home, won't you? I know how fond you are of her. In fact," with a little surface playfulness, I sometimes say you come more to see her than your poor old Clare. To Molly it had previously been, Lady Harriet is coming here this morning. I can't have any one else coming in. Tell Maria to say I'm not at home. Lady Harriet has always so much to tell me. Dear Lady Harriet, I've known all her secrets since she was twelve years old. You two girls must keep out of the way. Of course she'll ask for you after common civility, but she would only interrupt us if you came in as you did the other day," now addressing Molly. I hardly like to say so, but I thought it was very forward. "'Maria told me she had asked for me,' put in Molly simply. "'Very forward indeed,' continued Mrs. Gibson, taking no further notice of the interruption, except to strengthen the words to which Molly's little speech had been intended as a correction. I think this time I must secure her ladyship from the chances of such an intrusion, by taking care that you are out of the house, Molly. You had better go to the Holly Farm, and speak about those damsons I ordered, and which have never been sent." "'I'll go,' said Cynthia. "'It's far too long a walk for Molly. She's had a bad cold, and isn't as strong as she was a fortnight ago. I delight in long walks. If you want Molly out of the way, Mamma, send her to the Miss Brownings. They are always glad to see her." "'I never said I wanted Molly out of the way, Cynthia,' replied Mrs. Gibson. "'You always put things in such an exaggerated, I should almost say so coarse a manner. I am sure, Molly, my love, you could never have so misunderstood me. It is only on Lady Harriet's account.' "'I don't think I can walk as far as the Holly Farm. Papa could take the message. Cynthia need not go.' Well, I'm the last person in the world to tax any one's strength. I'd sooner never see Dams and Preserve again. Suppose you do go and see Miss Browning. You can pay her a nice long call. You know she likes that. And ask after Miss Phoebe's cold from me, you know. They were friends of your mother's, my dear, and I would not have you break off old friendships for the world. Constancy above everything is my motto, as you know, and the memory of the dead ought always to be cherished." "'Now, Mamma, where am I to go?' asked Cynthia. "'Though Lady Harriet doesn't care for me as much as she does for Molly—indeed, quite the contrary, I should say—yet she might ask after me. 
and I had better be safely out of the way." "'True,' said Mrs. Gibson meditatively, yet unconscious of any satire in Cynthia's speech. "'She is much less likely to ask for you, my dear. I almost think you might remain in the house, or you might go to the Holly Farm. I really do want the damsons. Or you might stay here in the dining-room, you know, so as to be ready to arrange lunch prettily, if she does take a fancy to stay for it. She is very fanciful, is dear Lady Harriet. I would not like her to think we made any difference in our meals because she stayed. Simple elegance, as I tell her, always is what we aim at. But still, you could put out the best service, and arrange some flowers, and ask Cook what there is for dinner, that she could send us for lunch, and make it look all pretty and impromptu and natural. I think you had better stay at home, Cynthia, and then you could fetch Molly from Miss Browning's in the afternoon, you know, and you two could take a walk together." After Lady Harriet was fairly gone, I understand, Mamma. Off with you, Molly, make haste, or Lady Harriet may come and ask for you as well as Mamma. I'll take care and forget where you are going to, so that no one shall learn from me where you are, and I'll answer for Mamma's loss of memory. Child, what nonsense you talk! You quite confuse me with being so silly," said Mrs. Gibson, fluttered and annoyed as she usually was with the little Pucian dart Cynthia flung at her. She had recourse to her accustomed feckless pieces of retaliation, bestowing some favour on Molly, and this did not hurt Cynthia one whit. "'Molly, darling, there's a very cold wind, though it looks so fine. You had better put on my Indian shawl, and it will look so pretty too on your grey gown, scarlet and grey. It's not everybody I would lend it to, but you're so careful." "'Thank you,' said Molly, and she left Mrs. Gibson in careless uncertainty as to whether her offer would be accepted or not. Lady Harriet was sorry to Miss Molly, as she was fond of the girl, but as she perfectly agreed with Mrs. Gibson's truism about constancy and old friends, she saw no occasion for saying any more about the affair, but sat down in a little low chair with her feet on the fender. This said fender was made of bright steel and was strictly tabooed to all household and plebeian feet. Indeed, the position, if they assumed it, was considered low-bred and vulgar. "'That's right, dear Lady Harriet. You can't think what a pleasure it is to me to welcome you at my own fireside into my humble home.' "'Humble? Now, Clare, that's a bit of nonsense, begging your pardon. I don't call this pretty little drawing-room a bit of a humble home. It's as full of comforts and of pretty things, too, as any room of its size can be. Oh, how small you must feel it! Even I had to reconcile myself to it at first. Well, perhaps your schoolroom was larger, but I remember how bare it was, how empty of anything but deal tables and forms and mats. Oh, indeed, Clare, I quite agree with Mamma, who always said you have done very well for yourself, and Mr. Gibson, too. What an agreeable, well-informed man!" Yes, he is said his wife slowly, as if she did not like to relinquish her role of a victim to circumstances quite immediately. "'He is very agreeable, very. Only we see so little of him. And, of course, he comes home tired and hungry, and not inclined to talk to his own family, and apt to go to sleep.' "'Come, come,' said Lady Harriet. "'I'm going to have my turn now. We've had the complaint of a doctor's wife, now hear the moans of a peer's daughter. Our house is so overrun with visitors, and literally to-day I have come to you for a little solitude." "'Solitude!' exclaimed Mrs. Gibson. "'Would you rather be alone?' slightly aggrieved. "'No, you dear silly woman! My solitude requires a listener, to whom I may say, how sweet is solitude! But I am tired of the responsibility of entertaining. Papa is so open-hearted, he asks every friend he meets with to come and pay us a visit. Mamma is really a great invalid, but she does not choose to give up her reputation for good health, having always considered illness a want of self-control. So she gets wearied and worried by a crowd of people, who are all of them open-mouthed for amusement of some kind, just like a brood of fledglings in a nest. So I have to be parent-bird, and pop morsels into their yellow leathery bills, to find them swallowed down before I can think of where to find the next. Oh, it's entertaining in the largest, literalist, dreariest sense of the word. So I have told a few lies this morning, and come off here for quietness and the comfort of complaining." Lady Harriet threw herself back in her chair and yawned. Mrs. Gibson took one of her ladyship's hands in a soft, sympathising manner, and murmured, "'Poor Lady Harriet!' and then she purred affectionately. 
After a pause Lady Harriet started up and said, "'I used to take you as my arbiter of morals when I was a little girl. Tell me, do you think it wrong to tell lies?' "'Oh, my dear, how can you ask such questions? Of course it is very wrong, very wicked indeed, I think I may say. But I know you were only joking when you said you had told lies.' "'No, indeed I wasn't. I told as plump fat lies as you would wish to hear. I said I was obliged to go into Hollingford on business, when the truth was that there was no obligation in the matter, only an insupportable desire of being free from my visitors for an hour or two, and my only business was to come here and yawn and complain, and lounge at my leisure. I really think I am unhappy at having told a story, as children express it.' "'But, my dear Lady Harriet,' said Mrs. Gibson, a little puzzled as to the exact meaning of the words that were trembling on her tongue. "'I am sure you thought that you meant what you said when you said it?' "'No, I didn't,' put in Lady Harriet. "'And, besides, if you didn't, it was the fault of the tiresome people who drove you into such straits. Yes, it was certainly their fault, not yours. And then you know the conventions of society. Ah, what trammels they are!' Lady Harriet was silent for a minute or two. Then she said, "'Tell me, Clare, you've told lies sometimes, haven't you?' "'Lady Harriet, I think you might have known me better, but I know you don't mean it, dear.' "'Yes, I do. You must have told white lies at any rate. How did you feel after them?' "'I should have been miserable if I ever had. I should have died of self-reproach. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, has always seemed to me such a fine passage. But then I have so much that is unbending in my nature, and in our sphere of life there are so few temptations. If we are humble, we are also simple, and unshackled by etiquette. Then you blame me very much. If somebody else will blame me, I shan't be so unhappy at what I said this morning." "'I am sure I never blamed you, not in my innermost heart, dear Lady Harriet. Blame you, indeed! That would be presumption in me." "'I think I shall set up a confessor. And it shan't be you, Clare, for you have always been too indulgent to me." After a pause she said, "'Can you give me some lunch, Clare? I don't mean to go home till three. My business will take me till then, as the people at the Towers are duly informed.' "'Certainly. I shall be delighted. But you know we are very simple in our habits.' "'Oh, I only want a little bread and butter, and perhaps a slice of cold meat. You must not give yourself any trouble, Clare. Perhaps you dine now? Let me sit down just like one of your family." "'Yes, you shall. I won't make any alteration. It will be so pleasant to have you sharing our family meal, dear Lady Harriet. But we dine late. We only lunch now. How low the fire is getting! I really am forgetting everything in the pleasure of this tête-à-tête." So she rang twice, with great distinctness, and with a long pause between the rings. Maria brought in coals. But the signal was well understood by Cynthia, as the hall of Apollo was by the servants of Lucullus. The brace of partridges that were to have been for the late dinner were instantly put down to the fire, and the prettiest china brought out, and the table decked with flowers and fruit, arranged with all Cynthia's usual dexterity and taste. So that when the meal was announced and Lady Harriet entered the room, she could not but think her hostess's apologies had been quite unnecessary, and be more and more convinced that Clare had done very well for herself. Cynthia now joined the party, pretty and elegant as she always was, but somehow she did not take Lady Harriet's fancy. She only noticed her on account of her being her mother's daughter. Her presence made the conversation more general, and Lady Harriet gave out several pieces of news none of them of any great importance to her, but as what had been talked about by the circle of visitors assembled at the Towers. "'Lord Hollingford ought to have been with us,' she said, amongst other things. "'But he is obliged, or fancies himself obliged, which is all the same thing, to stay in town about this Crichton legacy.' "'A legacy? To Lord Hollingford? I am so glad.' "'Don't be in a hurry to be glad. It's nothing for him but trouble.' Didn't you hear of that rich eccentric Mr. Crichton, who died some time ago, and fired by the example of Lord Bridgewater, I suppose, left a sum of money in the hands of trustees, of whom my brother is one, to send out a man with a thousand fine qualifications, to make a scientific voyage with a view to bringing back specimens of the fauna of distant lands, and so forming the nucleus of a museum, which is to be called the Crichton Museum, and so perpetuate the founder's name? Such various forms does man's vanity take! Sometimes it stimulates philanthropy, sometimes a love of science. 
"'It seems to me a very laudable and useful object, I am sure,' said Mrs. Gibson safely. "'I dare say it is, taking it from the public good view. But it's rather tiresome to us privately, for it keeps Hollingford in town, or between it and Cambridge, and each place as dull and empty as can be, just when we want him down at the Towers. The thing ought to have been decided long ago, and there's some danger of the legacy lapsing. The two other trustees have run away to the Continent, feeling, as they say, the utmost confidence in him, but in reality shirking their responsibilities. However, I believe he likes it, so I ought not to grumble. He thinks he is going to be very successful in the choice of his man, and he belongs to this county, too, young Hamley of Hamley, if he can only get his college to let him go, for he is a fellow of Trinity, senior wrangler or something, and they're not so foolish as to send their crack man to be eaten up by lions and tigers." "'It must be Roger Hamley,' exclaimed Cynthia, her eyes brightening and her cheeks flushing. "'He's not the eldest son. He can scarcely be called Hamley of Hamley,' said Mrs. Gibson. "'Hollingford's man is a fellow of Trinity, as I said before.' "'Then it is Mr. Roger Hamley,' said Cynthia, "'and he's up in London about some business. What news for Molly when she comes home?' "'Why, what has Molly to do with it?' asked Lady Harriet. "'Is—' and she looked into Mrs. Gibson's face for an answer. Mrs. Gibson gave in reply a very intelligent and expressive glance at Cynthia, who, however, did not perceive it. "'Oh, no, not at all!' and Mrs. Gibson nodded a little at her daughter, as much as to say, "'If any one, that!' Lady Harriet began to look at the pretty Miss Kirkpatrick with fresh interest. Her brother had spoken in such a manner of this young Mr. Hamley that every one connected with the phoenix was worthy of observation. Then, as if the mention of Molly's name had brought her afresh in her mind, Lady Harriet said, "'And where is Molly all this time? I should like to see my little mentor. I hear she has very much grown since those days.' "'Oh, when she once gets gossiping with the Miss Brownings, she never knows when to come home,' said Mrs. Gibson. "'The Miss Brownings?' Oh, I'm so glad you named them. I'm very fond of them. Pexy and Flapsy. I may call them so in Molly's absence. I'll go and see them before I go home. And then, perhaps, I shall see my dear little Molly, too. Do you know, Clare, I've quite taken a fancy to that girl." So Mrs. Gibson, after all her precautions, had to submit to Lady Harriet's leaving her half an hour earlier than she otherwise would have done, in order to make herself common, as Mrs. Gibson expressed it, by calling on the Miss Brownings but Molly had left before Lady Harriet arrived. Molly went the long walk to the Holly Farm, to order the damsons, out of a kind of penitence. She had felt conscious of anger at being sent out of the house by such a palpable manoeuvre as that which her stepmother had employed. Of course she did not meet Cynthia, so she went along the pretty lanes, with grassy sides and high hedge-banks, not at all in the style of modern agriculture. At first she made herself uncomfortable with questioning herself as to how far it was right to leave unnoticed the small domestic failings, the webs, the distortions of truth which had prevailed in their household ever since her father's second marriage. She knew that very often she longed to protest, but did not do it, from the desire of sparing her father any discord, and she saw by his face that he too was occasionally aware of certain things that gave him pain, as showing that his wife's standard of conduct was not as high as he would have liked. It was a wonder to Molly whether this silence was right or wrong. With a girl's want of toleration and want of experience to teach her the force of circumstances and of temptation, she had often been on the point of telling her stepmother some forcible home truths. But possibly her father's example of silence, and often some piece of kindness on Mrs. Gibson's part, for after her way and when in a good temper she was very kind to Molly, made her hold her tongue. That night at dinner Mrs. Gibson recounted the conversation between herself and Lady Harriet, giving it a very strong individual colouring, as was her wont, and telling nearly the whole of what had passed, although implying that there was a great deal said which was so purely confidential that she was bound in honour not to repeat it. Her three auditors listened to her without interrupting her much, indeed without bestowing extreme attention on what she was saying, until she came to the fact of Lord Hollingford's absence in London, and the reason for it. "'Roger Hamley going off on a scientific expedition?' exclaimed Mr. Gibson, suddenly awakened into vivacity. "'Yes, at least it is not settled finally, but as Lord Hollingford is the only trustee who takes any interest, and being Lord Cumnor's son, it is next to certain.' "'I think I must have a voice in the matter,' said Mr. Gibson, and he relapsed into silence, keeping his ears open, however, henceforward. 
"'How long will he be away?' asked Cynthia. "'We shall miss him sadly.' Molly's lips formed an acquiescing yes to this remark, but no sound was heard. There was a buzzing in her ears as if the others were going on with the conversation, but the words they uttered seemed indistinct and blurred. They were merely conjectures, and did not interfere with the one great piece of news. To the rest of the party she appeared to be eating her dinner as usual, and if she were silent, there was one listener the more to Mrs. Gibson's stream of prattle, and Mr. Gibson's and Cynthia's remarks. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 Brightening Prospects it was a day or two afterwards that Mr. Gibson made time to ride round by Hamley, desirous to learn more exact particulars of this scheme for Roger than he could obtain from any extraneous source, and rather puzzled to know whether he should interfere in the project or not. The state of the case was this. Osborne's symptoms were, in Mr. Gibson's opinion, signs of his having a fatal disease. Dr. Nichols had differed from him on this head and Mr. Gibson knew that the old physician had had long experience and was considered very skilful in the profession. Still he believed that he himself was right, and if so the complaint was one which might continue for years in the same state as at present, or might end the young man's life in an hour, a minute. Supposing that Mr. Gibson was right, would it be well for Roger to be away where no sudden calls for his presence could reach him? Away for two years? Yet, if the affair was concluded, the interference of a medical man might accelerate the very evil to be feared, and after all Dr. Nichols might be right, and the symptoms might proceed from some other cause. Might? Yes. Probably did? No. Mr. Gibson could not bring himself to say yes to this latter form of sentence. So he rode on, meditating, his reins slack, his head bent a little. It was one of those still and lovely autumn days when the red and yellow leaves are hanging pegs to dewy, brilliant gossamer webs, when the hedges are full of trailing brambles, loaded with ripe blackberries, when the air is full of the farewell whistles and pipes of birds, clear and short, not the long, full-throated warbles of spring, when the whirr of the partridge's wings is heard in the stubble-fields, as the sharp hoof-blows fall on the paved lanes when here and there a leaf floats and flutters down to the ground, although there is not a single breath of wind. The country surgeon felt the beauty of the seasons perhaps more than most men. He saw more of it day by day, by night, in storm and sunshine, or in the still soft cloudy weather. He never spoke about what he felt on the subject. Indeed he did not put his feelings into words, even to himself. But if his mood ever approached to the sentimental, it was on such days as this. He rode into the stable-yard, gave his horse to a man, and went into the house by a side entrance. In the passage he met the squire. "'That's capital, Gibson. What good wind blew you here? You'll have some lunch. It's on the table. I only just this minute left the room.' And he kept shaking Mr. Gibson's hand all the time till he had placed him, nothing loath, at the well-covered dining-table. "'What's this I hear about Roger?' said Mr. Gibson, plunging at once into the subject. "'Aha! So you've heard, have you? It's famous, isn't it? He's a boy to be proud of, is old Roger. Steady Roger. We used to think him slow, but it seems to me that slow and sure wins the race. But tell me, what have you heard? How much is known? Nay, you must have a glass full. It's old ale, such as we don't brew nowadays. It's as old as Osborne.' We brewed it that autumn, and we called it the young squire's ale. I thought to have tapped it on his marriage, but I don't know when that will come to pass, so we've tapped it now in Roger's honour." The old squire had evidently been enjoying the young squire's ale to the verge of prudence. It was indeed, as he said, as strong as brandy, and Mr. Gibson had to sip it very carefully as he ate his cold roast beef. "'Well, and what have you heard? There's a deal to hear, and all good news though I shall miss the lad, I know that. I did not know it was settled. I only heard that it was in progress. Well, it was only in progress, as you call it, till last Tuesday. He never let me know anything about it, though. He says he thought I might be fidgety with thinking of the pros and cons. So I never knew a word on it until I had a letter from my Lord Hollingford. Where is it? 
pulling out a great black leathern receptacle for all manner of papers, and putting on his spectacles he read aloud their headings. Measurement of timber, new railings, drench for cows from Father Hayes, Dobson's accounts. Hmm, hmm. Here it is. Now read that letter. Handing it to Mr. Gibson. It was a manly, feeling, sensible letter, explaining to the old father in very simple language the services which were demanded by the terms of the will to which he and two or three others were trustees, the liberal allowance for expenses, the still more liberal reward for performance, which had tempted several men of considerable renown to offer themselves as candidates for the appointment. Lord Hollingford then went on to say that having seen a good deal of Roger lately, since the publication of his article in reply to the French osteologist, he had had reason to think that in him the trustees would find united the various qualities required in a greater measure than in any of the applicants who had at that time presented themselves. Roger had deep interest in the subject, much acquired knowledge, and at the same time great natural powers of comparison, and classification of facts. He had shown himself to be an observer of a fine and accurate kind. He was of the right age, in the very prime of health and strength, and unshackled by any family ties. Here Mr. Gibson paused for consideration. He hardly cared to ascertain by what steps the result had been arrived at. He already knew what the result was. But when his mind was again arrested as his eye caught on the remuneration offered, which was indeed most liberal, and then he read with attention the high praise bestowed on the son in this letter to the father. The squire had been watching Mr. Gibson, waiting till he came to this part, and rubbed his hands together as he said, "'Ay, ah, you've come to it at last. It's the best part of the whole, isn't it? God bless the boy! And from a wig, mind you, which makes it the more handsome. And there's more to come still. I say, Gibson, I think my luck is turning at last.' Passing him on yet another letter to read. That only came this morning, but I've acted on it already. I sent for the foreman of the drainage works at once, I did, and to-morrow, please God, they'll be at work again." Mr. Gibson read the second letter from Roger. To a certain degree it was a modest repetition of what Lord Hollingford had said, with an explanation of how he had come to take so decided a step in life without consulting his father. He did not wish him to be in suspense for one reason. Another was that he felt, as no one else could feel for him, that by accepting this offer he entered upon the kind of life for which he knew himself to be most fitted. And then he merged the whole into business. He said that he knew well the suffering his father had gone through when he had had to give up his drainage works for want of money, that he, Roger, had been enabled at once to raise money upon the remuneration he was to receive on the accomplishment of his two years' work and that he also had insured his life, in order to provide for the repayment of the money he had raised, in case he did not live to return to England. He said that the sum he had borrowed on this security would at once be forwarded to his father. Mr. Gibson laid down the letter without speaking a word for some time. Then he said, "'He'll have to pay a pretty sum for insuring his life beyond seas.' "'He's got his fellowship money,' said the squire, a little depressed at Mr. Gibson's remark. Yes, that's true, and he's a strong young fellow, as I know. I wish I could tell his mother," said the squire, in an undertone. "'It seems all settled now,' said Mr. Gibson, more in reply to his own thoughts than to the squire's remark. "'Yes,' said the squire, "'and they're not going to let the grass grow under his feet. He's to be off as soon as he can get his scientific traps ready. I almost wish he wasn't to go. You don't seem quite to like it, doctor.' "'Yes, I do,' said Mr. Gibson, in a more cheerful tone than before. "'It can't be helped now without doing a mischief,' thought he to himself. "'Why, Squire, I think it a great honour to have such a son. I envy you, that's what I do. Here's a lad of three or four and twenty distinguishing himself in more ways than one, and as simple and affectionate at home as any fellow need to be, not a bit set up.' "'Aye, aye, he's twice as much a son to me as Osborne, who has been all his life set up on nothing at all as one may say. "'Come, squire, I mustn't hear anything against Osborne. We may praise one without hitting at the other. Osborne hasn't had the strong health which has enabled Roger to work as he has done. I met a man who knew his tutor at Trinity the other day, and of course we began cracking about Roger. It's not every day that one can reckon a senior wrangler amongst one's friends, and I'm nearly as proud of the lad as you are.' This Mr. Mason told me the tutor said that only half of Roger's success was owing to his mental powers. The other half was owing to his perfect health. 
which enabled him to work harder and more continuously than most men without suffering. He said that in all his experience he had never known any one with an equal capacity for mental labour, and that he could come again with a fresh appetite to his studies after shorter intervals of rest than most. Now I, being a doctor, trace a good deal of his superiority to the material cause of a thoroughly good constitution, which Osborne hasn't got. "'Osborne might have, if he got out of doors more,' said the squire moodily. "'But except when he can loaf into Hollingford, he doesn't care to go out at all. I hope—' he continued with a glance of sudden suspicion at Mr. Gibson. "'He's not after one of your girls. I don't mean offence, you know. But he'll have the estate, and it won't be free, and he must marry money. I don't think I could allow it in Roger. But Rosborne's the eldest son, you know.' Mr. Gibson reddened. He was offended for a moment. Then the partial truth of what the squire said was presented to his mind, and he remembered their old friendship, so he spoke quietly, if shortly. I don't believe that there's anything of the kind going on. I'm not much at home, you know, but I've never heard or seen anything that should make me suppose that there is. When I do, I'll let you know. Now, Gibson, don't go and be offended. I'm glad for the boys to have a pleasant house to go to, and I thank you and Mrs. Gibson for making it pleasant. Only keep off love. It can come to no good. That's all. I don't believe Osborne will ever earn a farthing to keep a wife during my life and if I were to die to-morrow, she would have to bring some money to clear the estate. And if I do speak as I shouldn't have done formerly, a little sharp or so, why, it's because I've been worried by many a care no one knows anything of." "'I am not going to take offence," said Mr. Gibson. "'But let us understand each other clearly. If you don't want your sons to come as much to my house as they do, tell them so yourself. I like the lads, and I am glad to see them. But if they do come, you must take the consequences, whatever they are, and not blame me, or them either, for what may happen from the frequent intercourse between two young men and two young women. And what is more, though, as I said, I see nothing whatever of the kind you fear at present, and have promised to tell you of the first symptoms I do see, yet farther than that I won't go. If there's an attachment at any future time, I won't interfere. I shouldn't so much mind if Roger fell in love with your Molly. He can fight for himself, you see, and she's an uncommon nice girl. My poor wife was so fond of her," answered the squire. It's Osborne and the estate I'm thinking of. Well, then, tell him not to come near us. I shall be sorry, but you will be safe. I'll think about it, but he's difficult to manage. I've always to get my blood well up before I can speak my mind to him." Mr. Gibson was leaving the room but at these words he turned and laid his hand on the squire's arm. "'Take my advice, squire. As I said, there's no harm done as yet, as far as I know. Prevention is better than cure. Speak out, but speak gently to Osborne, and do it at once. I shall understand how it is if he doesn't show his face for some months in my house. If you speak gently to him, he'll take the advice as from a friend. If he can assure you there's no danger, of course he'll come just as usual when he likes.' It was all very fine giving the squire this good advice, but as Osborne had already formed the very kind of marriage his father most appreciated, it did not act quite as well as Mr. Gibson had hoped. The squire began the conversation with unusual self-control, but he grew irritated when Osborne denied his father's right to interfere in any marriage he might contemplate, denied it with a certain degree of doggedness and weariness of the subject that drove the squire into one of his passions and although, on after reflection, he remembered that he had his son's promise and solemn word not to think of either Cynthia or Molly for his wife, yet the father and son had passed through one of those altercations which helped to estrange men for life. Each had said bitter things to the other, and if the brotherly affection had not been so true between Osborne and Roger, they too might have become alienated, in consequence of the squire's exaggerated and injudicious comparison of their characters and deeds. But as Roger in his boyhood had loved Osborne too well to be jealous of the praise and love which the eldest son, the beautiful brilliant lad, had received, to the disparagement of his own plain awkwardness and slowness, so now Osborne strove against any feeling of envy or jealousy with all his might. But his efforts were conscious, Roger's had been the simple consequence of affection, and the end to poor Osborne was that he became moody and depressed in mind and body but both father and son concealed their feelings in Roger's presence. When he came home just before sailing, busy and happy, 
The squire caught his infectious energy, and Osborne looked up and was cheerful. There was no time to be lost. He was bound to a hot climate, and must take all advantage possible of the winter months. He was to go first to Paris, to have interviews with some of the scientific men there. Some of his outfit, instruments, etc., were to follow him to Havre, from which fort he was to embark, after transacting his business in Paris. The squire learnt all his arrangements and plans, and even tried in after-dinner conversations to penetrate into the questions involved in the researches his son was about to make. But Roger's visit home could not be prolonged beyond two days. The last day he rode into Hollingford earlier than he needed to have done to catch the London coach, in order to bid the Gibsons good-bye. He had been too actively busy for some time to have leisure to bestow much thought on Cynthia, but there was no need for fresh meditation on that subject. Her image as a prize to be worked for, to be served for seven years, and seven years more, was safe and sacred in his heart. It was very bad, this going away, and wishing her good-bye for two long years, and he wondered much during his ride how far he should be justified in telling her mother, perhaps in telling her own sweet self, what his feelings were without expecting, nay, indeed reprobating, any answer on her part. Then she would know at any rate how dearly she was beloved by one who was absent, how in all difficulties or dangers the thought of her would be a polar star, high up in the heavens, and so on, and so on, for with all a lover's quickness of imagination and triteness of fancy, he called her a star, a flower, a nymph, a witch, an angel, or a mermaid, a nightingale, a siren, as one or another of her attributes rose up before him. End of chapter 33《Chapter Thirty Four, A Lover's Mistake It was afternoon. Molly had gone out for a walk. Mrs. Gibson had been paying some calls. Lazy Cynthia had declined accompanying either. A daily walk was not a necessity to her as it was to Molly. On a lovely day, or with an agreeable object, or when the fancy took her, she could go as far as any one. But these were exceptional cases. In general she was not disposed to disturb herself from her indoor occupations. Indeed, not one of the ladies would have left the house had they been aware that Roger was in the neighbourhood, for they were aware that he was to come down but once before his departure, and that his stay at home then would be but for a short time, and they were all anxious to wish him good-bye before his long absence. But they had understood that he was not coming to the hall until the following week, and therefore they had felt themselves at full liberty this afternoon to follow their own devices. Molly chose a walk that had been a favourite with her ever since she was a child. Something or other had happened just before she left home that made her begin wondering how far it was right for the sake of domestic peace to pass over without comment the little deviations from right that people perceive in those whom they live with. Or whether, as they are placed in families for distinct purposes, not by chance merely, there are not duties involved in this aspect of their lot in life, whether by continually passing over failings their own standard is not lowered, the practical application of these thoughts being a dismal sort of perplexity on Molly's part as to whether her father was quite aware of her stepmother's perpetual lapses from truth, and whether his blindness was wilful or not. Then she felt bitterly enough that although she was sure as could be that there was no real estrangement between her and her father, yet there were perpetual obstacles thrown in the way of their intercourse, and she thought with a sigh that if he would but come in with authority he might cut his way clear to the old intimacy with his daughter and that they might have all the former walks and talks and quips and cranks and glimpses of real confidence once again, things that her stepmother did not value, yet which she, like the dog in the manger, prevented Molly's enjoying. But after all Molly was a girl, not so far removed from childhood, and in the middle of her grave regrets and perplexities her eye was caught by the sight of some fine ripe blackberries flourishing away high up on the hedge-bank among scarlet hips and green and russet leaves. She did not care much for blackberries herself, but she had heard Cynthia say that she liked them. And besides, there was the charm of scrambling and gathering them. So she forgot all about her troubles, and went climbing up the banks and clutching at her almost inaccessible prizes, and slipping down again triumphant, to carry them back to the large leaf which was to serve her as a basket. One or two of them she tasted, but they were as vapid to her palate as ever. The skirt of her pretty print gown was torn out of the gathers, and even with the fruit she had eaten, 
Her pretty lips with blackberries were all besmeared and dyed, when having gathered as many and more than she could possibly carry, she set off home, hoping to escape into her room and mend her gown before it had offended Mrs. Gibson's neat eye. The front door was easily opened from the outside, as Molly was out of the clear light of the open air and in the shadow of the hall, when she saw a face peep out of the dining-room before she quite recognized whose it was. And then Mrs. Gibson came softly out, sufficiently at least to beckon her into the room. When Molly had entered Mrs. Gibson closed the door. Poor Molly expected a reprimand for her torn gown and untidy appearance, but was soon relieved by the expression of Mrs. Gibson's face, mysterious and radiant. "'I've been watching for you, dear. Don't go into the upstairs drawing-room, love. It might be a little interruption just now. Roger Hamney is there with Cynthia, and I've reason to think—in fact, I did open the door unawares, but I shut it again softly, and I don't think they heard me. Isn't it charming? Young love, you know. Ah, oh, how sweet it is!' "'Do you mean that Roger has proposed to Cynthia?' asked Molly. "'Not exactly that, but I don't know. Of course I know nothing. Only I did hear him say that he had meant to leave England without speaking of his love, but that the temptation of seeing her alone had been too great for him. It was symptomatic, don't you think, my dear? And all I wanted was to let it come to a crisis without interruption. So I've been watching for you to prevent your going in and disturbing them.' "'But I may go to my own room, mayn't I?' pleaded Molly. "'Of course,' said Mrs. Gibson a little testily. "'Only I had expected sympathy from you at such an interesting moment.' But Molly did not hear these last words. She had escaped upstairs and shut her door. Instinctively she had carried her leaf full of blackberries. What would blackberries be to Cynthia now? She felt as if she could not understand it all. But for that matter, what could she understand? Nothing. For a few minutes her brain seemed in too great a whirl to comprehend anything but that she was being carried on in earth's diurnal course, with rocks and stones and trees, with as little volition on her part as if she were dead. Then the room grew stifling, and instinctively she went to the open casement window, and leant out, gasping for breath. Gradually the consciousness of the soft, peaceful landscape stole into her mind, and stilled the buzzing confusion. There, bathed in the almost level rays of the autumn sunlight, lay the landscape she had known and loved from childhood, as quiet, as full of low humming life as it had been at this hour for many generations. The autumn flowers blazed out in the garden below, the lazy cows were in the meadow beyond, chewing their cud in the green aftermath, the evening fires had just been made up in the cottages beyond, in preparation for the husband's homecoming, and were sending up soft curls of blue smoke into the still air. The children let loose from school were shouting merrily in the distance, and she— Just then she heard nearer sounds, an opened door, steps on the lower flight of stairs. He could not have gone without seeing her. He never, never would have done so cruel a thing, never would have forgotten poor little Molly, however happy he might be. No. There were steps and voices, and the drawing-room door was opened and shut once more. She laid down her head on her arms that rested upon the window-sill, and cried. She had been so distrustful as to have let the idea enter her mind that he could go without wishing her good-bye. Her, whom his mother had so loved, and called by the name of his dead little sister. And as she thought of the tender love Mrs. Hamley had borne her, she cried the more, for the vanishing of such love for her off the face of the earth. Suddenly the drawing-room door opened, and some one was heard coming upstairs. It was Cynthia's step. Molly hastily wiped her eyes, and stood up and tried to look unconcerned. It was all she had time to do before Cynthia, after a little pause at the closed door, had knocked, and on an answer being given, had said without opening the door, "'Molly, Mr. Roger Hamley is here, and wants to wish you good-bye before he goes.' Then she went downstairs again, as if anxious just at that moment to avoid even so short a tête-à-tête -tête with Molly. With a gulp and a fit of resolution, as a child makes up its mind to swallow a nauseous dose of medicine, Molly went instantly downstairs. Roger was talking earnestly to Mrs. Gibson in the bow of the window when Molly entered. Cynthia was standing near, listening but taking no part in the conversation. Her eyes were downcast, and she did not look up as Molly drew shyly near. Roger was saying, "'I could never forgive myself if I had accepted a pledge from her. She shall be free until my return. But the hope, the words, her sweet goodness have made me happy beyond description. Oh, Molly!' 
suddenly becoming aware of her presence and turning to her, and taking her hand in both of his. "'I think you have long guessed my secret, have you not? I once thought of speaking to you before I left, and confiding it all to you. But the temptation has been too great. I have told Cynthia how fondly I love her, as far as words can tell. And she says—' Then he looked at Cynthia with a passionate delight, and seemed to forget in that gaze that he had left his sentence to Molly half-finished. Cynthia did not seem inclined to repeat her saying, whatever it was, but her mother spoke for her. "'My dear sweet girl values your love as it ought to be valued, I am sure, and I believe,' looking at Cynthia and Roger with intelligent archness, "'I could tell tales as to the cause of her indisposition in the spring.' "'Mother,' said Cynthia suddenly, "'you know it was no such thing. Pray don't invent stories about me. I have engaged myself to Mr. Roger Hamley, and that is enough.' "'Enough! More than enough!' said Roger. I will not accept your pledge. I am bound, but you are free. I like to feel bound, it makes me happy and at peace. But with all the chances involved in the next two years, you must not shackle yourself by promises." Cynthia did not speak at once. She was evidently revolving something in her own mind. Mrs. Gibson took up the word. "'You are very generous, I am sure. Perhaps it will be better not to mention it.' "'I would much rather have kept it a secret said Cynthia, interrupting. "'Certainly, my dear love, that was just what I was going to say. I once knew a young lady who heard of the death of a young man in America, whom she had known pretty well, and she immediately said she had been engaged to him, and even went so far as to put on weeds, and it was a false report, for he came back well and merry, and declared to everybody he had never so much as thought about her, so it is very awkward for her. These things had much better be kept secret until the proper time has come for divulging them." Even then and there Cynthia could not resist the temptation of saying, "'Mamma, I will promise you I won't put on weeds, whatever reports come of Mr. Roger Hamley.' "'Roger, please,' he put in, in a tender whisper. "'And you will be all witnesses that he has professed to think of me, if he is tempted afterwards to deny the fact. But at the same time I wish it to be kept a secret until his return, and I am sure you will all be so kind as to attend to my wish. Please, Roger, please, Molly. Mamma, I must especially beg it of you." Roger would have granted anything when she asked him by that name, and in that tone. He took her hand in silent pledge of his reply. Molly felt as if she could never bring herself to name the affair as a common piece of news. So it was only Mrs. Gibson that answered aloud, "'My dear child, why especially to poor me? You know I'm the most trustworthy person alive.' The little pendule on the chimney-piece struck the half-hour. "'I must go.' said Roger, in dismay. I had no idea it was so late. I shall write from Paris. The coach will be at the George by this time, and will only stay five minutes. Dearest Cynthia!" He took her hand, and then, as if the temptation was irresistible, he drew her to him and kissed her. "'Only remember, you are free,' said he, as he released her and passed on to Mrs. Gibson. "'If I had considered myself free—' said Cynthia, blushing a little, but ready with her repartee to the last. "'If I had thought myself free, do you think I would have allowed that?' Then Molly's turn came, and the old brotherly tenderness came back into his look, his voice, his bearing. "'Molly, you won't forget me, I know. I shall never forget you, nor your goodness to—her.' His voice began to quiver, and it was best to be gone. Mrs. Gibson was pouring out, unheard and unheeded, words of farewell. Cynthia was rearranging some flowers in a vase on the table, the defects in which had caught her artistic eye, without the consciousness penetrating to her mind. Molly stood, numb to the heart, neither glad nor sorry, nor anything but stunned. She felt the slackened touch of the warm, grasping hand. She looked up, for till now her eyes had been downcast, as if there were heavy weights to their lids and the place was empty where he had been. His quick step was heard on the stair, the front door was opened and shut, and then as quick as lightning Molly ran up to the front attic, the lumber-room, whose window commanded the street down which he must pass. The window-clasp was unused and stiff, and Molly tugged at it, unless it was open, and her head put out, that last chance would be gone. "'I must see him again! I must! I must!' she wailed out as she was pulling. There he was, running hard to catch the London coach, 
His luggage had been left at the George before he came up to wish the Gibsons good-bye. In all his hurry, Molly saw him turn round and shade his eyes from the level rays of the westering sun, and rake the house with his glances, in hopes, she knew, of catching one more glimpse of Cynthia. But apparently he saw no one, not even Molly at the attic casement, for she had drawn back when he had turned, and kept herself in shadow, for she had no right to put herself forward as the one to watch and yearn for farewell signs. None came. Another moment. He was out of sight for years. She shut the window softly and shivered all over. She left the attic and went to her own room, but she did not begin to take off her out-of-door things till she heard Cynthia's foot on the stairs. Then she hastily went to the toilet-table and began to untie her bonnet-strings, but they were in a knot and took time to undo. Cynthia's step stopped at Molly's door. She opened it a little and said, "'May I come in, Molly?' Certainly," said Molly, longing to be able to say no all the time. Molly did not turn to meet her, so Cynthia came up behind her, and putting her two hands round Molly's waist, peeped over her shoulder, putting out her lips to be kissed. Molly could not resist the action, the mute entreaty for a caress. But in the moment before, she had caught the reflection of the two faces in the glass, her own, red-eyed, pale, with lips dyed with blackberry juice, her curls tangled, her bonnet pulled awry, her gown torn, and contrasted it with Cynthia's brightness and bloom, and the trim elegance of her dress. "'Oh, it is no wonder,' thought poor Molly, as she turned round and put her arms round Cynthia, and laid her head for an instant on her shoulder, the weary, aching head that sought a loving pillow in that supreme moment. The next she had raised herself, and taken Cynthia's two hands, and was holding her off a little, the better to read her face. "'Cynthia, you do love him dearly, don't you?' Cynthia winced a little aside from the penetrating steadiness of those eyes. "'You speak with all the solemnity of an adjuration, Molly,' said she, laughing a little at first to cover her nervousness, and then looking up at Molly. "'Don't you think I've given a proof of it? But you know I've often told you I've not the gift of loving. I said pretty much the same thing to him. I can respect, and I fancy I can admire, and I can like.' but I never feel carried off my feet by love for any one, not even for you, little Molly, and I am sure I love you more than—'No, don't!' said Molly, putting her hand before Cynthia's mouth, in almost a passion of impatience. "'Don't! Don't! I won't hear you! I ought not to have asked you! It makes you tell lies!' "'Why, Molly,' said Cynthia, in her turn, seeking to read Molly's face, "'what's the matter with you? One might think you cared for him yourself.' I," said Molly, all the blood rushing to her heart suddenly. Then it returned, and she had courage to speak, and she spoke the truth as she believed it, though not the real actual truth. "'I do care for him. I think you have won the love of a prince amongst men. Why, I am proud to remember that he has been to me as a brother, and I love him as a sister, and I love you doubly because he has honoured you with his love.' "'Come, that's not complimentary,' said Cynthia, laughing but not ill-pleased to hear her lover's praises, and even willing to depreciate him a little in order to hear more. "'He's well enough, I dare say, and a great deal too learned and clever for a stupid girl like me. But even you must acknowledge he's very plain and awkward, and I like pretty things and pretty people.' "'Cynthia, I won't talk to you about him. You know you don't mean what you are saying, and you only say it out of contradiction because I praise him. He shan't be run down by you, even in joke.' "'Well, then, we won't talk of him at all. I was so surprised when he began to speak. So—' And Cynthia looked very lovely, blushing and dimpling up as she remembered his words and looks. Suddenly she recalled herself to the present time, and her eye caught on the leaf full of blackberries, the broad green leaf, so fresh and crisp when Molly had gathered it an hour or so ago, but now soft and flabby and dying. Molly saw it, too, and felt a strange kind of sympathetic pity for the poor inanimate leaf. "'Oh, what blackberries! You've gathered them for me, I know,' said Cynthia, sitting down and beginning to feed herself daintily, touching them lightly with the ends of her taper fingers, and dropping each ripe berry into her open mouth. When she had eaten about half she suddenly stopped short. "'How oh, I should like to have gone as far as Paris with him!' she exclaimed. "'I suppose it wouldn't have been proper, but how pleasant it would have been!' I remember at Boulogne, another blackberry, how I used to envy the English who were going to Paris. 
It seemed to me then as if nobody stopped at Boulogne, but dull, stupid schoolgirls. "'When will he be there?' asked Molly. "'On Wednesday,' he said. "'I'm to write to him there. At any rate, he's going to write to me.' Molly went about the adjustment of her dress in a quiet, business-like manner, not speaking much. Cynthia, although sitting still, seemed very restless. Oh, how much Molly wished that she would go! "'Perhaps, after all,' said Cynthia, after a pause of apparent meditation, "'we shall never be married.' "'Why do you say that?' said Molly, almost bitterly. "'You have nothing to make you think so. I wonder how you can bear to think you won't, even for a moment.' "'Oh,' said Cynthia, "'you mustn't go and take me au grand sérieux. I dare say I don't mean what I say, but you see everything seems a dream at present. Still, I think the chances are equal, the chances for and against our marriage, I mean. Two years! It's a long time. He may change his mind, or I may, or some one else may turn up, and I may get engaged to him. What should you think of that, Molly? I'm putting such a gloomy thing as death quite on one side, you see. Yet in two years how much may happen! "'Don't talk so, Cynthia, please don't,' said Molly piteously. "'One would think you didn't care for him, and he cares so much for you.' "'Why did I say I didn't care for him? I was only calculating chances. I'm sure I hope nothing will happen to prevent the marriage. Only you know it may, and I thought I was taking a step in wisdom, in looking forward to all the evils that might befall. I'm sure all the wise people I've ever known thought it a virtue to have gloomy prognostics of the future. But you're not in a mood for wisdom or virtue, I see, so I'll go and get ready for dinner, and leave you to your vanities of dress." She took Molly's face in both her hands, before Molly was aware of her intention, and kissed it playfully. Then she left Molly to herself. End of chapter 34「Chapter 35 The Mother's Maneuver Mr. Gibson was not at home at dinner, detained by some patient, most probably. This was not an unusual occurrence. But it was rather an unusual occurrence for Mrs. Gibson to go down into the dining-room and sit with him as he ate his deferred meal when he came in an hour or two later. In general she preferred her easy-chair or her corner of the sofa upstairs in the drawing-room, though it was very rarely that she would allow Molly to avail herself of her stepmother's neglected privilege. Molly would fain have gone down and kept her father company every night that he had these solitary meals, but for peace and quietness she gave up her own wishes on the matter. Mrs. Gibson took a seat by the fire in the dining-room, and patiently waited for the auspicious moment when Mr. Gibson, having satisfied his healthy appetite, turned from the table and took his place by her side. She got up, and with unaccustomed attention moved the wine and glasses so that he could help himself without moving from his chair. "'There, now, are you comfortable? For I have a great piece of news to tell you,' said she, when all was arranged. "'I thought there was something on hand,' said he, smiling. "'Now for it.' "'Roger Hamley has been here this afternoon to bid us good-bye.' "'Good-bye? Is he gone? I didn't know he was going so soon,' exclaimed Mr. Gibson. "'Yes, never mind, that's not it.' "'But tell me, he has left this neighbourhood. I wanted to have seen him.' "'Yes, yes, he left love and regret and all that sort of thing for you. Now let me get on with my story. He found Cynthia alone, proposed to her, and was accepted.' "'Cynthia?' "'Roger proposed to her, and she accepted him,' repeated Mr. Gibson slowly. "'Yes, to be sure. Why not? You speak as if it was something so very surprising.' "'Did I? Uh, but I am surprised. He's a very fine young fellow, and I wish Cynthia joy, but do you like it? It will have to be a very long engagement.' "'Perhaps,' said she, in a knowing manner. "'At any rate, you'll be away for two years,' said Mr. Gibson. "'A great deal may happen in two years.' she replied. "'Yes, he will have to run many risks and go into many dangers, and will come back no nearer to the power of maintaining a waif than when he went out.' "'I don't know that,' she replied, still in the arch manner of one possessing superior knowledge. 
A little bird did tell me that Osborne's life is not so very secure, and then what will Roger be? Heir to the estate." "'Who told you that about Osborne?' said he, facing round upon her, and frightening her with his sudden sternness of voice and manner. It seemed as if absolute fire came out of his long, dark, sombre eyes. "'Who told you, I say?' She made a faint rally back into her former playfulness. "'Why, can you deny it? Is it not the truth?' "'I ask you again, Hyacinth, who told you that Osborne Hamsley's life is in more danger than mine or yours?' "'Oh, don't speak in that frightening way. My life is not in danger, I'm sure. Nor yours either, love, I hope.' He gave an impatient movement, and knocked a wine-glass off the table. For the moment she felt grateful for the diversion, and busied herself in picking up the fragments. "'Bits of glass were so dangerous,' she said. But she was startled by a voice of command such as she had never yet heard from her husband. "'Never mind the glass. I ask you again, Hyacinth. Who told you anything about Osborne Hamley's state of health?" "'I am sure I wish no harm to him, and I dare say he is in very good health, as you say,' whispered she at last. "'Who told?' began he again, sterner than ever. "'Well, if you will know, it will make such a fuss about it,' said she, driven to extremity. "'It was you yourself. You, or Dr. Nichols. I am sure I forget which.' I never spoke to you on the subject, and I don't believe Nicholls did. You'd better tell me at once what you're alluding to, for I'm resolved we'll have it out before you leave this room." "'I wish I'd never married again,' she said, now fairly crying and looking round the room, as if in vain search for a mouse-hole in which to hide herself. Then, as if the sight of the door into the storeroom gave her courage, she turned and faced him. "'You should not talk your medical secrets so loud, then, if you don't want people to hear them. I had to go into the storeroom that day Dr. Nichols was here. Cook wanted a jar of preserve, and stopped me just as I was going out. I am sure it was for no pleasure of mine, for I was sadly afraid of sticking my gloves. It was all that you might have a comfortable dinner." She looked as if she was going to cry again, but he gravely motioned for her to go on, merely saying, "'Well, you overheard our conversation, I suppose?' "'Not much,' she answered eagerly almost relieved by being thus helped out in her forced confession. "'Only a sentence or two. "'What were they?' he asked. "'Why, you had just been saying something, and Dr. Nichols said, "'If he has got aneurysm of the aorta, his days are numbered.' "'Well, anything more?' "'Yes, you said, I hope to God I may be mistaken, "'but there is a pretty clear indication of symptoms, in my opinion.' "'How do you know we are speaking of Osborne and Hamley?' he asked perhaps in hopes of throwing her off the scent. But as soon as she perceived that he was descending to her level of subterfuge, she took courage, and said in a quite different tone to the cowed one which she had been using, "'Oh, I know! I heard his name mentioned by you both before I began to listen.' "'Then you all you did listen?' "'Yes,' said she, hesitating a little now. "'And pray, how do you come to remember so exactly the name of the disease spoken of?' because I went—now don't be angry, I really can't see any harm in what I did." "'Then don't deprecate anger. You went—' "'Into the surgery and looked it out. Why might not I?' Mr. Gibson did not answer, did not look at her. His face was very pale, and both forehead and lips were contracted. At length he roused himself, sighed, and said, "'Well, I suppose as one bruise one must bake. "'I don't understand what you mean,' pouted she. "'Perhaps not,' he replied. "'I suppose that it was what you heard on that occasion that made you change your behaviour to Roger Hamley. I have noticed how much more civil you were to him of late.' "'If you mean that I have ever got to like him as much as Osborne, you are very much mistaken. No, not even though he is offered to Cynthia, and is to be my son-in-law. Let me know the whole affair. You overheard. I will own that it was Osborne about whom we were speaking, though I shall have something to say about that presently. And then, if I understand you rightly, you changed your behaviour to Roger, and made him more welcome to this house than you had ever done before, regarding him as approximate heir to the Hamley estates." "'I don't know what you mean by proximate." "'Go into the surgery and look into the dictionary, then,' said he, losing his temper for the first time during the conversation. "'I knew,' said she, through sobs and tears. 
that Roger had taken a fancy to Cynthia. Any one might see that. And as long as Roger was only a younger son, with no profession, and nothing but his fellowship, I thought it right to discourage him, as any one would who had a grain of common sense in them. For a clumsier, more common, awkward, stupid fellow I never saw, to be called county, I mean. Take care. You'll have to eat your words presently when you come to fancy he'll have Hamley some day. No, I shan't, said she, not perceiving his exact drift. You are vexed now, because it is not Molly he's in love with, and I call it very unjust and unfair to my poor fatherless girl. I am sure I have always tried to further Molly's interests, as if she was my own daughter." Mr. Gibson was too indifferent to this accusation to take any notice of it. He returned to what was of far more importance to him. "'The point I want to be clear about is this. Did you, or did you not, alter your behaviour to Roger, in consequence of what you overheard of my professional conversation with Dr. Nichols? Have you not favoured his suit to Cynthia since then, on the understanding gathered from that conversation that he stood a good chance of inheriting Hamley?" "'I suppose I did,' said she, sulkily. "'And if I did, I can't see any harm in it. That I should be questioned as if I were in a witness-box. He was in love with Cynthia long before that conversation, and she liked him so much. It was not for me to cross the path of true love. I don't see how you would have a mother show her love for her child, if she may not turn accidental circumstances to her advantage. Perhaps Cynthia might have died if she had been crossed in love. Her poor father was consumptive." "'Don't you know that all professional conversations are confidential? That it would be the most dishonourable thing possible for me to betray secrets which I learn in the exercise of my profession?" "'Yes, of course, you. Well, and are not you and I one in all these respects? You cannot do a dishonourable act without my being inculpated in the disgrace. If it would be a deep disgrace for me to betray a professional secret, what would it be for me to trade on that knowledge?" He was trying hard to be patient, but the offence was of that class which galled him insupportably. "'I don't know what you mean by trading. Trading in a daughter's affections is the last thing I should do, and I should have thought you would be rather glad than otherwise to get Cynthia well married and off your hands." Mr. Gibson got up and walked about the room, his hands in his pockets. Once or twice he began to speak, but he stopped impatiently short without going on. "'I don't know what to say to you,' he said at length. "'You either can't or won't see what I mean. I am glad enough to have Cynthia here. I have given her a true welcome, and I sincerely hope she will find this house as much a home as my own daughter does. But for the future I must look out of my doors and double-lock the approaches if I am so foolish as to— However, that's past and gone, and it remains with me to prevent its recurrence as far as I can for the future. Now let us hear the present state of affairs. I don't think I ought to tell you anything about it. It is a secret, just as much as your mysteries are. Very well. You have told me enough to me to act upon, which I most certainly shall do. It was only the other day I promised the squire to let him know if I suspected anything any love affair or entanglement, much less an engagement, between either of his sons and our girls." "'But this is not an engagement. He would not let it be so. If you would only listen to me, I would tell you all. Only I do hope you won't go and tell the squire and everybody. Cynthia did so beg that it might not be known. It is only my unfortunate frankness that has led me into this scrape. I never could keep a secret from those whom I love." "'I must tell the squire. I shall not mention it to any one else. And do you think it was quite consistent with your general frankness to have overheard what you did, and never to have mentioned it to me? I could have told you that when Dr. Nicholls' opinion was decidedly opposed to mine, and that he believed that the disturbance about which I consulted him on Osborne's behalf was merely temporary. Dr. Nicholls would tell you that Osborne is as likely as any man to live and marry and beget children." If there was any skill used by Mr. Gibson so to word this speech as to conceal his own opinion, Mrs. Gibson was not sharp enough to find it out. She was dismayed, and Mr. Gibson enjoyed her dismay. It restored him to something like his usual frame of mind. "'Let us review this misfortune, but I see you consider it as much,' he said. "'No, not quite a misfortune,' said she. "'But certainly if I had known Dr. Nicholls' opinion she hesitated. "'You see the advantage of always consulting me,' he said gravely. "'Here is Cynthia engaged. 
"'Not engaged, as I told you before. He would not allow it to be considered an engagement on her part.' "'Well, entangled in a love affair with a lad of three and twenty, with nothing beyond his fellowship and the chance of inheriting an encumbered estate. No profession, even. Abroad for two years. And I must go and tell his father all about it to-morrow.' "'Oh, dear! Pray say that if he dislikes it, he is only to express his opinion.' I don't think you can act without Cynthia in the affair. And if I am not mistaken, Cynthia will have a pretty stout will of her own on the subject. Oh, I don't think she cares for him very much. She is not one to be always falling in love, and she does not take things very deeply to heart. But, of course, one would not do anything abruptly. Two years' absence gives one plenty of time to turn oneself in. But a little while ago we were threatened with consumption and an early death, if Cynthia's affections were thwarted. Oh, you dear creature, how you remember all my silly words! It might be, you know. Poor dear Mr. Kirkpatrick was consumptive, and Cynthia may have inherited it, and great sorrow might bring out the latent seeds. At times I am so fearful. But I dare say it is not probable, for I don't think she takes things very deeply to heart. Then I am quite at liberty to give up the affair, acting as Cynthia's proxy, if the squire disapproves of it. Poor Mrs. Gibson was in a strait at this question. No, she said at last, we cannot give it up. I am sure Cynthia would not, especially if she thought others were acting for her. And he really is very much in love. I wish he were in Osborne's place. Shall I tell you what I should do? said Mr. Gibson, in real earnest. However it may have been brought about, here are two young people in love with each other. One is as fine a young fellow as ever breathed, the other a very pretty, lively, agreeable girl. The father of the young man must be told, and it is most likely he will bluster and oppose, for there is no doubt it is an improvement affair as far as money goes. But let them be steady and patient, and a better lot need await no young woman. I only wish it were Molly's good fortune to meet with such another." "'I will try for her, I will indeed,' said Mrs. Gibson, relieved by his change of tone. "'No, don't. That's one thing I forbid. I'll have no trying for Molly.' Well, don't be angry, dear. Do you know, I was quite afraid you were going to lose your temper at one time." "'It would have been of no use,' said he gloomily, getting up as if to close the sitting. His wife was only too glad to make her escape. The conjugal interview had not been satisfactory to either. Mr. Gibson had been compelled to face and acknowledge the fact that the wife he had chosen had a very different standard of conduct from that which he had upheld all his life, and had hoped to have seen inculcated in his daughter. He was more irritated than he chose to show, for there was so much of self-reproach in his irritation that he kept it to himself, brooded over it, and allowed a feeling of suspicious dissatisfaction with his wife to grow up in his mind, which extended itself by and by to the innocent Cynthia, and caused his manner to both mother and daughter to assume a certain curt severity, which took the latter at any rate with extreme surprise. But on the present occasion he followed his wife up to the drawing-room, and gravely congratulated the astonished Cynthia. "'Has mamma told you?' said she, shooting an indignant glance at her mother. "'It is hardly an engagement, and we all pledged ourselves to keep it a secret, mamma among the rest.' "'But, my dearest Cynthia, you could not expect—you could not have wished me to keep a secret from my husband,' pleaded Mrs. Gibson. "'No, perhaps not. At any rate, sir said Cynthia, turning towards him with graceful frankness. "'I am glad you should know it. You have always been a most kind friend to me, and I dare say I should have told you myself, but I did not want it named. If you please, it must still be a secret. In fact, it is hardly an engagement. He—' She blushed and sparkled a little at the euphuism, which implied that there was but one he present in her thoughts at the moment. "'Would not allow me to bind myself by any promise until his return.' Mr. Gibson looked gravely at her, irresponsive to her winning looks, which at the moment reminded him too forcibly of her mother's ways. Then he took her hand and said seriously enough, "'I hope you are worthy of him, Cynthia, for you have indeed drawn a praise. I have never known a truer or warmer heart than Roger's, and I have known him boy and man.' Molly felt as if she could have thanked her father aloud for this testimony to the value of him who was gone away. But Cynthia pouted a little before she smiled up in his face. "'You are not complimentary, are you, Mr. Gibson?' 
said she. He thinks me worthy, I suppose. And if you have so high an opinion of him, you ought to respect his judgment of me." If she hoped to provoke a compliment she was disappointed, for Mr. Gibson let her hand go in an absent manner, and sat down in an easy-chair by the fire, gazing at the wood embers as if hoping to read the future in them. Molly saw Cynthia's eyes fill with tears, and followed her to the other end of the room, where she had gone to seek some working materials. "'Dear Cynthia,' was all she said, but she pressed her hand while trying to assist in the search. "'Oh, Molly, I am so fond of your father. What makes him speak so to me to-night?' "'I don't know,' said Molly. "'Perhaps he's tired.' They were recalled from further conversation by Mr. Gibson. He had roused himself from his reverie, and was now addressing Cynthia. "'I hope you'll not consider it a breach of confidence, Cynthia, but I must tell the squire of—of of what has taken place to-day between you and his son. I have bound myself by a promise to him. He was afraid—it's as well to tell you the truth—he was afraid—an emphasis on this last word of something of this kind between his sons and one of you two girls. It was only the other day I assured him there was nothing of the kind on foot, and I told him then I would inform him at once if I saw any symptoms." Cynthia looked extremely annoyed. "'It was the one thing I stipulated for—secrecy!' "'But why?' said Mr. Gibson. "'I can understand your not wishing to have it made public under the present circumstances, but the nearest friends on both sides. Surely you can have no objection to that?" "'Yes, I have,' said Cynthia. "'I would not have had any one know if I could have helped it.' "'I am almost certain Roger will tell his father.' "'No, he won't,' said Cynthia. "'I made him promise, and I think he is one to respect a promise,' with a glance at her mother, who, feeling herself in disgrace with both husband and child, was keeping a judicious silence. Well, at any rate, the story would come with so much a better grace from him that I shall give him the chance. I won't go over to the hall till the end of the week. He may have written and told his father before then." Cynthia held her tongue for a little while. Then she said, with tearful pettishness, "'A man's promise is to override a woman's wish, then, is it?' "'I don't see any reason why it should not.' Will you trust in my reasons when I tell you it will cause me a great deal of distress if it gets known?" She said this in so pleading a voice that if Mr. Gibson had not been thoroughly displeased and annoyed by his previous conversation with her mother, he must have yielded to her. As it was, he said coldly, "'Telling Roger's father is not making it public. I don't like this exaggerated desire for such secrecy, Cynthia. It seems to me as if something more than is apparent was concealed behind it." "'Come, Molly said Cynthia suddenly. Let us sing that duet I've been teaching you. It's better than talking as we are doing." It was a little lively French duet. Molly sang it carelessly, with heaviness at her heart, but Cynthia sang it with spirit and apparent merriment, only she broke down in hysterics at last, and flew upstairs to her own room. Molly, heeding nothing else, neither her father nor Mrs. Gibson's words, followed her, and found the door of her bedroom locked and for all reply to her entreaties to be allowed to come in, she heard Cynthia sobbing and crying. It was more than a week after the incidents just recorded, before Mr. Gibson found himself at liberty to call on the squire, and he heartily hoped that long before then Roger's letter might have arrived from Paris, telling his father the whole story. But he saw at the first glance that the squire had heard nothing unusual to disturb his equanimity. He was looking better than he had done for months past. The light of hope was in his eyes, his face seemed of a healthy ruddy colour, gained partly by his resumption of outdoor employment in the superintendence of the works, and partly because the happiness he had lately had through Roger's means caused his blood to flow with regular vigour. He had felt Roger's going away, it is true, but whenever the sorrow of parting with him pressed too heavily upon him, he filled his pipe and smoked it out over a long, slow, deliberate re-perusal of Lord Hollingford's letter every word of which he knew by heart, but expressions in which he made a pretense to himself of doubting that he might have an excuse for looking at his son's praises once again. The first greetings over, Mr. Gibson plunged into his subject. "'Any news from Roger yet?' "'Oh, yes, here's his letter,' said the squire, producing his black leather case, in which Roger's missive had been placed along with the other very heterogeneous contents. Mr. Gibson read it, 
hardly seeing the words after he had by one rapid glance assured himself that there was no mention of Cynthia in it. Hm, I see he doesn't name one very important event that has befallen him since he left you," said Mr. Gibson, seizing on the first words that came. I believe I am committing a breach of confidence on one side, but I am going to keep the promise I made the last time I was here. I find there is something—something of the kind you apprehended, you understand, between him and my stepdaughter, Cynthia Kirkpatrick. He called at our house to wish us good-bye while waiting for the London coach, found her alone, and spoke to her. They don't call it an engagement, but of course it is one." "'Give me back the letter.' said the squire, in a constrained kind of voice. Then he read it again, as if he had not previously mastered its contents, and as if there might be some sentence or sentences he had overlooked. "'No,' he said at last, with a sigh, "'he tells me nothing about it. Lads may play at confidences with their fathers, but they keep a deal back.' The squire appeared more disappointed at not having heard of this straight from Roger than displeased at the fact itself, Mr. Gibson thought but he let him take his time. "'He's not the eldest son,' continued the squire, talking as it were to himself. "'But it's not the match I should have planned for him.' "'How came you, sir,' said he, firing round on Mr. Gibson suddenly, "'to say, when you were last here, that there was nothing between my sons and either of your girls. Why, this must have been going on all the time.' "'I'm afraid it was. But I was as ignorant about it as the babe unborn. I only heard of it on the evening of the day of Roger's departure. "'And that's a week ago, sir. What's kept you quiet ever since?' "'I thought that Roger would tell you himself.' "'That shows you've no sons. More than half their life is unknown to their fathers. Why, Osborne there. We live together. That's to say we have our meals together and we sleep under the same roof. And yet—well, well, life is as God has made it. You say it's not an engagement yet? But I wonder what I'm doing, hoping for my lad's disappointment in the folly he set his heart on, and just when he's been helping me. Is it a folly, or is it not? I ask you, Gibson, for you must know this girl. She hasn't much money, I suppose. About thirty pounds a year, at my pleasure during her mother's life. Phew! <sighs> it's well he's not Osborne. They'll have to wait. What family is she of? None of em in trade, I reckon, from her being so poor. I believe her father was a grandson of a certain Sir Gerald Kirkpatrick. Her mother tells me it is an old baronetcy. I know nothing of such things." "'That's something. I do know something of such things, as you are pleased to call them. I like honourable blood." Mr. Gibson could not help saying, "'But I am afraid that only one eighth of Cynthia's blood is honourable. I know nothing further of her relations, excepting the fact that her father was a curate professional, that's a step above trade at any rate. How old is she?" Eighteen or nineteen. Pretty? Yes, I think so. Most people do, but it's all a matter of taste. Come, squire, judge for yourself. Ride over and take lunch with us any day you like. I may not be in, but her mother will be there, and you can make acquaintance with your son's future wife." This was going too fast, however, presuming too much on the quietness with which the squire had been questioning him. Mr. Hamley drew back within his shell, and spoke in a surly manner as he replied, "'Roger's future wife! He'll be wiser by the time he comes home. Two years among the black folk will have put more sense in him.' "'Possible, but not probable, I should say,' replied Mr. Gibson. "'Black folk are not remarkable for their powers of reasoning, I believe, so that they haven't much chance of altering his opinion by argument, even if they understand each other's language. And certainly if he shares my taste, their peculiarity of complexion will only make him appreciate white skins the more." "'But you said it was no engagement,' growled the squire. "'If he thinks better of it, you won't keep him to it, will you?' "'If he wishes to break it off, I shall certainly advise Cynthia to be equally willing. That's all I can say. And I see no reason for discussing the affair further at present. I have told you how matters stand, because I promised you I would, if I saw anything of this kind going on. But in the present condition of things, we can neither make nor mar. We can only wait." And he took up his hat to go. But the squire was discontented. "'Don't go, Gibson. Don't take offence at what I have said, though I am sure I don't see why you should. What's the girl like in herself?' "'I don't know what you mean,' said Mr. Gibson. But he did, 
Only he was vexed and did not choose to understand. "'Is she... well, is she like your Molly, sweet-tempered and sensible, with her gloves always mended and neat about the feet, and ready to do anything one asks her, just as if doing it was the very thing she liked best in the world?' Mr. Gibson's face relaxed now, and he could understand all the squire's broken sentences and unexplained meanings. "'She is much prettier than Molly to begin with, and has very winning wees. She's always well-dressed and smart-looking, and I know she hasn't much to spend on her clothes, and always does what she's asked to do, and is ready enough with her pretty lively answers. I don't think I ever saw her out of temper, but then I'm not sure if she takes things keenly to heart, and a certain obtuseness of feeling goes a great way toward a character for a good temper, I've observed. Altogether I think Cynthia is one in a hundred. The squire meditated a little. Your Molly is one in a thousand, to my mind. But then, you see, she comes of no family at all, and I don't suppose she'll have a chance of much money." This he said as if he were thinking aloud, and without reference to Mr. Gibson, but it nettled the latter, and he replied somewhat impatiently. "'Well, but as there's no question of Molly in this business, I don't see the use of bringing her name in, and considering either her family or her fortune.' "'No, to be sure not,' said the squire, rousing up. "'My wits had gone far afield, and I'll own I was only thinking what a pity it was she wouldn't do for Osborne. But of course it's out of the question—out of the question.' "'Yes,' said Mr. Gibson. "'And if you will excuse me, squire, I really must go now and then you'll be at liberty to send your wits afield uninterrupted." This time he was at the door before the squire called him back. He stood impatiently hitting his top-boots with his riding-whip, waiting for the interminable last words. "'I say, Gibson, we're old friends, and you're a fool if you take anything I say as an offence. Madam, your wife and I didn't hit it off the only time I ever saw her. I won't say she was silly, but I think one of us was silly, and it wasn't me. However, we'll pass that over. Suppose you bring her and this girl Cynthia, which is as outlandish a Christian name as I'd wish to hear, and little Molly out here to lunch some day. I'm more at my ease in my own house, and I'm more sure to be civil, too. We need say nothing about Roger, neither the lass nor me, and you keep your wife's tongue quiet if you can. It will only be like a compliment to you on your marriage, you know, and no one must take it for anything more. Mind, no allusion or mention of Roger in this piece of folly. I shall see the girl, then, and I can judge for myself. For, as you say, that will be the best plan. Osborne will be here, too, and he's always in his element talking to women. I sometimes think he's half woman himself. He spends so much money, and is so unreasonable." The squire was pleased with his own speech and his own thought, and smiled a little as he finished speaking. Mr. Gibson was both pleased and amused, and he smiled, too, anxious as he was to be gone. The next Thursday was soon fixed upon as the day on which Mr. Gibson was to bring his womenkind out to the hall. He thought that, on the whole, the interview had gone off a good deal better than he had expected, and he felt rather proud of the invitation of which he was the bearer. Therefore Mrs. Gibson's manner of receiving it was an annoyance to him. She, meanwhile, had been considering herself as an injured woman ever since the evening of the day of Roger's departure. What business had any one to speak as if the chances of Osborne's life being prolonged were infinitely small, if in fact the matter was uncertain? She liked Osborne extremely, much better than Roger, and would gladly have schemed to secure him for Cynthia, if she had not shrunk from the notion of her daughter's becoming a widow. For if Mrs. Gibson had ever felt anything acutely, it was the death of Mr. Kirkpatrick. And amiably callous as she was in most things, she recoiled from exposing her daughter wilfully to the same kind of suffering which she herself had experienced. But if she had only known Dr. Nicholls' opinion, she would never have favoured Roger's suit, never. And then Mr. Gibson himself, why was he so cold and reserved in his treatment of her since that night of explanation? She had done nothing wrong, yet she was treated as though she were in disgrace, and everything about the house was flat just now. She even missed the little excitement of Roger's visits, and the watching of his attentions to Cynthia. Cynthia, too, was silent enough, and as for Molly, she was absolutely dull and out of spirits, a state of mind so annoying to Mrs. Gibson just now, that she vented some of her discontent upon the poor girl, from whom she feared neither complaint nor repartee. End of chapter 35 
Chapter thirty six Domestic Diplomacy The evening of the day on which Mr. Gibson had been to see the squire, the three women were alone in the drawing room, for Mr. Gibson had had a long round and was not as yet come in. They had had to wait dinner for him, and for some time after his return there was nothing done or said but what related to the necessary business of eating. Mr. Gibson was, perhaps, as well satisfied with his day's work as any of the four, for this visit to the squire had been weighing on his mind ever since he had heard of the state of things between Roger and Cynthia. He did not like the having to go and tell of a love affair so soon after he had declared his belief that no such thing existed. It was a confession of fallibility which is distasteful to most men. If the squire had not been of so unsuspicious and simple a nature, he might have drawn his own conclusions from the apparent concealment of facts, and felt doubtful of Mr. Gibson's perfect honesty in the business. But being what he was, there was no danger of such unjust misapprehension. Still Mr. Gibson knew the hot, hasty temper he had to deal with, and had expected more violence of language than he really encountered and the last arrangement by which Cynthia, her mother, and Molly, who, as Mr. Gibson thought to himself and smiled at the thought, was sure to be a peacemaker and a sweetener of intercourse, were to go into the hall and make acquaintance with the squire, appeared like a great success to Mr. Gibson, for achieving which he took not a little credit to himself. Altogether he was more cheerful and bland than he had been for many days, and when he came up into the drawing-room for a few minutes after dinner, before going out again to see his town patients, he whistled a little under his breath, as he stood with his back to the fire, looking at Cynthia, and thinking that he had not done her justice when describing her to the squire. Now this soft, almost tuneless whistling was to Mr. Gibson what purring is to a cat. He could no more have done it with an anxious case on his mind, or when he was annoyed by human folly, or when he was hungry, than he could have flown through the air. Molly knew all this by instinct, and was happy without being aware of it, as soon as she heard the low whistle which was no music after all. But Mrs. Gibson did not like this trick of her husband's. It was not refined, she thought, not even artistic. If she could have called it by this fine word it would have compensated her for the want of refinement. To-night it was particularly irritating to her nerves. But since her conversation with Mr. Gibson about Cynthia's engagement, she had not felt herself in a sufficiently good position to complain. Mr. Gibson began, "'Well, Cynthia, I have seen the squire to thee, and made a clean breast of it." Cynthia looked up quickly, questioning with her eyes. Molly stopped her netting to listen. No one spoke. "'You're all to go there on Thursday to lunch. He asked you all, and I promised for you.' Still no reply. Natural, perhaps, but very flat. "'You'll be glad of that, Cynthia, shan't you?' asked Mr. Gibson. It may be a little formidable, but I hope it will be the beginning of a good understanding between you." "'Thank you,' said she, with an effort. "'But—but but won't it make it public? I do so wish not to have it known, or talked about, not till he comes back, or close upon the marriage." "'I don't see how it should make it public,' said Mr. Gibson. "'My wife goes to lunch with my friend, and takes her daughters with her. There's nothing in that, is there?' "'I'm not sure that I shall go.' put in Mrs. Gibson. She did not know why she said it, for she fully intended to go all the time, but having said it she was bound to stick to it for a little while, and, with such a husband as hers, the hard necessity was sure to fall upon her of having to find a reason for her saying. Then it came, quick and sharp. "'Why not?' he said, turning round upon her. "'Oh! Because—because because I think he ought to have called on Cynthia first. I've that sort of sensitiveness. I can't bear to think of her being slighted because she is poor." "'Nonsense,' said Mr. Gibson. "'I do assure you, no slight whatever was intended. He does not wish to speak about the engagement to any one, not even to Osborne. That's your wish, too, isn't it, Cynthia? Nor does he intend to mention it to any of you when you go there. But naturally enough he wants to make acquaintance with his future daughter-in-law. If he deviated so much from his usual course as to come calling here, I am sure I don't want him to come calling here," said Mrs. Gibson, interrupting. He was not so very agreeable the only time he did come. But I am that sort of a character that I cannot put up with any neglect of persons I love, just because they are not smiled upon by fortune." She sighed a little ostentatiously as she ended her sentence. "'Well, then, you won't go,' said Mr. Gibson, provoked but not wishing to have a long discussion, especially as he felt his temper going. "'Do you wish it, Cynthia?' 
said Mrs. Gibson, anxious for an excuse to yield. But her daughter was quite aware of this motive for the question, and replied quietly, "'Not particularly, mamma. I am quite willing to refuse the invitation.' "'It is already accepted,' said Mr. Gibson, almost ready to vow that he would never again meddle in any affair in which women were concerned, which would effectually shut him out from all love affairs for the future. He had been touched by the squire's relenting, pleased with what he had thought would give others pleasure, and this was the end of it. "'Oh, do go, Cynthia,' said Molly, pleading with her eyes as well as her words. "'Do go. I am sure you will like the squire, and it is such a pretty place, and he'll be so much disappointed.' "'I should not like to give up my dignity,' said Cynthia demurely. "'And you heard what mamma said.' It was very malicious of her. She fully intended to go, and was equally sure that her mother was already planning her dress for the occasion in her mind. Mr. Gibson, however, who, surgeon though he was, had never learnt to anatomize a woman's heart, took it all literally, and was excessively angry both with Cynthia and her mother, so angry that he did not dare to trust himself to speak. He went quickly to the door, intending to leave the room, but his wife's voice arrested him. She said, "'My dear, do you wish me to go? If you do, I will put my own feelings on one side.' "'Of course I do,' he said, short and stern, and left the room. "'Then I'll go,' said she, in the voice of a victim. Those words were meant for him, but he hardly heard them. "'And we'll have a fly from the George, and get a livery-coat for Thomas, which I have long been wanting, only dear Mr. Gibson did not like it. But on an occasion like this I'm sure he won't mind, and Thomas shall go in the box, and—' "'But, mamma, I've my feelings, too,' said Cynthia. "'Nonsense, child, when all is so nicely arranged, too.' So they went on the day appointed. Mr. Gibson was aware of the change of plans, and that they were going after all, but he was so much annoyed by the manner in which his wife had received an invitation that appeared to him so much kinder than he had expected from his previous knowledge of the squire, and his wishes on the subject of his son's marriage, that Mrs. Gibson heard neither interest nor curiosity expressed by her husband as to the visit itself, or the reception they met with. Cynthia's indifference as to whether the invitation was accepted or not had displeased Mr. Gibson. He was not up to her ways with her mother, and did not understand how much of this said indifference had been assumed in order to countervent Mrs. Gibson's affectation and false sentiment. But for all his annoyance on the subject, he was, in fact, very curious to know how the visit had gone off, and took the first opportunity of being alone with Molly to question her about the lunch of the day before at Hamley Hall. "'And so you went to Hamley yesterday after all?' "'Yes, I thought you would have come. The squire seemed quite to expect you.' "'I thought of going there at first, but I changed my mind like other people. I don't see why women are to have a monopoly of changeableness. Well, how did it go off? Pleasantly, I suppose, for both your mother and Cynthia were in high spirits last night.' "'Yes, the dear old squire was in his best dress and on his best behaviour, and was so prettily attentive to Cynthia, and she looked so lovely walking about with him and listening to all his talk about the garden and farm. Mamma was tired and stopped indoors, so they got on very well, and saw a great deal of each other." "'And my little girl trotted behind?' "'Oh, yes. You know I was almost at home. And besides, of course—' Molly went very red, and left the sentence unfinished. "'Do you think she's worthy of him?' asked her father, just as if she had completed her speech. Of Roger, papa. Oh, who is? But she is very sweet, and very, very charming." "'Very charming, if you will, but somehow I don't quite understand her. Why does she want all this secrecy? Why was she not more eager to go and pay her duty to Roger's father? She took it as coolly as if I had asked her to go to church." "'I don't think she did take it coolly. I don't believe I quite understand her either. But I love her dearly all the same." <laughs> I like to understand people thoroughly, but I know it's not necessary to women. Do you really think she's worthy of him?" "'Oh, papa,' said Molly, and then she stopped. She wanted to speak in favour of Cynthia, but somehow she could form no reply that pleased her to this repeated inquiry. He did not seem to much care whether he got an answer or not, for he went on with his own thoughts, and the result was that he asked Molly if Cynthia had heard from Roger. "'Yes, on Wednesday morning. Did she show it to you? But of course not. Besides, I read the squire's letter which told all about him." 
Now Cynthia, rather to Molly's surprise, had told her that she might read the letter if she liked, and Molly had shrunk from availing herself of the permission for Roger's sake. She thought that he would probably have poured out his heart to the one sole person, and that it was not fair to listen, as it were, to his confidences. "'Was Osborne at home?' asked Mr. Gibson. The squire said he did not think he would have come back, but the young fellow was so uncertain. "'No, he was still from home.' Then Molly blushed all over crimson, for it suddenly struck her that Osborne was probably with his wife, that mysterious wife, of whose existence she was cognizant, but of whom she knew so little, and of whom her father knew nothing. Mr. Gibson noticed the blush with anxiety. What did it mean? It was troublesome enough to find that one of the squire's precious sons had fallen in love with the prohibited ranks, and what would not have to be said and done if anything fresh were to come out between Osborne and Molly? He spoke out at once to relieve himself of this new apprehension. "'Molly, I was taken by surprise by this affair between Cynthia and Roger Hamley. If there is anything more on the tapis, let me know at once, honestly and openly. I know it's an awkward question for you to reply to, but I wouldn't ask it unless I had good reasons.' He took her hand as she spoke. She looked up at him with clear, truthful eyes, which filled with tears as she spoke. She did not know why the tears came. Perhaps it was because she was not as strong as formerly. "'If you mean that you're afraid that Osborne thinks of me as Roger thinks of Cynthia, papa, you are quite mistaken. Osborne and I are friends and nothing more, and never can be anything more. That's all I can tell you.' "'It's quite enough, little one. It's a great relief. I don't want to have my Molly carried off by any young man just yet. I should miss her sadly.' He could not help saying this in the fullness of his heart just then but he was surprised at the effect these few tender words produced. Molly threw her arms round his neck and began to sob bitterly, her head lying on his shoulder. "'There, there,' he said, patting her on the back, and leading her to the sofa. "'That will do. I get quite enough of tears in the day, shed for real causes, not to want them at home, where I hope they are shed for no cause at all. There's nothing really the matter, is there, my dear?' he continued holding her a little way from him that he might look in her face. She smiled at him through her tears, and he did not see the look of sadness which returned to her face after he had left her. "'Nothing. Dear, dear papa, nothing now. It is such a comfort to have you all to myself. It makes me happy.' Mr. Gibson knew all implied in these words, and felt that there was no effectual help for the state of things which had arisen from his own act. It was better for them both that they should not speak out more fully. So he kissed her, and said, "'That's right, dear. I can leave you in comfort now. And indeed I've stayed too long already gossiping. Go out and have a walk. Take Cynthia with you if you like. I must be off. Good-bye, little one.' His commonplace words acted like an astringent on Molly's relaxed feelings. He intended that they should do so. It was the truest kindness to her. But he walked away from her with a sharp pang at his heart which he stunned into numbness as soon as he could, by throwing himself violently into the affairs and cares of others. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 A Fluke and What Came of It The honour and glory of having a lover of her own was soon to fall to Molly's share, though to be sure it was a little deduction from the honour that the man who came with the full intention of proposing to her ended by making Cynthia an offer. It was Mr. Cox, who came back to Hollingford to follow out the purpose he had announced to Mr. Gibson nearly two years before, of inducing Molly to become his wife as soon as he should have succeeded to his uncle's estate. He was now a rich, though still a red-haired, young man. He came to the George Inn, bringing his horses and his groom, not that he was going to ride much, but that he thought such outward signs of his riches might help on his suit, and he was so justly modest in his estimation of himself that he believed that he needed all extraneous aid. He piqued himself on his constancy, and indeed, considering that he had been so much restrained by his duty, his affection, and his expectations to his crabbed old uncle, that he had not been able to go much into society, and very rarely indeed into the company of young ladies, such fidelity to Molly was very meritorious, at least in his own eyes. Mr. Gibson, too, was touched by it, and made it a point of honour to give him a fair field, 
all the time sincerely hoping that Molly would not be such a goose as to lend a willing ear to a youth who could never remember the difference between apophysis and epiphysis. He thought it as well not to tell his wife more of Mr. Cox's antecedents than that he had been a former pupil, who had relinquished, all that he knew of, understood, the medical profession because an old uncle had left him enough money to be idle. Mrs. Gibson, who felt that she had somehow lost her place in her husband's favour, took it into her head that she could reinstate herself if she was successful in finding a good match for his daughter Molly. She knew that her husband had forbidden her to try for this end, as distinctly as words could express a meaning, but her own words so seldom expressed her meaning, or if they did, she held to her opinions so loosely, that she had no idea but that it was the same with other people. Accordingly she gave Mr. Cox a very sweet and gracious welcome. "'It is such a pleasure to me to make acquaintance with the former pupils of my husband. He has spoken to me so often of you that I quite feel as if you were one of the family, as indeed I am sure that Mr. Gibson considers you.' Mr. Cox felt much flattered, and took the words as a happy omen for his love affair. "'Is Miss Gibson in?' asked he, blushing violently. "'I knew her formerly. That is to say, I lived in the same house with her for more than two years, and it would be a great pleasure to—' to certainly i am sure she will be glad to see you i sent her and cynthia you don't know my daughter cynthia i think mr cox she and molly are such great friends out for a brisk walk this frosty day but i think they will soon come back she went on saying agreeable nothings to the young man who received her attentions with a certain complacency but was all the time much more engaged in listening to the well-remembered click at the front door the shutting it to again with household care, and the sound of the familiar bounding footstep on the stair. At last they came. Cynthia entered first, bright and blooming, fresh colour in her cheeks and lips, fresh brilliance in her eyes. She looked startled at the sight of a stranger, and for an instant she stopped short at the door as if taken by surprise. Then in came Molly softly behind her, smiling, happy, dimpled, but not such a glowing beauty as Cynthia. "'Oh, Mr. Cox, is it you?' said she, going up to him with an outstretched hand, and greeting him with simple friendliness. "'Yes, it seems such a long time since I saw you. You were grown so much—so much—well, I suppose I mustn't say what,' he replied, speaking hurriedly, and holding her hand all the time, rather to her discomfiture. Then Mrs. Gibson introduced her daughter, and the two girls spoke of the enjoyment of their walk. Mr. Cox marred his cause in that very first interview, if indeed he could ever have had any chance, by his precipitancy in showing his feelings, and Mrs. Gibson helped him to mar it by trying to assist him. Molly lost her open friendliness of manner, and began to shrink away from him in a way which he thought was a very ungrateful return for all his faithfulness to her these two years past, and after all she was not the wonderful beauty his fancy or his love had painted her. The Miss Kirkpatrick was far more beautiful and much easier of access. For Cynthia put on all her pretty airs, her look of intent interest in what any one was saying to her, let the subject be what it would, as if it was the thing she cared most about in the whole world. Her unspoken deference, in short, all the unconscious ways she possessed by instinct of tickling the vanity of men. So, while Molly quietly repelled him, Cynthia drew him to her by her soft, attractive ways, and his constancy fell before her charms. He was thankful that he had not gone too far with Molly, and grateful to Mr. Gibson for having prohibited all declarations two years ago, for Cynthia, and Cynthia alone, could make him happy. After a fortnight's time, during which he had entirely veered round in his allegiance, he thought it desirable to speak to Mr. Gibson. He did so with a certain sense of exultation in his own correct behaviour in the affair, but at the same time feeling rather ashamed of the confession of his own changeableness, which was naturally involved. Now, it had so happened that Mr. Gibson had been unusually little at home during the fortnight that Mr. Cox had ostensibly lodged at the George, but in reality had spent the greater part of his time at Mr. Gibson's house, so that he had seen very little of his former pupil, and on the whole had thought him improved, especially after Molly's manner had made her father pretty sure that Mr. Cox stood no chance in that quarter. But Mr. Gibson was quite ignorant of the attraction which Cynthia had had for the young man. If he had perceived it, he would have nipped it in the bud pretty quickly, for he had no notion of any girl, even though only partially engaged to one man, receiving offers from others, if a little plain speaking could prevent it. 
Mr. Cox had asked for a private interview. They were sitting in the old surgery, now called the consulting-room, but still retaining so much of its former self as to be the last place in which Mr. Cox could feel himself at ease. He was red up to the very roots of his red hair, and kept turning his glossy new hat round and round in his fingers, unable to find out the proper way of beginning his sentence, so at length he plunged in, grammar or no grammar. "'Mr. Gibson, I dare say you'll be surprised. I'm sure I am at—at what I want to say. But I think it's the part of an honourable man, as you said yourself, sir, a year or two ago, to—to speak to the father first, and as you, sir, stand in the place of a father to Miss Kirkpatrick, I should like to express my feelings, my hopes, or perhaps I should say wishes, in short." "'Miss Kirkpatrick,' said Mr. Gibson, a good deal surprised. "'Yes, sir,' continued on Mr. Cox, rushing on he had got so far. "'I know it may appear inconsistent and changeable, but I do assure you I came here with a heart as faithful to your daughter as ever beat in a man's bosom. I most fully intended to offer myself and all that I had to her acceptance before I left. But really, sir, if you had seen her manner to me every time I endeavoured to press my suit a little, it was more than coy, it was absolutely repellent, there could be no mistaking it. While Miss Kirkpatrick—' He looked modestly down, and smoothed the nap of his hat, smiling a little while he did so. "'While Miss Kirkpatrick,' repeated Mr. Gibson, in such a stern voice, that Mr. Cox, landed Esquire as he now was, felt as much discomfited as he used to do when he was an apprentice, and Mr. Gibson had spoken to him in a similar manner. "'I was only going to say, sir, that so far as one can judge from manner and willingness to listen, and apparent pleasure in my visits, altogether, I think, I may venture to hope that Miss Kirkpatrick is not quite indifferent to me, and I would wait—you have no objection, have you, sir, to my speaking to her, I mean?' said Mr. Cox, a little anxious at the expression on Mr. Gibson's face. "'I do assure you I haven't a chance with Miss Gibson,' he continued, not knowing what to say and fancying that his inconstancy was rankling in Mr. Gibson's mind. "'No, I don't suppose you have. Don't go and fancy it is that which is annoying me. You are mistaken about Miss Kirkpatrick, however. I don't believe she could ever have meant to give you encouragement.' Mr. Cox's face grew perceptibly paler. His feelings, if evanescent, were evidently strong. "'I think, sir, if you could have seen her—I don't consider myself vain, and manner is so difficult to describe. At any rate, you could have no objections to my taking my chance of speaking to her." "'Of course, if you won't be convinced other ways, I can have no objection. But if you'll take my advice, you will spare yourself the pain of a refusal. I may, perhaps, be trenching on confidence, but I think I ought to tell you that her affections are otherwise engaged." "'It cannot be,' said Mr. Cox. "'Mr. Gibson, there must be some mistake. I think I have gone as far as I dared in expressing my feelings, and her manner has been most gracious. I don't think she could have misunderstood my meaning. Perhaps she has changed her mind. It is possible that, after consideration, she has learnt to prefer another, is it not?" "'By another you mean yourself, I suppose. I can believe in such inconstancy.' He could not help, in his own mind, giving a slight sneer at the instance before him. But I should be very sorry to think that Miss Kirkpatrick could be guilty of it. But she may. It is a chance. Will you allow me to see her?" "'Certainly, my poor fellow." For intermingled with a little contempt was a good deal of respect for the simplicity, the unworldliness, the strength of feeling, even though the feeling was evanescent. "'I will send her to you directly.' "'Thank you, sir. God bless you for a kind friend.' Mr. Gibson went upstairs to the drawing-room, where he was pretty sure he could find Cynthia. There she was, as bright and careless as usual, making up a bonnet for her mother, and chattering to Molly as she worked. "'Cynthia, you will oblige me by going down into my consulting-room at once. Mr. Cox wants to speak to you.' "'Mr. Cox,' said Cynthia, "'what can he want with me?' Evidently she answered her own question as soon as it was asked, for she coloured, and avoided meeting Mr. Gibson's severe, uncompromising look. As soon as she had left the room, Mr. Gibson sat down, and took up a new Edinburgh lying on the table, as an excuse for conversation. Was there anything in the article that made him say, after a minute or two, to Molly, who sat silent and wondering, "'Molly, you must never trifle with the love of an honest man. You don't know what pain you may give.' Presently Cynthia came back into the drawing-room, looking very much confused. 
Most likely she would not have returned if she had known that Mr. Gibson was still there, but it was such an unheard-of thing for him to be sitting in that room in the middle of the day, reading or making pretense to read, that she had never thought of his remaining. He looked up at her the moment she came in, so there was nothing for it but putting a bold face on it, and going back to her work. "'Is Mr. Cork still downstairs?' asked Mr. Gibson. "'No, he is gone. He asked me to give you both his kind regards. I believe he is leaving this afternoon.' Cynthia tried to make her manner as commonplace as possible, but she did not look up, and her voice trembled a little. Mr. Gibson went on looking at his book for several minutes, but Cynthia felt that more was coming, and only wished it would come quickly, for the severe silence was very hard to bear. It came at last. "'I trust this will never occur again, Cynthia,' said he, in grave displeasure. "'I should not feel satisfied with the conduct of any girl, however free, who could receive marked attentions from a young man with complacency, and so lead him on to make an offer which she never meant to accept. But what must I think of a young woman in your position, engaged, yet accepting most graciously, for that was the way Cox expressed it, the overtures of another man?' Do you consider what unnecessary pain you have given him by your thoughtless behaviour? I call it thoughtless, but it's the mildest epithet I can apply to it. I beg that such a thing may not occur again, or I shall be obliged to characterise it more severely." Molly could not imagine what more severely could be, for her father's manner appeared to her almost cruel in its sternness. Cynthia coloured up extremely, then went pale and at length raised her beautiful appealing eyes full of tears to Mr. Gibson. He was touched by that look, but he resolved immediately not to be mollified by any of her physical charms of expression, but to keep to his sober judgment of her conduct. "'Please, Mr. Gibson, hear my side of the story before you speak so hardly to me. I did not mean to—to to flirt. I merely meant to make myself agreeable. I can't help doing that and that goose of a Mr. Cox seems to have fancied I meant to give him encouragement." "'Do you mean that you were not aware that he was falling in love with you?' Mr. Gibson was melting into a readiness to be convinced by that sweet voice and pleading face. "'Well, I suppose I must speak truly.' Cynthia blushed and smiled, ever so little, but it was a smile, and it hardened Mr. Gibson's heart again. "'I did think once or twice that he was becoming a little more complimentary than the occasion required. But I hate throwing cold water on people, and I never thought he could take it into his silly head to fancy himself seriously in love, and to make such a fuss at the last, after only a fortnight's acquaintance." "'You seem to have been pretty well aware of his silliness. I should rather call it simplicity. Don't you think you should have remembered that it might lead him to exaggerate what you were doing, and saying, into encouragement?" "'Perhaps. I dare say I am all wrong, and that he is all right,' said Cynthia peaked and pouting. We used to say in France that les absents ont toujours tort, but really it seems as if here—' She stopped. She was unwilling to be impertinent to a man whom she respected and liked. She took up another point of her defence, and rather made matters worse. Besides, Roger would not allow me to consider myself as finally engaged to him. I would willingly have done it, but he would not let me." "'Nonsense! Don't let us go on talking about it, Cynthia. I have said all that I mean to say. I believe that you are only thoughtless, as I told you before. But don't let it happen again." He left the room at once, to put a stop to the conversation, the continuance of which would serve no useful purpose, and perhaps end by irritating him. "'Not guilty. But we recommend the prisoner not to do it again. It's pretty much that, isn't it, Molly?' said Cynthia, letting her tears down fall even while she smiled. I do believe your father might make a good woman of me yet, if he would only take the pains and wasn't quite so severe. And to think of that stupid little fellow making all this mischief! He pretended to take it to heart, as if he had loved me for years, instead of only for days. I dare say only for hours, if the truth were told." "'I was afraid he was becoming very fond of you,' said Molly. At least it struck me once or twice, but I knew he could not stay long, and I thought it would only make you uncomfortable if I said anything about it but now I wish I had." "'It wouldn't have made a bit of difference,' replied Cynthia. "'I knew he liked me, and I like to be liked. It's born in me to try to make every one I come near fond of me, but then they shouldn't carry it too far, for it becomes very troublesome if they do. I shall hate red-haired people for the rest of my life. To think of such a man as that being the cause of your father's displeasure with me!' 
Molly had a question at her tongue's end that she longed to put. She knew it was indiscreet, but at last it came out almost against her will. "'Shall you tell Roger about it?' Cynthia replied. "'I have not thought about it. No, I don't think I shall. There's no need. Perhaps if we are ever married—' "'Ever married?' said Molly, under her breath. But Cynthia took no notice of the exclamation, until she had finished the sentence which it interrupted. "'And I can see his face and know his mood. I may tell it him then, but not in writing, and when he is absent it might annoy him.' "'I am afraid it would make him uncomfortable,' said Molly, simply. "'And yet it must be so pleasant to be able to tell him everything, all your difficulties and troubles.' "'Yes, only I don't worry him with these things. It's better to write him merry letters, and cheer him up among the black folk. You repeated ever married a little while ago. Do you know, Molly, I don't think I ever shall be married to him? I don't know why, but I have a strong presentiment, so it's just as well not to tell him all my secrets, for it would be awkward for him to know them if it never came off." Molly dropped her work and sat silent, looking into the future. At length she said, "'I think it would break his heart, Cynthia.' "'Nonsense! Why, I'm sure that Mr. Cox came here with the intention of falling in love with you. You needn't blush so violently. I'm sure you saw it as plainly as I did, only you made yourself disagreeable, and I took pity on him, and consoled his wounded vanity." "'Can you? Do you dare to compare Roger Hamley to Mr. Cox?' asked Molly indignantly. "'No. No, I don't,' said Cynthia in a moment. They are as different as men can be. Don't be so dreadfully serious over everything, Molly. You look as oppressed with sad reproach as if I had been passing on to you the scolding your father gave me." "'Because I don't think you value Roger as you ought, Cynthia,' said Molly stoutly, for it required a good deal of courage to force herself to say this, although she could not tell why she shrank so from speaking. "'Yes, I do. It's not in my nature to go into ecstasies, and I don't suppose I shall ever be what people call in love. But I am glad he loves me, and I like to make him happy and I think him the best and most agreeable man I know, always excepting your father, when he isn't angry with me. What can I say more, Molly? Would you like me to say I think him handsome?" "'I know most people think him plain, but—' "'Well, I'm of the opinion of most people, then, and small blame to them. But I like his face, oh, ten thousand times better than Mr. Preston's handsomeness." For the first time during the conversation, Cynthia seemed thoroughly in earnest. Why Mr. Preston was introduced neither she nor Molly knew. It came up and out by a sudden impulse. But a fierce look came into the eyes, and the soft lips contracted themselves as Cynthia named his name. Molly had noticed this look before, always at the mention of this one person. "'Cynthia, what makes you dislike Mr. Preston so much?' "'Don't you? Why do you ask me?' "'And yet, Molly,' said she, suddenly relaxing into depression, not merely in tone and look, but in the droop of her limbs. "'Molly, what should you think of me if I married him after all?' "'Married him? Has he ever asked you?' But Cynthia, instead of replying to this question, went on uttering her own thoughts. "'More unlikely things have happened. Have you never heard of strong wills mesmerizing weaker ones into submission? One of the girls at Madame Lefebvre's went out as a governess to a Russian family who lived near Moscow. I sometimes think I'll write to her to find me a situation in Russia, just to get out of the daily chance of seeing that man." "'But sometimes you seem quite intimate with him, and talk to him." "'How can I help it?' said Cynthia impatiently. Then recovering herself, she added, "'We knew him so well at Ashcombe, and he's not a man to be easily thrown off, I can tell you. I must be civil to him. It's not from liking, and he knows it's not, for I've told him so. However, we won't talk about him. I don't know how he came to do it, I'm sure. The mere fact of his existence and of his being within half a mile of us is bad enough. How oh, I wish Roger was at home and rich and could marry me at once, and carry me away from that man! If I'd thought of it, I really believe I would have taken poor red-haired Mr. Cox." "'I don't understand it at all,' said Molly. "'I dislike Mr. Preston, but I should never think of taking such violent steps as you speak of to get away from the neighbourhood in which he lives." "'No, because you are a reasonable little darling,' said Cynthia, resuming her usual manner and coming up to Molly and kissing her. "'At least you'll acknowledge that I'm a good hater.' "'Yes, but I still don't understand it.' "'Oh, never mind,' 
There are old complications with our affairs at Ashcombe. Money matters are at the root of it all. Horrid poverty! Do let us talk of something else. Or better still, let me go and finish my letter to Roger, or I shall be too late for the African mail. Isn't it gone? Oh, I ought to have reminded you. It will be too late. Did you not see the notice at the post-office that letters ought to be in London on the morning of the tenth instead of the evening? Oh, I am so sorry. So am I, but it can't be helped. It is to be hoped it will leave greater treat when he does get it. I have a far greater weight on my heart, because your father seems so displeased with me. I was fond of him, and now he is making me quite a coward. You see, Molly," continued she, a little piteously, I have never lived with people with such a high standard of conduct before, and I don't know quite how to behave." "'You must learn,' said Molly tenderly. "'You'll find Roger quite as strict in his notions of right and wrong.' "'Ah, but he is in love with me,' said Cynthia, with a pretty consciousness of her power. Molly turned away her head and was silent. It was of no use combating the truth, and she tried rather not to feel it. Not to feel, poor girl, that she too had a great weight on her heart, into the cause of which she shrank from examining. That whole winter long she had felt as if her sun was all shrouded over with grey mist, and could no longer shine brightly for her. She wakened up in the morning with a dull sense of something being wrong. The world was out of joint, and if she were born to set it right, she did not know how to do it. Blind herself as she would, she could not help perceiving that her father was not satisfied with the wife he had chosen. For a long time Molly had been surprised at his apparent contentment. Sometimes she had been unselfish enough to be glad that he was satisfied, but still more frequently nature would have its way, and she was almost irritated at what she considered his blindness. Something, however, had changed him now, something that had arisen at the time of Cynthia's engagement. He had become nervously sensitive to his wife's failings, and his whole manner had grown dry and sarcastic, not merely to her, but also to Cynthia, and even, but this very rarely, to Molly herself. He was not a man to go into passions or ebullitions of feeling. They would have relieved him, even while degrading him in his own eyes. But he became hard, and occasionally bitter in his speeches and ways. Molly now learnt to long after the vanished blindness in which her father had passed the first year of his marriage, yet there were no outrageous infractions of domestic peace. Some people might say that Mr. Gibson accepted the inevitable. He told himself, in more homely phrase, that it was no use crying over spilt milk. And he, from principle, avoided all actual dissensions with his wife, preferring to cut short a discussion by a sarcasm or by leaving the room. Moreover, Mrs. Gibson had a very tolerable temper of her own, and her cat-like nature purred and delighted in smooth ways, and a pleasant quietness. She had no great facility for understanding sarcasm. It is true it disturbed her, but as she was not quick at deciphering any depth of meaning, and felt it unpleasant to think about it, she forgot it as soon as possible. Yet she saw she was often in some kind of disfavour with her husband, and it made her uneasy. She resembled Cynthia in this. She liked to be liked and she wanted to regain the esteem which she did not perceive she had lost for ever. Molly sometimes took her stepmother's part in secret. She felt as if she herself could never have borne her father's hard speeches so patiently. They would have cut her to the heart, and she must either have demanded an explanation, and probed the sore to the bottom, or sat down despairing and miserable. Instead of which Mrs. Gibson, after her husband had left the room, on these occasions would say in a manner more bewildered than hurt, I think dear papa seems a little put out to-day. We must see that he has a dinner that he likes when he comes home. I have often perceived that everything depends on making a man comfortable in his own house." And thus she went on, groping about to find the means of reinstating herself in his good graces, really trying, according to her lights, till Molly was often compelled to pity her in spite of herself, and although she saw that her stepmother was the cause of her father's increased astringency of disposition for, indeed, he had got into that kind of exaggerated susceptibility with regard to his wife's faults, which may best be typified by the state of bodily irritation that is produced by the constant recurrence of any particular noise. Those who are brought within hearing of it are apt to be always on the watch for the repetition, if they are once made to notice it, and are in an irritable state of nerves. So that poor Molly had not passed a cheerful winter, independently of any private sorrows that she might have in her own heart. She did not look well, either. She was gradually falling into low health, rather than bad health. Her heart beat more feebly and slower. The vivifying stimulant of hope, even unacknowledged hope, 
was gone out of her life. It seemed as if there was not, and never could be in this world, any help for the dumb discordancy between her father and his wife. Day after day, month after month, year after year would Molly have to sympathize with her father and pity her stepmother, feeling acutely for both, and certainly more than Mrs. Gibson felt for herself. Molly could not imagine how she had at one time wished for her father's eyes to be opened, and how she could ever have fancied that if they were, he would be able to change things in Mrs. Gibson's character. It was all hopeless, and the only attempt at a remedy was to think about it as little as possible. Then Cynthia's ways and manners about Roger gave Molly a great deal of uneasiness. She did not believe that Cynthia cared enough for him, at any rate, not with the sort of love that she herself would have bestowed, if she had been so happy. No, that was not it, if she had been in Cynthia's place. She felt as if she should have gone to him both hands held out, full and brimming over with tenderness, and been grateful for every word of precious confidence bestowed on her. Yet Cynthia received his letters with a kind of carelessness, and read them with a strange indifference, while Molly sat at her feet, so to speak, looking up at her with eyes as wistful as a dog's waiting for crumbs, and such chance beneficence. She tried to be patient on these occasions, but at last she must ask, "'Where is he, Cynthia? What does he say?' By this time Cynthia had put down the letter on the table by her, smiling a little from time to time, as she remembered the loving compliments it contained. "'Where? Oh, I didn't look exactly. Somewhere in Abyssinia. Huon. I can't read the word and it doesn't much signify, for it would give me no idea." "'Is he well?' asked greedy Molly. "'Yes, now. He has had a slight touch of fever, he says, but it's all over now, and he hopes he is getting acclimatized. "'A fever? And who took care of him? He would want nursing, and so far from home. Oh, Cynthia!' "'Oh, I don't fancy he had any nursing, poor fellow. One doesn't expect nursing and hospitals and doctors in Abyssinia. But he had plenty of quinine with him and I suppose that is the best specific. At any rate, he says he is quite well now." Molly sat silent for a minute or two. "'What is the date of the letter, Cynthia?' "'I didn't look. December the—December the tenth. "'That's nearly two months ago,' said Molly. "'Yes, but I determined I wouldn't worry myself with useless anxiety when he went away. If anything did—go wrong, you know,' said Cynthia, using a euphemism for death, as most people do. It is an ugly word to speak plain out in the midst of life. It would be all over before I even heard of his illness, and I could be of no use to him. Could I, Molly?" "'No, I dare say it is all very true, only I should think the squire could not take it so easily. I always write him a little note when I hear from Roger, but I don't think I'll name this touch of fever. Shall I, Molly?" "'I don't know,' said Molly. People say one ought, but I almost wish I hadn't heard it. Please, does he say anything else so that I may hear?" "'Oh, lovers' letters are so silly, and I think this is sillier than usual,' said Cynthia, looking over her letter again. "'Here's a piece you may read, from that line to that,' indicating two places. I haven't read it myself, for it looked dullish, all about Aristotle and Pliny, and I want to get this bonnet-cap made up before we go out to pay our calls." Molly took the letter, the thought crossing her mind that he had touched it, had had his hands upon it in those far distant desert lands, where he might be lost to sight and to any human knowledge of his fate. Even now her pretty brown fingers almost caressed the flimsy paper with their delicacy of touch as she read. She saw references made to books, which with a little trouble would be accessible to her here in Hollingford. Perhaps the details and the references would make the letter dull and dry to some people, but not to her, thanks to his former teaching and the interest he had excited in her for his pursuits. But, as he said in apology, what had he to write about in that savage land but his love, and his researches, and travels? There was no society, no gaiety, no new books to write about, no gossip in Abyssinian wilds. Molly was not in strong health, and perhaps this made her a little fanciful, but certain it is that her thoughts by day and her dreams by night were haunted by the idea of Roger lying ill and untended in those savage lands. Her constant prayer, Oh, my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it," came from a heart as true as that of the real mother in King Solomon's judgment. Let him live, let him live, even though I may never set eyes upon him again. Have pity upon his father, grant that he may come home safe, and live happily with her whom he loves so tenderly, 
so tenderly, O oh God!" And then she would burst into tears, and drop asleep at last, sobbing. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 Mr. Kirkpatrick, Q.C. Cynthia was always the same with Molly, kind, sweet-tempered, ready to help, professing a great deal of love for her, and probably feeling as much as she did for any one in the world. But Molly had reached to this superficial depth of affection and intimacy in the first few weeks of Cynthia's residence in her father's house, and if she had been of a nature prone to analyze the character of one whom she loved dearly, she might have perceived that, with all Cynthia's apparent frankness, there were certain limits beyond which her confidence did not go. Where her reserve began, and her real self was shrouded in mystery. For instance, her relations with Mr. Preston were often very puzzling to Molly. She was sure that there had been a much greater intimacy between them formerly at Ashcombe, and that the remembrance of this was often very galling and irritating to Cynthia, who was as evidently desirous of forgetting it as he was anxious to make her remember it. But why this intimacy had ceased, why Cynthia disliked him so extremely now, and many other unexplained circumstances connected with these two facts, were Cynthia's secrets and she effectually baffled all Molly's innocent attempts during the first glow of her friendship for Cynthia, to learn the girlish antecedents of her companion's life. Every now and then Molly came to a dead wall, beyond which she could not pass, at least with the delicate instruments which were all she chose to use. Perhaps Cynthia might have told all there was to tell to a more forcible curiosity, which knew how to improve every slip of the tongue and every fit of temper to its own gratification. But Molly's was the interest of affection, not the coarser desire of knowing everything for a little excitement, and as soon as she saw that Cynthia did not wish to tell her anything about that period of her life, Molly left off referring to it. But if Cynthia had preserved a sweet tranquillity of manner and an unvarying kindness for Molly during the winter of which there is question, at present she was the only person to whom the beauty's ways were unchanged. Mr. Gibson's influence had been good for her as long as she saw that he liked her. She had tried to keep as high a place in his good opinion as she could, and had curbed many a little sarcasm against her mother, and many a twisting of the absolute truth when he was by. Now there was a constant uneasiness about her, which made her more cowardly than before, and even her partisan, Molly, could not help being aware of the distinct equivocations she occasionally used when anything in Mr. Gibson's words or behaviour pressed her too hard. Her repartees to her mother were less frequent than they had been, but there was often the unusual phenomenon of pettishness in her behaviour to her. These changes in humour and disposition, here described all at once, were in themselves a series of delicate alterations of relative conduct spread over many months many winter months of long evenings and bad weather, which bring out discords of character, as a dash of cold water brings out the fading colours of an old fresco. During much of this time Mr. Preston had been at Ashcombe, for Lord Cumnor had not been able to find an agent whom he liked to replace Mr. Preston, and while the inferior situation remained vacant, Mr. Preston had undertaken to do the duties of both. Mrs. Goodenough had had a serious illness and the little society at Hollingford did not care to meet while one of their habitual set was scarcely out of danger. So there had been very little visiting, and though Miss Browning said that the absence of the temptations of society was very agreeable to cultivated minds, after the dissipations of the previous autumn, when there were parties every week to welcome Mr. Preston, yet Miss Phoebe let out in confidence that she and her sister had fallen into the habit of going to bed at nine o'clock, for they found cribbage night after night, from five o'clock till ten, rather too much of a good thing. To tell the truth, that winter, if peaceful, was monotonous in Hollingford, and the whole circle of gentility there was delighted to be stirred up in March by the intelligence that Mr. Kirkpatrick, the newly made Q.C., was coming on a visit for a couple of days to his sister-in-law, Mrs. Gibson. Mrs. Goodenough's room was the very centre of gossip. Gossip had been her daily bread through her life. Gossip was meat and wine to her now. "'Dear ah me!' 
said the old lady, rousing herself so as to sit upright in her easy-chair, and propping herself with her hands on the arms. "'Who would have thought she'd such grand relations? Why, Mr. Ashton told me once that a Queen's counsel was as like to be a judge as a kitten is like to be a cat, and to think of her being as good as a sister to a judge! I saw one once, and I know I thought as I shouldn't wish for a better winter cloak than his old robes would make me, if I could only find out where I could get him second hand. And I know she'd her silk gowns turned and dyed and cleaned, for aught I know, turned again while she lived at Ashcombe. Keeping a school, too, and so near akin to this Queen's Council all the time. Well, to be sure, it wasn't much of a school, only ten young ladies at the best of times, so perhaps he never heard of it. "'I've been wondering what they'll give him to dinner,' said Miss Browning. "'It is an unlucky time for visitors. No game to be had, and lamb so late this year, and chicken hardly to be had for love or money.' "'He'll have to put up with calf's head, that he will,' said Mrs. Goodenough solemnly. "'If I'd a got my usual health, I'd copy out a receipt of my grandmother's for a rolled calf's head, and send it to Mrs. Gibson. The doctor has been very kind to me all through this illness. I wish my daughter in Cumbermere would send me some autumn chickens. I'd pass them on to the doctor, that I would. But she's been a-killing of them all, and sending them to me, and the last she sent she wrote me word was the last." "'I wonder if they'll give a party for him,' suggested Miss Phoebe. "'I should like to see a Queen's Council for one in my life. I have seen javelin men, but that's the greatest thing in the legal line I ever came across." "'They'll ask Mr. Ashton, of course,' said Miss Browning. The three black graces, law, physic, and divinity, as the song calls them, whenever there's a second course, there's always the clergyman of the parish invited in any family of gentility." "'I wonder if he's married,' said Mrs. Goodenough. Miss Phoebe had been feeling the same wonder, but had not thought it maidenly to express it even to her sister, who was the source of knowledge, having met Mrs. Gibson in the street on her way to Mrs. Goodenough's. Yes, he's married, and must have several children, for Mrs. Gibson said that Cynthia Kirkpatrick had paid them a visit in London, to have lessons with her cousins. And she said that his wife was a most accomplished woman, and of good family, though she brought him no fortune. It's a very creditable connection, I'm sure. It's only a wonder to me as how we've had so little talk of it before," said Mrs. Goodenough. At the first look of the thing I shouldn't have thought Mrs. Gibson was one to hide away her fine relations under a bushel. Indeed, for that matter, were all of us fond of turning the best breadth of the gown to the front. I remember, speaking of breadths, how I've undone my skirts many a time and off to put a stain or a grease spot next to poor Mr. Goodenough. He'd a soft kind of heart when first we was married, and he said, says he, Patty, link thy right arm unto my left one, then thou'lt be nearer to my heart and so he kept up the habit, when poor man need a deal more to think on than romancing on which side his art lay, so as I said, I always put my damaged breaths on the right hand, and when we walked arm in arm, as we always did, no one was ever the wiser. "'I should not be surprised if he invited Cynthia to pay him another visit in London,' said Miss Browning. "'If he did it when he was poor, he's twenty times more likely to do it now he's a Queen's Council." Ay, work it by the rule of three, and she stands a good chance. I only hope it won't turn her head. Going up visiting in London at her age. Why, I was fifty before I ever went." "'But she has been in France. She's quite a travelled young lady,' said Miss Phoebe. Mrs. Goodenough shook her head for a whole minute before she gave vent to her opinion. "'It's a risk,' said she. "'A great risk. I don't like saying so to the doctor. But I shouldn't like having my daughter if I was him, so cheek by jowl with a girl as was brought up in the country where Robespierre and Bonaparte was born." "'But Bonaparte was a Corsican,' said Miss Browning, who was much farther advanced both in knowledge and in liberality of opinions than Mrs. Goodenough. And there's a great opportunity for cultivation of the mind afforded by intercourse with foreign countries. I always admire Cynthia's grace of manner, never too shy to speak, yet never putting herself forwards. She's quite a help to a party, and if she has a few airs and graces, why, they're natural at her age. Now, as for dear Molly, there's a kind of awkwardness about her. She broke one of our best china cups last time she was at party at our house, and spilt the coffee on the new carpet, and then she got so confused that she hardly did anything but sit in a corner and hold her tongue all the rest of the evening." "'She was so sorry for what she'd done, sister,' 
said Miss Phoebe, in a gentle tone of reproach. She was always faithful to Molly. "'Well, and did I say she wasn't? But was there any need for her to be stupid all the evening after?' "'But you were rather sharp, rather displeased.' "'And I think it my duty to be sharp, I and cross too, when I see young folks careless. And when I see my duty clear, I do it. I'm not one to shrink from it, and they ought to be grateful to me. It's not every one that will take the trouble of reproving them, as Mrs. Goodenough knows. I'm very fond of Molly Gibson, very, for her own sake, and for her mother's too. I'm not sure if I don't think she's worth half a dozen Cynthia's. But for all that, she shouldn't break my best china teacup, and then sit doing nothing for her livelihood all the rest of the evening." By this time Mrs. Goodenough gave evident signs of being tired. Molly's misdemeanours and Miss Browning's broken teacup were not as exciting subjects of conversation as Mrs. Gibson's newly discovered good luck in having a successful London lawyer for a relation. Mr. Kirkpatrick had been, like many other men, struggling on in his profession, and encumbered with a large family of his own. He was ready to do a good turn for his connections, if it occasioned him no loss of time, and if, which was perhaps a primary condition, he remembered their existence. Cynthia's visit to Doughty Street nine or ten years ago had not made much impression upon him, after he had once suggested its feasibility to his good-natured wife. He was even rather startled every now and then by the appearance of a pretty little girl amongst his own children, as they trooped in to dessert, and he had to remind himself who she was. But as it was his custom to leave the table almost immediately, and to retreat into a small back room called his study, to immerse himself in papers for the rest of the evening, the child had not made much impression upon him and probably the next time he remembered her existence was when Mrs. Kirkpatrick wrote to him to beg him to receive Cynthia for a night on her way to school at Boulogne. The same request was repeated on her return, but it so happened that he had not seen her either time, and only dimly remembered some remarks which his wife had made on one of those occasions, that it seemed to her rather hazardous to send so young a girl on so long a journey without making more provision for her safety than Mrs. Kirkpatrick had done. He knew that his wife would fill up all deficiencies in this respect as if Cynthia had been her own daughter, and thought no more about her until he received an invitation to attend Mrs. Kirkpatrick's wedding with Mr. Gibson, the highly esteemed surgeon of Hollingford, etc., etc., an attention which irritated instead of pleasing him. "'Does the woman think I have nothing to do but run about the country in search of brides and bridegrooms, when this great case of Houghton B. Houghton is coming on, and I haven't a moment to spare?' he asked of his wife. "'Perhaps she never heard of it,' suggested Mrs. Kirkpatrick. "'Nonsense! The case has been in the papers for days.' "'But she mayn't know you are engaged in it.' "'She mayn't,' said he meditatively. Such ignorance was possible. But now the great case of Houghton versus Houghton was a thing of the past. The hard struggle was over, the comparative table-land of Q.C.dom gained, and Mr. Kirkpatrick had leisure for family feeling and recollection. One day in the Easter vacation he found himself near Hollingford. He had a Sunday to spare, and he wrote to offer himself as a visitor to the Gibsons from Friday till Monday, expressing strongly, what he really felt in a less degree, his wish to make Mr. Gibson's acquaintance. Mr. Gibson, though often overwhelmed with professional business, was always hospitable, and moreover it was always a pleasure to him to get out of the somewhat confined mental atmosphere which he had breathed over and over again, and have a whiff of fresh air, a glimpse of what was passing in the great world beyond his daily limits of thought and action. So he was ready to give a cordial welcome to his unknown relation. Mrs. Gibson was in a flutter of sentimental delight, which she fancied was family affection, but which might not have been quite so effervescent, if Mr. Kirkpatrick had remained in his former position of struggling lawyer, with seven children, living in Doughty Street. When the two gentlemen met they were attracted towards each other by a similarity of character, with just enough difference in their opinions to make the experience of each, on which the opinions were based, valuable to the other. To Mrs. Gibson, although the bond between them counted for very little in their intercourse, Mr. Kirkpatrick paid very polite attention, and was in fact very glad that she had done so well for herself as to marry a sensible and agreeable man, who was able to keep her in comfort, and to behave to her daughter in so liberal a manner. Molly struck him as a delicate-looking girl, who might be very pretty if she had a greater look of health and animation. 
Indeed, looking at her critically, there were beautiful points about her face, long soft grey eyes, black curling eyelashes, rarely showing dimples, perfect teeth, but there was a languor over all, a slow depression of manner, which contrasted unfavourably with the brightly coloured Cynthia, sparkling, quick, graceful, and witty. As Mr. Kirkpatrick expressed it afterwards to his wife, he was quite in love with that girl, and Cynthia, as ready to captivate strangers as any little girl of three or four, rose to the occasion, forgot all her cares and despondencies, remembered no longer her regret at having lost something of Mr. Gibson's good opinion, and listened eagerly and made soft replies, intermixed with naive sallies of droll humour, till Mr. Kirkpatrick was quite captivated. He left Hollingford almost surprised to have performed a duty and found it a pleasure. For Mrs. Gibson and Molly he had a general friendly feeling, but he did not care if he never saw them again. But for Mr. Gibson he had a warm respect, a strong personal liking, which he should be glad to have ripen into a friendship, if there was time for it in this bustling world. And he fully resolved to see more of Cynthia. His wife must know her, they must have her up to stay with them in London, and show her something of the world. But, on returning home, Mr. Kirkpatrick found so much work awaiting him that he had to lock up embryo friendships and kindly plans in some safe closet of his mind, and give himself up, body and soul, to the immediate work of his profession. But in May he found time to take his wife to the Academy exhibition, and some portrait there striking him as being like Cynthia, he told his wife more about her and his visit to Hollingford than he had ever had leisure to do before, and the result was that on the next day, a letter was sent off to Mrs. Gibson, inviting Cynthia to pay a visit to her cousins in London, and reminding her of many little circumstances that had occurred when she was with them as a child, so as to carry on the clue of friendship from that time to the present. On its receipt, this letter was greeted in various ways by the four people who sat round the breakfast-table. Mrs. Gibson read it to herself first. Then, without telling what its contents were, so that her auditors were quite in the dark as to what her remarks applied, she said, I think they might have remembered that I am a generation nearer to them than she is, but nobody thinks of family affection nowadays. And I liked him so much, and bought a new cookery book, all to make it pleasant and agreeable, and what he was used to." She said all this in a plaintive, aggrieved tone of voice, but as no one knew to what she was referring, it was difficult to offer her consolation. Her husband was the first to speak. "'If you want us to sympathise with you, tell us what is the nature of your woe. Why, I dare say it's what he means is a very kind attention, only I think I ought to have been asked before Cynthia," said she, reading the letter over again. "'Who's he? And what's meant for a kind attention?' "'Mr. Kirkpatrick, to be sure. This letter is from him. And he wants Cynthia to go and pay them a visit, and he never says anything about you or me, my dear. And I'm sure we did our best to make it pleasant, and he should have asked us first, I think." "'As I couldn't possibly have gone. It makes very little difference to me." "'But I could have gone. And at any rate he should have paid us the compliment. It's only a proper mark of respect, you know. So ungrateful, too, when I gave up my dressing-room on purpose for him." "'And I dressed for dinner every day he was here, if we are each to recapitulate all our sacrifices on his behalf. But for all that I didn't expect to be invited to his house. I shall be only too glad if you will come again to mine." "'I've a great mind not to let Cynthia go,' said Mrs. Gibson, reflectively. "'I can't go, mamma," said Cynthia, colouring. "'My gowns are all so shabby, and my old bonnet must do for the summer.' "'Well, but you can buy a new one, and I'm sure it is high time you should get yourself another silk gown. You must have been saving up a great deal, for I don't know when you've had any new clothes.' Cynthia began to say something, but stopped short. She went on buttering her toast but she held it in her hand without eating it, without looking up either, as after a minute or two of silence she spoke again. "'I cannot go. I should like it very much, but I really cannot go. Please, mamma, write at once and refuse it.' "'Nonsense, child! When a man in Mr. Kirkpatrick's position comes forward to offer a favour, it does not do to decline it without giving it a sufficient response. So kind of him as it is, too!' "'Suppose you offer to go instead of me?' proposed Cynthia. "'No, no, that won't do,' said Mr. Gibson decidedly. "'You can't transfer invitations in that way. 
But really this excuse about your clothes does appear to be very trivial, Cynthia, if you have no other reason to give." "'It is a real true reason to me,' said Cynthia, looking up at him as she spoke. "'You must let me judge for myself. It would not do to go there in a state of shabbiness, for even in Doughty Street, I remember, my aunt was very particular about dress. And now that Margaret and Helen are grown up, and they visit so much, pray don't say anything more about it, for I know it would not do." "'What have you done with all your money, I wonder?' asked Mrs. Gibson. "'You've twenty pounds a year, thanks to Mr. Gibson and me, and I'm sure you haven't spent more than ten. "'I hadn't many things when I came back from France,' said Cynthia, in a low voice, and evidently troubled by all this questioning. "'Pray let it be decided at once. I can't go, and there's an end of it." She got up and left the room rather suddenly. "'I don't understand it at all,' said Mrs. Gibson. "'Do you, Molly?' "'No, I know she doesn't like spending money on her dress, and is very careful.' Molly said this much, and then was afraid she had made mischief. "'But then she must have got the money somewhere. It always has struck me that if you have not extravagant habits, and do not live up to your income, you must have a certain sum to lay by at the end of the year. Have I not often said so, Mr. Gibson?" Probably. Well, then, apply the same reasoning to Cynthia's case, and then I ask what has become of the money." "'I cannot tell,' said Molly, seeing she was appealed to. She may have given it away to someone who wants it." Mr. Gibson put down his newspaper. It's very clear that she has neither got the dress nor the money necessary for this London visit, and that she doesn't want any more inquiries to be made on the subject. She likes mysteries, in fact, and I detest them. Still, I think it's a desirable thing for her to keep up the acquaintance or friendship, or whatever it is to be called, with her father's family, and I shall gladly give her ten pounds, and if that's not enough, why either you must help her out, or she must do without some superfluous article of dress or another. I'm sure there was never such a kind, dear, generous man as you are, Mr. Gibson," said his wife, to think of your being a stepfather, and so good to my poor fatherless girl. But Molly, my dear, I think you'll acknowledge that you too are very fortunate in your stepmother, are you not, love? And what happy tete-a-tetes we shall have together when Cynthia goes to London! I'm not sure I don't get on better with you even than with her, though she is my own child for as dear papa says so truly, there is a love of mystery about her, and if I hate anything it is the slightest concealment or reserve. Ten pounds! Why, it will quite set her up, buy her a couple of gowns and a new bonnet, and I don't know at all. Dear Mr. Gibson, how generous you are!" Something very like, pshaw, was growled out from behind the newspaper. "'May I go and tell her?' said Molly, rising up. "'Yes, do, love. Tell her to be so ungrateful to refuse, and tell her that your father wishes her to go, and tell her, too, that it would be quite wrong not to avail herself of an opening which may by and by be extended to the rest of the family. I am sure if they ask me, which certainly they ought to do, I won't say before they asked Cynthia, because I never think of myself, and am really the most forgiving person in the world in forgiving slights, but when they do ask me, which they are sure to do, I shall never be content till, by putting in a little hint here and there, I have induced them to send you an invitation. A month or two in London would do you so much good, Molly." Molly had left the room before this speech was ended, and Mr. Gibson was occupied with his newspaper, but Mrs. Gibson finished it to herself very much to her own satisfaction, for, after all, it was better to have some one of the family going on the visit, though she might not be the right person, than to refuse it altogether and never to have the opportunity of saying anything about it. As Mr. Gibson was so kind to Cynthia, she too would be kind to Molly, and dress her becomingly, and invite young men to the house, do all the things in fact which Molly and her father did not want to have done, and throw the old stumbling-blocks in the way of their unrestrained intercourse, which was the one thing they desired to have, free and open, and without the constant dread of her jealousy. End of chapter 38 Chapter Thirty Nine Secret Thoughts Ooze Out. Molly found Cynthia in the drawing room, standing in the bow window, looking out on the garden. She started as Molly came up to her. Oh, Molly, she said, putting her arms out towards her, I am always so glad to have you with me. 
It was outbursts of affection such as these that always called Molly back, if she had been ever so unconsciously wavering in her allegiance to Cynthia. She had been wishing downstairs that Cynthia would be less reserved, and not have so many secrets, but now it seemed almost like treason to have wanted her to be anything but what she was. Never had any one more than Cynthia the power spoken of by Goldsmith when he wrote, He threw off his friends like a huntsman his pack, for he knew when he liked he could whistle them back. "'Do you know, I think you'll be glad to hear what I've got to tell you,' said Molly. "'I think you would really like to go to London, shouldn't you?' "'Yes, but it's of no use liking,' said Cynthia. "'Don't you begin about it, Molly, for the thing is settled, and I can't tell you why, but I can't go.' "'It is only the money, dear, and Papa has been so kind about it. He wants you to go. He thinks you ought to keep up relationships, and he is going to give you ten pounds." "'How kind he is!' said Cynthia. "'But I ought not to take it. I wish I had known you years ago. I should have been different to what I am.' "'Never mind that. We like you as you are. We don't want you different. You'll really hurt Papa if you don't take it. Why do you hesitate? Do you think Roger won't like it?' "'Roger! No, I wasn't thinking about him. Why should he care? I shall be there and back again before he even hears about it." "'Then you will go,' said Molly. Cynthia thought for a minute or two. "'Yes, I will,' said she at length. "'I dare say it's not wise, but it will be pleasant, and I'll go. Where is Mr. Gibson? I want to thank him. Oh, how kind he is! Molly, you're a lucky girl." I said Molly, quite startled at being told this, for she had been feeling as if so many things were going wrong, almost as if they would never go right again. "'There he is,' said Cynthia. "'I hear him in the hall.' And down she flew, and laying her hands on Mr. Gibson's arm, she thanked him with such warm impulsiveness and in so pretty and caressing a manner that something of his old feeling of personal liking for her returned and he forgot for a time the causes of disapproval he had against her. "'There, there,' said he, "'that's enough, my dear. It's quite right you should keep up with your relations. There's nothing more to be said about it.' "'I do think your father is the most charming man I know,' said Cynthia on her return to Molly, "'and it's that which always makes me so afraid of losing his good opinion, and fret so when I think he is displeased with me. And now let us think all about this London visit. It will be delightful, won't it? I can make ten pounds go ever so far, and in some ways it will be such a comfort to get out of Hollingford." "'Will it?' said Molly, rather wistfully. "'Oh, yes. You know I don't mean that it will be a comfort to leave you. That will be anything but a comfort. But after all, a country town is a country town, and London is London. You need not smile at my truisms. I've always had a sympathy with Monsieur de la Palisse. Monsieur de la Palisse est mort, en perdant sa vie. Un quart d'heure avant sa mort, il était en vie," sang she, in so gay a manner that she puzzled Molly, as she often did by her change of mood from the gloomy decision with which she had refused to accept the invitation only half an hour ago. She suddenly took Molly round the waist, and began waltzing round the room with her, to the imminent danger of the various little tables, loaded with objets d'art, as Mrs. Gibson delighted to call them, with which the drawing-room was crowded. She avoided them, however, with her usual skill, but they both stood still at last, surprised at Mrs. Gibson's surprise, as she stood at the door, looking at the whirl going on before her. "'Upon my word, I only hope you are not going crazy, both of you. What's all this about, pray?' "'Only because I'm so glad I'm going to London, mamma," said Cynthia demurely. "'I'm not sure if it's quite the thing for an engaged young lady to be so much beside herself at the prospect of gaiety. In my time, our great pleasure in our lover's absence was in thinking about them.' I should have thought that would have given you pain, because you would have had to remember that they were away, which ought to have made you unhappy. Now to tell the truth, just at the moment I had forgotten all about Roger. I hope it wasn't very wrong. Osborne looks as if he did all my share as well as his own of the fretting after Roger. How ill he looked yesterday!" 
Yes, said Molly. I didn't know if any one besides me had noticed it. I was quite shocked. Ah, said Mrs. Gibson, I'm afraid that young man won't live long, very much afraid. And she shook her head ominously. Oh, what will happen if he dies? exclaimed Molly, suddenly sitting down and thinking of that strange mysterious wife who never made her appearance, whose very existence was never spoken about, and Roger away too. Well, it would be very sad, of course, and we should all feel it very much, I've no doubt, for I've always been very fond of Osborne. In fact, before Roger became, as it were, my own flesh and blood, I liked Osborne better. But we must not forget the living, dear Molly." for Molly's eyes were filling with tears at the dismal thoughts presented to her. "'Our dear good Roger would, I am sure, do all in his power to fill Osborne's place in every way, and his marriage need not be so long delayed.' "'Don't speak of that in the same breath as Osborne's life, mamma," said Cynthia hastily. "'Why, my dear, it is a very natural thought. For poor Roger's sake, you know, one wishes it not to be so very, very long an engagement and I was only answering Molly's question, after all. One can't help following out one's thoughts. People must die, you know, young as well as old." "'If I ever suspected Roger of following out his thoughts in a similar way,' said Cynthia, "'I'd never speak to him again.' "'As if he would,' said Molly, warm in her turn. "'You know he never would, and you shouldn't suppose it of him, Cynthia. No, not for even a moment. I can't see the great harm of it all for my part," said Mrs. Gibson plaintively. A young man strikes us all as looking very ill, and I'm sure I'm sorry for it, but illness very often leads to death. Surely you agree with me there, and what's the harm of saying so? Then Molly asks what will happen if he dies, and I try to answer her question. I don't like talking or thinking of death any more than anyone else. But I should think myself wanting in strength of mind if I could not look forward to the consequences of death. I really think we're commanded to do so, somewhere in the Bible, or the prayer-book." "'Do you look forward to the consequences of my death, mamma? asked Cynthia. "'You really are the most unfeeling girl I have ever met with,' said Mrs. Gibson, really hurt. "'I wish I could give you a little of my own sensitiveness, for I have too much for my happiness. Don't let us speak of Osborne again. Ten to one it was only some temporary over-fatigue, or some anxiety about Roger, or perhaps a little fit of indigestion. I was very foolish to attribute it to anything more serious, and dear papa might be displeased if he knew I had done so. Medical men don't like other people to be making conjectures about health. They consider it as trenching on their own particular province, and very proper, I'm sure. Now, let us consider about your dress, Cynthia. I could not understand how you had spent your money, and made so little show with it." "'Mamma, it may sound very cross, but I must tell Molly and you and everybody once and for all, that as I don't want and didn't ask for any more than my allowance, I'm not going to answer any questions about what I do with it." She did not say this with any want of respect, but she said it with quiet determination, which subdued her mother for the time, though often afterwards, when Mrs. Gibson and Molly were alone, the former would start the wonder as to what Cynthia could possibly have done with her money, and hunt each poor conjecture through woods and valleys of doubt, till she was wearied out, and the exciting sport was given up for the day. At present, however, she confined herself to the practical matter in hand, and the genius for millinery and dress, inherent in both mother and daughter, soon settled a great many naughty points of contrivance and taste, and then they were all three set to work to gar old Clay's look amidst a wheels the new. Cynthia's relations with the squire had been very stationary ever since the visit she paid to the hall the previous autumn. He had received them all at that time with hospitable politeness, and he had been more charmed with Cynthia than he liked to acknowledge to himself when he thought the visit all over afterwards. "'She is a pretty lass, sure enough,' thought he, "'and has pretty ways about her, too, and likes to learn from older people, which is a good sign but somehow I don't like Madam her mother. But still she is her mother, and the girl's her daughter. Yet she spoke to her once or twice, as I shouldn't have liked our little Fanny to have spoken, if it had pleased God for her to have lived. No, it's not the right way, and it may be a bit old-fashioned, but I like the right way. And then again she took possession of me, as I may say, and little Molly had to run after us in the garden walks that are too narrow for three, 
just like a little four-legged doggy, and the other was so full of listening to me she never turned round for her to speak a word to Molly. I don't mean to say they're not fond of each other, and that's in Roger's sweetheart's favour, and it's very ungrateful in me to go and find fault with a lass who was so civil to me, and had such a pretty way with her of hanging on every word that fell from my lips. Well, a deal may come and go in two years, and the lad says nothing to me about it. I'll be as deep as him, and take no more notice of the affair till he comes home and tells me himself." So although the squire was always delighted to receive the little notes which Cynthia sent him every time she heard from Roger, and although this attention on her part was melting the heart he tried to harden, he controlled himself into writing her the briefest acknowledgments. His words were strong in meaning, but formal in expression. She herself did not think much about them, being satisfied to do the kind actions that called them forth. But her mother criticized them and pondered them. She thought she had hit on the truth when she decided in her own mind that it was a very old-fashioned style, and that he and his house and his furniture all wanted some of the brightening up and polishing which they were sure to receive when— She never quite liked to finish the sentence definitely, although she kept repeating to herself that, there was no harm in it. To return to the squire. Occupied as he now was, he recovered his former health, and something of his former cheerfulness. If Osborne had met him half-way, it is probable that the old bond between father and son might have been renewed. But Osborne either was really an invalid, or had sunk into invalid habits, and made no effort to rally. If his father urged him to go out, nay, once or twice he gulped down his pride and asked Osborne to accompany him, Osborne would go to the window and find out some flaw or speck in the wind and weather, and make that an excuse for stopping indoors over his books. He would saunter out on the sunny side of the house in a manner that the squire considered as both indolent and unmanly. Yet if there was a prospect of his leaving home, which he did pretty often about this time, he was seized with a hectic energy. The clouds in the sky, the easterly wind, the dampness of the air, were nothing to him then. And the squire did not know the real cause of this anxiety to be gone, he took it into his head that it arose from Osborne's dislike to Hamley, and to the monotony of his father's society. "'It was a mistake,' thought the squire. "'I see it now. I never was great at making friends myself. I always thought those Oxford and Cambridge men turned up their noses at me for a country booby, and I'd get the start and have none of them. But when the boys went to Rugby and Cambridge I should have let them have their own friends about them, even though they might have looked down on me. It was the worst they could have done to me, and now what few friends I had had fallen off from me, by death or somehow, and it is but dreary work for a young man, I grant it. But he might try not to show it so plain to me as he does. I'm getting case-hardened, but it does cut me to the quick sometimes. It does. And he's so fond of his dad as he once was. If I can beget the land drained, I'll make him an allowance and let him go to London or where he likes. Maybe he'll do better this time, or maybe he'll go to the dogs altogether. But perhaps it will make him think a bit kindly of the old father at home. I should like him to do that, I should." It is possible that Osborne might have been induced to tell his father of his marriage during their long solitary intercourse, if the squire, in an unlucky moment, had not given him his confidence about Roger's engagement with Cynthia. It was on one wet Sunday afternoon, when the father and son were sitting together in the large empty drawing-room. Osborne had not been to church in the morning. The squire had, and he was now trying hard to read one of Blair's sermons. They had dined early, they always did on Sundays, and either that or the sermon or the hopeless wetness of the day made the afternoon seem interminably long to the squire. He had certain unwritten rules for the regulation of his conduct on Sundays. Cold meat, sermon reading, no smoking till after evening prayers, as little thought as possible to the state of the land and the condition of the crops, and as much respectable sitting indoors in his best clothes as was consistent with going to church twice a day, and saying the responses louder than the clerk. Today it had rained so unceasingly that he had remitted the afternoon church. But, oh, even with the luxury of a nap, how long it seemed before he saw the hall servants trudging homewards along the field-path, a covey of umbrellas. He had been standing at the window for the last half-hour, his hands in his pockets, and his mouth often contracting itself into the traditional sin of a whistle, but as often checked into sudden gravity, ending nine times out of ten in a yawn. 
he looked askance at Osborne, who was sitting near the fire absorbed in a book. The poor squire was something like the little boy in the child's story, who asks all sorts of birds and beasts to come and play with him, and in every case receives the sober answer that they are too busy to have leisure for trivial amusements. The father wanted the son to put down his book and talk to him. It was so wet, so dull, and a little conversation would so while away the time. But Osborne, with his back to the window where his father was standing, saw nothing of all this and went on reading. He had assented to his father's remark that it was a very wet afternoon, but had not carried on the subject into all the varieties of truisms of which it was susceptible. Something more rousing must be started, and this the squire felt. The recollection of the affair between Roger and Cynthia came into his head, and without giving it a moment's consideration he began, "'Osborne, do you know anything about this, this attachment of Roger's?' Quite successful. Osborne laid down his book in a moment, and turned round to his father. "'Roger! In attachment? No, I never heard of it. I can hardly believe it. That is to say, I suppose it is to—' And then he stopped, for he thought he had no right to betray his own conjecture that the object with Cynthia Kirkpatrick. "'Yes, he is, though. Can you guess who to? Nobody that I particularly like. Not a connection, to my mind. Yet she's a very pretty girl, and I suppose I was to blame in the first instance." "'Is it—there's no beating about the bush. I've gone so far I may as well tell you all. It's Miss Kirkpatrick, Gibson's stepdaughter. But it's not an engagement, mind you." "'I'm very glad. I hope she likes Roger back again." "'Like? It's only too good a connection for her not to like it. If Roger is of the same mind when he comes home, I'll be bound she'll be only too happy." "'I wonder Roger never told me,' said Osborne, a little hurt now he began to consider himself. "'He never told me either,' said the squire. "'It was Gibson who came here and made a clean breast of it, like a man of honour. I'd been saying to him I couldn't have either of you two lads taking up with his lasses. I'll own it was you I was afraid of. It's bad enough with Roger, and maybe we'll come to nothing after all. But if it had been you, I'd have broken with Gibson and every mother's son of em, sooner than let him have it go on. And so I told Gibson." "'I beg your pardon for interrupting you, but once for all I claim the right of choosing my wife for myself, subject to no man's interference,' said Osborne hotly. "'Then you'll keep your wife with no man's interference, that's all. For ne'er a penny will you get from me, my lad, unless you marry to please me a little, as well as yourself a great deal. That's all I ask of you. I'm not particular as to beauty, or as to cleverness, and piano-playing, and that sort of thing. If Roger marries this girl, we shall have enough of that in the family. I shouldn't much mind her being a bit older than you, but she must be well born, and the more money she brings, the better for the old place." "'I say again, father, I choose my wife for myself, and I don't admit any man's right of dictation.' "'Well, well,' said the squire, getting a little angry in his turn. If I'm not to be father in this matter, thou shan't be son. Go against me in what I've set my heart on, and you'll find there's the devil to pay, that's all. But don't let us get angry. It's Sunday afternoon, for one thing, and it's a sin. And besides that, I've not finished my story." For Osborne had taken up his book again, and under pretense of reading, was fuming to himself. He hardly put it away again, even at his father's request. As I was saying, Gibson said, when first we spoke about it, that there was nothing on foot between any of you four, and that if there was, he would let me know. So, by and by, he comes and tells me of this." "'Of what? I don't understand how far it has gone." There was a tone in Osborne's voice the squire did not like, and he began answering rather angrily. "'Of this, to be sure, of what I'm telling you, of Roger going and making love to this girl the day he left, after he had gone away from there and he was waiting for the umpire in Hollingford. One would think you quite stupid at times, Osborne." "'I can only say that these details are quite new to me. You never mentioned them before, I assure you." "'Well, never mind whether I did or not. I'm sure I said Roger was attached to Miss Kirkpatrick, and be hanged to her. And you might have understood all the rest as a matter of course." "'Possibly,' said Osborne politely. "'May I ask if Miss Kirkpatrick who appeared to me to be a very nice girl, responds to Roger's affection?" "'Fast enough, I'll be bound,' said the squire sulkily. 
A Hamley of Hamley isn't to be had every day. Now I'll tell you what, Osborne, you're the only marriageable one left in the market, and I want to hoist the old family up again. Don't go against me in this. It really will break my heart if you do." "'Father, don't talk so,' said Osborne. "'I'll do anything I can to oblige you, except—' "'Except the only thing I've set my heart on your doing.' "'Well, well, let it alone for the present. There's no question of my marrying just at this moment. I'm out of health, and I'm not up to going into society, and meeting young ladies and all that sort of thing, even if I had an opening into fitting society." "'You should have an opening fast enough. There'll be more money coming in in a year or two, please God. And as for your health, why, what's to make you well if you cower over the fire all day and shudder away from a good honest tankard as if it were poison?" "'So it is to me,' said Osborne languidly, playing with his book as if he wanted to end the conversation and take it up again. The squire saw the movements and understood them. "'Well,' said he, "'I'll go and have a talk with Will about poor old Black Bess. It's Sunday work enough asking after a dumb animal's aches and pains." But after his father had left the room, Osborne did not take up his book again. He laid it down on the table by him, leant back in his chair, and covered his eyes with his hand. He was in a state of health which made him despondent about many things, though least of all about what was most in danger. The long concealment of his marriage from his father made the disclosure of it far, far more difficult than it would have been at first. Unsupported by Roger, how could he explain it all to one so passionate as the squire? How tell of the temptation, the stolen marriage, the consequent happiness, and, alas, the consequent suffering? For Osborne had suffered, and did suffer greatly in the untoward circumstances in which he had placed himself. He saw no way out of it excepting by the one strong stroke of which he felt himself incapable. So with a heavy heart he addressed himself to his book again. Everything seemed to come in his way, and he was not strong enough in character to overcome obstacles. The only overt step he took in consequence of what he had heard from his father was to ride over to Hollingford the first fine day after he had received the news, and go to see Cynthia and the Gibsons. He had not been there for a long time bad weather and languor combined had prevented him. He found them full of preparations and discussions about Cynthia's visit to London, and she herself not at all in the sentimental mood proper to respond to his delicate intimations of how glad he was in his brother's joy. Indeed it was so long after the time that Cynthia scarcely perceived that to him the intelligence was recent, and that the first bloom of his emotions had not yet passed away. With her head a little on one side, she was contemplating the effect of a knot of ribbons, when he began in a low whisper, and leaning forward towards her as he spoke. "'Cynthia! I may call you Cynthia now, mayn't I? I'm so glad of this news. I've only just heard of it, but I'm so glad.' "'What news do you mean?' She had her suspicions, but she was annoyed to think that from one person her secret was passing to another and another, till in fact it was becoming no secret at all. Still, Cynthia could always conceal her annoyance when she chose. "'Why are you to begin calling me Cynthia now?' she went on smiling. "'The terrible word has slipped out from between your lips before. Do you know?' This light way of taking his tender congratulation did not quite please Osborne, who was in a sentimental mood, and for a minute or so he remained silent. Then, having finished making her bow of ribbon, she turned to him, and continued in a quick low voice anxious to take advantage of a conversation between her mother and Molly. "'I think I can guess why you made that pretty little speech just now. But do you know, you ought not to have been told. And, moreover, things are not quite arrived at the solemnity of—of—well, an engagement. He would not have it so. Now I shan't say anything more, and you must not. Pray remember you ought not to have known. It is my own secret, and I particularly wished it not to be spoken about and I don't like its being so talked about. Oh, the leaking of water through one small hole!" And then she plunged into the talk of the other two, making the conversation general. Osborne was rather discomfited at the non-success of his congratulations. He had pictured to himself the unbosoming of a lovesick girl, full of rapture, and glad of a sympathizing confidant. He little knew Cynthia's nature. The more she suspected that she was called upon for a display of emotion, the less would she show, 
and her emotions were generally under the control of her will. He had made an effort to come and see her, and now he leant back in his chair, weary and a little dispirited. "'You poor dear young man,' said Mrs. Gibson, coming up to him with her soft, soothing manner. "'How tired you look! Do take some of that eau de cologne and bathe your forehead. This spring weather overcomes me too. Primavera, I think the Italians call it. But it is very trying for delicate constitutions, as much from its associations as from its variableness of temperature. It makes me sigh perpetually, but then I am so sensitive. Dear Lady Cumnor always used to say I was like a thermometer. You've heard how ill she has been?" No, said Osborne, not very much caring either. Oh, yes, she is better now, but the anxiety about her has tried me so, detained here by what are, of course, my duties, but far away from all intelligence, and not knowing what the next post might bring." "'Where was she, then?' said Osborne, becoming a little more sympathetic. "'At Spa, such a distance off, three days' post. Can't you conceive the trial, living with her as I did for years, bound up in the family as I was? But Lady Harriet said in her last letter that they hoped she would be stronger than she had been for years," said Molly innocently. "'Yes, Lady Harriet, of course. Every one who knows Lady Harriet knows that she is of too sanguine a temperament for her statements to be perfectly relied on. Altogether, strangers are often deluded by Lady Harriet. She has an off-hand manner which takes them in, but she does not mean half, she says." "'We will hope she does in this instance said Cynthia shortly. They're in London now, and Lady Cumnor hasn't suffered from the journey." "'They say so,' said Mrs. Gibson, shaking her head, and laying an emphasis on the word say. "'I am perhaps over-anxious, but I wish—I wish I could see and judge for myself. It would be the only way of calming my anxiety. I almost think I shall go up with you, Cynthia, for a day or two, just to see her with my own eyes. I don't quite like your travelling alone, either. We will think about it, and you shall write to Mr. Kirkpatrick and propose it, if we determine upon it. You can tell him of my anxiety, and it will be only sharing your bed for a couple of nights." End of chapter 39「Chapter 40 Molly Gibson Breathes Freely that was the way in which Mrs. Gibson first broached her intention of accompanying Cynthia up to London for a few days' visit. She had a trick of producing the first sketch of any new plan before an outsider to the family circle, so that the first emotions of others, if they disapproved of her projects, had to be repressed until the idea had become familiar to them. To Molly it seemed too charming a proposal ever to come to pass. She had never allowed herself to recognize the restraint she was under in her stepmother's presence, but all at once she found it out when her heart danced at the idea of three whole days, for that it would be at the least, of perfect freedom of intercourse with her father, of old times come back again, of meals without perpetual fidgetiness after details of ceremony and correctness of attendance. We'll have bread and cheese for dinner, and eat it on our knees. We'll make up for having had to eat sloppy puddings with a fork instead of a spoon all this time, by putting our knives in our mouths till we cut ourselves. Papa shall pour his tea into his saucer, if he's in a hurry. And if I'm thirsty, I'll take the slop basin. And oh, if I could but get, buy, borrow, or steal any kind of an old horse! And my grey skirt isn't new, but it will do. That would be too delightful. After all, I think I can be happy again. For months and months it has seemed as if I had got too old ever to feel pleasure, much less happiness again." So thought Molly. Yet she blushed as if with guilt when Cynthia, reading her thoughts, said to her one day, "'Molly, you're very glad to get rid of us, are you not?' "'Not of you, Cynthia. At least I don't think I am. Only if you but knew how I love papa, and how I used to see a great deal more of him than ever I do now. Ah! I often think what interlopers we must seem, and are, in fact. I don't feel you as such. You, at any rate, have been a new delight to me, a sister, and I never knew how charming such a relationship could be. 
"'But, mamma," said Cynthia, half suspiciously, half sorrowfully. "'She is papa's wife,' said Molly quietly. "'I don't mean to say I'm not often very sorry to feel I'm no longer first with him. But it was—' The violent colour flushed into her face till even her eyes burnt, and she suddenly found herself on the point of crying. The weeping ash-tree, the misery, the slow dropping comfort, and the comforter came all so vividly before her. It was Roger. She went on looking up at Cynthia as she overcame her slight hesitation at mentioning his name. Roger, who told me how I ought to take papa's marriage, when I was first startled and grieved at the news. Oh, Cynthia, what a great thing it is to be loved by him! Cynthia blushed and looked fluttered and pleased. "'Yes, I suppose it is. At the same time, Molly, I'm afraid he'll expect me to be always as good as he fancies me now, and I shall have to walk on tiptoe all the rest of my life.' "'But you are good, Cynthia,' put in Molly. "'No, I'm not. You're just as much mistaken as he is, and some day I shall go down in your opinions with a run, just like the hall clock the other day when the spring broke. I think he'll love you just as much," said Molly. "'Could you? Would you be my friend if—if if it turned out ever that I had done very wrong things? Would you remember how very difficult it has sometimes been to me to act rightly?' She took hold of Molly's hand as she spoke. "'We won't speak of Mamma, for your sake as much as mine or hers. But you must see she isn't one to help a girl with much good advice or good— Oh, Molly, you don't know how I was neglected just at a time when I wanted friends most. Mamma does not know it. It is not in her to know what I might have been if I had only fallen into wise good hands. But I know it. And what's more," continued she, suddenly ashamed of her unusual exhibition of feeling, I try not to care, which I dare say is really the worst of all. But I could worry myself to death if I once took to serious thinking. I wish I could help you, or even understand you," said Molly, after a moment or two of sad perplexity. "'You can help me,' said Cynthia, changing her manner abruptly. "'I can trim bonnets and make head-dresses, but somehow my hands can't fold up gowns and collars like your deft little fingers. Please, will you help me to pack? That's a real, tangible piece of kindness, and not sentimental consolation for sentimental distresses, which are perhaps imaginary after all." In general, it is the people that are left behind stationary, who give way to low spirits at any parting. The travellers, however bitterly they may feel the separation, find something in the change of scene to soften regret in the very first hour of separation. But as Molly walked home with her father from seeing Mrs. Gibson and Cynthia off to London by the umpire coach, she almost danced in the street. "'Now, papa,' said she, "'I'm going to have you all to myself for a whole week. You must be very obedient.' "'Don't be tyrannical, then. You're walking me out of breath, and we're cutting Mrs. Goodenough in our hurry.' So they crossed over the street to speak to Mrs. Goodenough. We've just been seeing my wife and her daughter off to London. Mrs. Gibson has gone up for a week." "'Deary, deary, to London, and only for a week! Why, I can remember it's being a three days' journey. It'll be very lonesome for you, Miss Molly, without your young companion." "'Yes,' said Molly, suddenly feeling as if she ought to have taken this view of the case. "'I shall miss Cynthia very much.' "'And you, Mr. Gibson! Why, it'll be like being a widower over again! You must come and drink tea with me some evening. We must try and cheer you up a bit amongst us. Shall it be Tuesday?" In spite of the sharp pinch which Molly gave to his arm, Mr. Gibson accepted the invitation, much to the gratification of the old lady. "'Papa, how could you go and waste one of our evenings? We have but six in all, and now but five, and I had so reckoned on our doing all sorts of things together." "'What sort of things?' "'Oh, I don't know. Everything that is unrefined and ungenteel," added she, slyly looking up into her father's face. His eyes twinkled, but the rest of his face was perfectly grave. "'I am not going to be corrupted. With toil and labour I've reached a very fair height of refinement. I won't be pulled down again.' "'Yes, you will, papa. We'll have bread and cheese for lunch this very day, 
and you shall wear your slippers in the drawing-room every evening you'll stay quietly at home. And, oh, papa, don't you think I could ride Nora Craina? I've been looking at the old grey skirt, and I think I could make myself tidy. Where is the side saddle to come from? To be sure, the old one won't fit that great Irish mare. But I'm not particular, papa. I think I could manage somehow. Thank you, but I'm not going to quite return into barbarism. It may be a depraved taste, but I should like to see my daughter properly mounted. Think of riding together down the lanes. Why, the dog-roses must be all out in flower, and the honeysuckles and the hay. How I should like to see Merriman's farm again! Papa, do let me have one ride with you. Please do. I'm sure we can manage it somehow." And somehow it was managed. Somehow all Molly's wishes came to pass. There was only one little drawback to this week of holiday and happy intercourse with her father. Everybody would ask them out to tea. They were quite like bride and bridegroom, for the fact was that the late dinners which Mrs. Gibson had introduced into her own house were a great inconvenience in the calculations of all the small tea-drinkings at Hollingford. How ask people to tea at six who dined at that hour? How, when they refused cake and sandwiches at half-past eight, how induce other people who were really hungry to commit a vulgarity before those calm and scornful eyes? So there had been a great lull of invitations for the Gibsons to Hollingford tea-parties. Mrs. Gibson, whose object was to squeeze herself into county society, had taken this being left out of the smaller festivities with great equanimity. But Molly missed the kind homeliness of the parties to which she had gone from time to time as long as she could remember, and though as each three-cornered note was brought in she grumbled a little over the loss of another charming evening with her father, she really was glad to go again in the old way among old friends. Miss Browning and Miss Phoebe were especially compassionate towards her in her loneliness. If they had had their will, she would have dined there every day, and she had to call upon them very frequently in order to prevent their being hurt at her declining the dinners. Mrs. Gibson wrote twice during her week's absence to her husband. That piece of news was quite satisfactory to the Miss Brownings, who had of late held themselves a great deal aloof from a house where they chose to suppose that their presence was not wanted. In their winter evenings they had often talked over Mr. Gibson's household, and having little besides conjecture to go upon, they found the subject interminable, as they could vary the possibilities every day. One of their wonders was how Mr. and Mrs. Gibson really got on together, another was whether Mrs. Gibson was extravagant or not. Now two letters during the week of her absence showed what was in those days considered a very proper amount of conjugal affection. Yet not too much at elevenpence halfpenny postage. A third letter would have been extravagant. Sister looked to sister with an approving nod as Molly named the second letter, which arrived in Hollingford the very day before Mrs. Gibson was to return. They had settled between themselves that two letters would show the right amount of good feeling and proper understanding in the Gibson family. More would have been extravagant, only one would have been a matter of mere duty. There had been rather a question between Miss Browning and Miss Phoebe as to which person the second letter, supposing it came, was to be addressed to. It would be very conjugal to write twice to Mr. Gibson, and yet it would be very pretty if Molly came in for her share. "'You've had another letter, you say, my dear?' asked Miss Browning. "'I dare say Mrs. Gibson has written to you this time.' "'It is a large sheet, and Cynthia has written on one half to me, and all the rest is to papa.' "'A very nice arrangement, I'm sure. And what does Cynthia say? Is she enjoying herself?' "'Oh, yes, I think so. They've had a dinner-party, and one night, when Mamma was at Lady Cumnor's, Cynthia went to the play with her cousins.' "'Upon my word! And all in one week! I do call that dissipation! Why, Thursday would be taken up with the journey, and Friday with resting, and Sunday is Sunday all the world over, and they must have written on Tuesday. Well, I hope Cynthia won't find Hollingford dull, that's all, when she comes back." "'I don't think it's likely,' said Miss Phoebe, with a little simper and a knowing look, which sat oddly on her kindly innocent face. "'You see a great deal of Mr. Preston, don't you, Molly?' "'Mr. Preston,' said Molly, flushing up with surprise. "'No, not much. He's been at Ashcombe all winter, you know. He has but just come back to settle here. What should make you think so?' "'Oh, a little bird told us,' said Miss Browning. Molly knew that little bird from her childhood, and it always hated it and longed to wring its neck. 
Why could not people speak out and say that they did not mean to give up the name of their informant? But it was a very favourite form of fiction with the Miss Brownings, and to Miss Phoebe it was the very acme of wit. The little bird was flying about one day in Heath Lane, and it saw Mr. Preston and a young lady, we won't say who, walking together in a very friendly manner. That is to say, he was on horseback. But the path is raised above the road, just where there is a little wooden bridge over the brook. "'Perhaps Molly is in on the secret, and we ought not to ask her about it,' said Miss Phoebe, seeing Molly's extreme discomfiture and annoyance. "'It can be no great secret,' said Miss Browning dropping the little bird formula and assuming an air of dignified reproval at Miss Phoebe's interruption. For Miss Hornblower says Mr. Preston owns to being engaged. At any rate it isn't to Cynthia, that I know positively," said Molly, with some vehemence. And pray put a stop to such reports. You don't know what mischief they may do. I do so hate that kind of chatter." It was not very respectful of Molly to speak in this way to be sure, but she thought only of Roger and the distress any such reports might cause, should he hear of them, in the centre of Africa, made her colour up scarlet with vexation. "'Highty tighty! Miss Molly! Don't you remember that I am old enough to be your mother, and that it is not pretty behaviour to speak so to us, to me? Chatter, to be sure! Really, Molly!' "'I beg your pardon,' said Molly, only half penitent. "'I dare say you did not mean to speak so to sister,' said Miss Phoebe trying to make peace. Molly did not answer all at once. She wanted to explain how much mischief might be done by such reports. "'But don't you see,' she went on, still flushed by vexation, "'how bad it is to talk of such things in such a way. Supposing one of them cared for some one else, and that might happen, you know. Mr. Preston, for instance, may be engaged to some one else.' "'Molly! I pity the woman, indeed I do. I have a very poor opinion of Mr. Preston," said Miss Browning, in a warning tone of voice, for a new idea had come into her head. "'Well, but the woman or young lady would not like to hear such reports about Mr. Preston." "'Perhaps not. But for all that, take my word for it, he's a great flirt, and young ladies had better not have much to do with him." "'I dare say it was all an accident their meeting in Heath Lane said Miss Phoebe. "'I know nothing about it,' said Molly. "'And I dare say I have been impertinent. Only please don't talk about it any more. I have my reasons for asking you.' She got up, for by the striking of the church clock she had just found out it was later than she had thought, and she knew that her father would be at home by this time. She bent down and kissed Miss Browning's grave and passive face. "'How you are growing, Molly!' said Miss Phoebe anxious to cover over her sister's displeasure. "'As tall and as straight as a poplar tree, as the old song says.' "'Grow in grace, Molly, as well as in good looks,' said Miss Browning, watching her out of the room. As soon as she was fairly gone, Miss Browning got up and shut the door securely, then sitting down near her sister she said in a low voice, "'Phoebe, it was Molly herself that was with Mr. Preston in Heath Lane that day, when Mrs. Goodenough saw them together.' "'Gracious goodness me!' exclaimed Miss Phoebe, receiving it at once as gospel. "'How do you know?' "'By putting two and two together. Didn't you notice how red Molly went, and then pale, and how she said she knew for a fact that Mr. Preston and Cynthia Kirkpatrick were not engaged?' "'Perhaps not engaged, but Mrs. Goodenough saw them loitering together all by their own two selves. Mrs. Goodenough only crossed Heath Lane at the Shire Oak as she was riding in her phaeton said Miss Browning sententiously. We all know what a coward she is in a carriage, so that she most likely had only half her wits about her, and her eyes are none of the best when she is standing steady on the road. Molly and Cynthia have got their new plaid shawls just alike, and they trim their bonnets alike, and Molly has grown as tall as Cynthia since Christmas. I was always afraid she'd be short and stumpy, but now she's as tall and slender as anybody need be. I'll answer for it. Mrs. Goodenough saw Molly, and took her for Cynthia." When Miss Browning answered for it, Miss Phoebe gave up doubting. She sat some time in silence revolving her thoughts. Then she said, "'It wouldn't be such a very bad match after all, sister.' She spoke very meekly, awaiting her sister's sanction to her opinion. "'Phoebe! It would be a bad match for Mary Pearson's daughter. If I had known what I know now, we'd never have had him to tea last September. 
"'Why, what do you know?' asked Miss Phoebe. "'Miss Hornblower told me many things, some that I don't think you ought to hear, Phoebe. He was engaged to a very pretty Miss Gregson at Hennick when he comes from, and her father made inquiries, and heard so much that was bad about him, that he made his daughter break off the match, and she's dead since.' "'How shocking!' said Miss Phoebe, duly impressed. "'Besides, he plays at billiards, and he bets at races, and some people say he keeps race-horses.' "'But isn't it strange that the Earl keeps him on as his agent?' "'No, perhaps not. He's very clever about land, and very sharp in all law affairs, and my lord isn't bound to take notice, if indeed he knows, of the manner in which Mr. Preston talks when he has had too much wine.' taken too much wine. Oh, sister, is he a drunkard? And we have had him to tea." "'I didn't say he was a drunkard, Phoebe,' said Miss Browning pettishly. "'A man may take too much wine occasionally without being a drunkard. Don't let me hear you using such coarse words, Phoebe." Miss Phoebe was silent for a time after this rebuke. Presently she said, "'I do hope it wasn't Molly Gibson.' You may hope as much as you like, but I'm pretty sure it was. However, we'd better say nothing about it to Mrs. Goodenough. She has got Cynthia into her head, and there let her rest. Time enough to set reports afloat about Molly when we know there's some truth in them. Mr. Preston might do for Cynthia, who's been brought up in France, though she has such pretty manners, but it may not have made her particular. He must not, and he shall not have Molly, if I go into the church and forbid the bands myself. But I'm afraid. I'm afraid there's something between her and him. We must keep on the lookout, Phoebe. I'll be her guardian angel in spite of herself. End of chapter 40